Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Um, this is the June 6 Charlotte City Council strategy session. We take the um, first Monday of each month to take a deep look into some of the initiatives that we start to have, are starting or work that's ongoing to make decisions and to allow the full council to discuss um, questions, comments as the work is being done so that as we craft it towards adoption or approval that everyone has had an opportunity to um, provide input and, and, and we can have in with a good result that we most of the time agree upon. Um, and so today we're going to start the meeting, but before we go into our committee reports, I just wanted to say a few words about how we talked about how we're going to have support for the committees and provide more opportunity for committee discussions. And that's generally what we try to do. And we do this, um, we're grateful to be able to have some people join us um, in person, but we also have people, council members, and that will join us um, virtually because we're still under the COVID man emergency order and our numbers are going up. So let's think about that as we um, continue to get through this pandemic, everything is not over, that we need to really um, pay attention to taking care of our health by getting boosted and um, for those folks that are immune compromised, make sure that they keep safe and have the ability not to um, contract with COVID. So before we begin, I'm going to start with um, introductions of the council. We'll start with those that are attending in the government center. We'll start with our team as well that supports us, starting with our deputy city clerk. Billy Tons, deputy city clerk. Renee Johnson, district four. Julie Eisel, mayor pro tem and serving at large. Vi Lyle, serving as mayor. Marcus Jones, city manager. Larkin Eggleston, district one. Malcolm Graham, District 2. Tara Picard, District 6. Lena James, Deputy City Attorney. Donata Jackson, Office of Constituent Services. And now we'll have introductions by both the staff and the council members that are attending virtually. We'll start with our at-large members and proceed in that order. Temple Ashmera, at-large member. Rex Pips. At large member. Braxton Winston at large. Good evening, Matt Newton, District 5. Ed Driggs, District 7. Patrick Baker, City Attorney. Federico Rios, Office of Equity, Mobility, and Immigrant Integration. Teresa Smith, CFO. All right. I think that's everyone that's been introduced um, for participation in our meeting today. Um, I do want you to know that this um, idea of our, oh, I'm sorry. You're fine. I, I came a little you. late. I do and apologize. I'm Victoria Watlington, District 3. Good evening, everyone. Okay. So we're going to hear um, on our agenda tonight, we're going to have an update on the first quarter work plans out of our committees and the work that they're planning on tackling the next three months. I think you've received an update from Ms. Harris on the first quarter update and the second quarter plan. So of course I want to throw a wrench into it. After we adopted our budget um, last Monday, um, there were several items that were left for policy discussion and debate that, referred to, that were referred to the council committees. And I think Ms. Harris is going to pass out um, that the referrals that I've made and email those copies to those that are attending virtually. But the um, budget development process was an issue and that's going to go into budget and governance. Um, promoting um, an international business strategy is going to our economic development committee, um, looking at what we can do globally, and we have in sustainable environment our policy area, and so the Triple E committee will begin to deal with our tree canopy, and our great neighborhoods committee will be looking at policies related to the tree canopy in our neighborhoods, and how do we connect that to our affordable housing. And then in our affordable housing, we're going to have the Great Neighborhoods Committee provide um, information on affordable housing and how our fees and um, charge, not our fees, I should not say, just development fees impact the affordability of housing in our community. So with that, everybody should have a copy of what the referrals are. And so with this, um, 
I just like to say, if, I know that it's not in your work plan now, but we'll see that information in the second quarter. So with that, I'm going to ask Marcus Jones, our city manager, if he has any comments before sure. we begin. And if you don't have any specific comments, you can go ahead and introduce our first presentation. Well, I think I'll do both for you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, just a couple of things that I'd like to highlight as it relates to the, the committee work. Um, we are very appreciative as a, a staff to get uh, all the work that's happening in the committees. One of the things we tried to do this year is to provide more staff to the committees for their work, and I hope that for the, um, the chairs, it's been helpful to have three liaisons as opposed to one. And I will say that it's been very good for us in terms of the um, work plans that you have and being able to work through those because those help inform our priorities, which help inform some of the initiatives that go into the budget. So, so once again, um, as we go through this first quarter, any feedback that we get from uh, the, the chairs of the committees in terms of how we staffed you um, would be um, good to have that also. So with that said, it's a pretty uh, uh, packed agenda tonight. And the agenda really represents what the strategy sessions are for, not just only the committee report outs, but we also have items that come out of the committee that have an opportunity for the full body to discuss before it, it ends up on a policy agenda or, or a business agenda. And then there are some items that you just want some additional information on or for few, or more clarity. And that's a great segue into our first guest, uh, Todd Herman, who will be here to give us a Picasso update. I think you will recall it um, is a collaboration between the city and the county. And uh, I believe you're going to hear some very good things tonight as relates to Picasso. So with that's it, Mayor, that's fine. I'd like to turn it over right. to our guests. Thank you very much and thank you for having me here tonight. My name is Todd Herman. I'm the president and CEO of the museum. Um, and I have with me uh, here tonight as part of this presentation, the wonderful artist, fabulous CMS art teacher and often time mint collaborator, Carla Aaron Lopez, um, who will be adding some context uh, to the presentation as we go along. So this is um, an amazing opportunity for not just the Mint Museum, but the Charlotte community, um, Mecklenburg County, and this entire region. This exhibition, Picasso Landscapes um, Out of Bounds, is scheduled for uh, next year, opening in February and closing at the end of May. And the reason that next year is so important is that it is the, the 50th anniversary of the death of Pablo Picasso, probably one of the most widely recognized um, artists in the history of Western art. Um, so there will be a lot of attention on any exhibition or anything to do with Pablo Picasso next year because there will be many articles and, and museums um, and uh, magazines and newspapers writing about um, Picasso and his influence. So we are very pleased to have this exhibition uh, come to Charlotte. So in the exhibition there are approximately 45 Picasso paintings from collections around the globe. And so we're looking at public collections like the Met, the Museum of Modern Art, but also private collections from Madrid to Paris to Barcelona to South America. I mean, this is really a, a, um, um, a group of works coming to Charlotte from literally um, across the world. This is the first traveling exhibition to explore Picasso landscapes. So we know Picasso, you know, there many of us can conjure images of a Picasso. It's usually of the of the figure, right, with sort of eyes and nose and mouth and in you know many different um, uh, planes of the face. Um, but there hasn't been much of a investigation into his landscape, and, and in fact. Um, the little detail I have here is from one of the paintings in the exhibition, uh, which demonstrates he, very early in his career, he was painting very much in an impressionistic style. So this exhibition, because it looks at landscape, it covers the entirety of his career. So not just one segment, but you get to see the arc um, of his development through, um, uh, through landscape. 
There are only three cities that will host this exhibition, Charlotte, Cincinnati, and Denver. Um, Charlotte is the opening venue and the only East Coast venue. So that's important in two different ways. One is as the only East Coast venue, we're looking to attract visitorship from sort of up and down the eastern um, seaboard, but also a little bit inland because you're not until you get to Cincinnati um, will anyone be able to see this, um, this same exhibition. And also because we are the opening venue, that means that a lot of the press attention will be on Charlotte. Right, so the first time that these paintings are seen together, the first time um, for the grand opening of the exhibition, we've been in discussions with um, cultural attaches for France, for Spain, we're hoping to have many dignitaries come to Charlotte for a real um, a grand opening event um, suitable for this kind of special exhibition. So that's it. Those three cities in the entire globe will have this exhibition, right? And Charlotte is one of them. So this really marks um, sort of the step to a next level for Charlotte um, when it comes to hosting um, uh, this kind of exhibition. Um, so I mentioned that many of the paintings come from private collections and have rarely been seen by the public. This is the first time that these will be seen together as a group, and we're anticipating roughly um, 100,000 plus visitors to the exhibition. For the Charlotte venue, um, we decided that it would be um, a wonderful opportunity for us to at the same time celebrate an artist who is near and dear to Charlotte, and that is Romare Bearden. Right, from Charlotte, Charlotte's native son, probably Charlotte's most famous visual artist, certainly. Um, and Bearden was, um, uh, was influenced by Picasso. In fact, he traveled to Paris in 1950 in search of Picasso. Um, and uh, as they both sort of went through their careers, there are a lot of similarities between the two. And so what we're planning to do is have a second exhibition up at the same time that looks at those sort of layering between what Romare Bearden was doing and what Pablo Picasso was doing. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to show these 100,000 plus people who are coming to Charlotte, maybe for the very first time, to be exposed to an artist that Charlotte is so proud of um, in Romare Bearden. So uh, we're getting loans for that exhibition as well. So they will be running concurrently. Um, so people will get to see both of those shows at the same time. Um, we wanted this exhibition the Picasso landscapes and Beard and Picasso to be more than just mint museum focused. We wanted to embrace as many arts and cultural organizations as we can. And so early on, as the conversations were happening about being able to bring this exhibition, um, I started talking to a lot of the different cultural entities um, uh, in Charlotte and in the region, and we were able to get um, a lot of people to agree early on to be part of this, to make it really a, a community-wide event. So the people who I've spoken to who are, um, who are ready to collaborate with us um, during this exhibition are the Charlotte Symphony, uh, the Beckler, the Gantt Theater Charlotte, Jazz Art Charlotte, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library, Charlotte Ballet, CMS Schools, and a group of local artists that we've talked to about a project that I'll, I'll speak to in, in a minute. Um, but for example, um, with Theater Charlotte, there is um, a play that they're gonna perform, which was written by the comedian Steve Martin. So he, the Steve Martin with the arrow, you know, through his head, that's Steve Martin. Um, he wrote a play about Pablo Picasso and Theater Charlotte is going to perform that um, during the run of our show. Jazz Art Charlotte, um, I'm working with them on sort of what they might do with us. There are a lot of ideas percolating right now with Lonnie Davis uh, because American jazz in Paris had a huge influence on the modern art movement. Picasso was greatly influenced by that. Um, but also Romare Bearden wrote music and he had a number of hit songs 
um, and Jazz Arts um, in Charlotte has performed some of those songs previously. Um, they were uh, recorded by Branford Marsalis. Um, uh, there's a CD of those. Um, so we're looking at how we can incorporate all that together to, um, uh, to create a really exciting multidisciplinary um, event in Charlotte for those spring months. Oops, there we go. And with the local artists, um, we had this idea to um, ask local artists to, um, to look at one of Picasso's most famous paintings, uh, Guernica. And let me just say, just so that everybody gets this right, this painting, Guernica, is not coming to Charlotte. This is not in the show. Um, but because this is um, maybe Picasso's most famous painting, um, and a painting that represents um, an artist's reaction to um, oppression. So if, um, if we think about the circumstances around this, um, this was painted by Picasso in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War when um, the uh, Spanish nationalists were uh, working to push out the, the, the people in the Basque region. Um, and called upon um, the Nazis and fascist um, Italy to bomb the town, the Basque town of Guernica, which they did, and Picasso painted this work um, in response. So what we thought would be really interesting is to have a group of contemporary artists sort of update this idea of, of what it means to um, be culturally oppressed or what it means to feel um, uh, um, oppressed uh, um, by, uh, by uh, another group. And so I know that the local artists, and I'll let, I'll let Carla um, jump in here in a second, um, we're really excited about creating this on walls in the city, a couple of different walls, either walls that we build that will be temporary or walls that get donated to the project where it can stay up long term. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carla. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. As a reminder, my name is Carla. Please know, do not call me Miss Lopez. I'm very well aware that school will be closing soon. In the value. Well, Carla, can I say thank you for being a teacher? I greatly appreciate that. We greatly appreciate people that are willing to do it very difficult work at this difficult time, and so thank you. Mayor Lyles, I have to tell you, I most certainly sprouted so many more gray hairs within the past two years. <laughs> that you have. <laughs> All right, let's get into this. So here's uh, exactly what I'm here for specifically today in front of you. There is great value in having an exhibition like this to come to Charlotte, and it's gonna hit on three different levels. Largely enough, Charlotte has not really seen this many Picassos in town ever. That's one very, very big thing. The art market is a very interesting place. We do not know who will pass through. We do not know who will see the value that we all see in Charlotte as they pass through. And there are a lot of people who will travel to Charlotte to see these Pablo Picasso paintings. Number one, it X's the fact that they have to go overseas to any European or Asian country within those museums to be able to see these works. And I thoroughly appreciate the fact that the Mint has localized this concept. Yes, Romer Bearden was heavily influenced by Pablo Picasso. I am a Charlotte native. Romer Bearden and the Mint Museum on Randolph was my first entry into the art world in order to grow up and become an artist. From that starting point, Bearden informed me about Picasso, and that love for art stayed with me for my entire life. Those school field trips from CMS stayed with me for my entire life to make such a very difficult de adult decision because arting is not the easiest job. What I thoroughly value from the Mint at this point in time is the willingness to come out and collaborate with local artists here in Charlotte. There is great value within our local creatives. Many of them have very many different skills that once the question is placed on the table, how do you, the artist, respond to Guernica today after a lifetime of events? What is the thing that you would produce? 
my students respond to the art that they see in town. As of right now, art is outside. It's on the side of buildings. It's on walls. It's in places my family takes me to when I don't come to school today because I have a dental appointment. I cannot tell you about how many children run to me with pictures on their phones after I teach my street art unit. The city will come alive the same way the city comes alive to my students. There are many times we pass by things and don't notice them, but it's not until somebody activates within us, whether it is an institution or an individual, it's not until someone activates us that this thing becomes very important. I do believe that more people need to know about the works of Romare Bearden. I do believe that institutions should push out and try to collaborate more with our local creatives. But what I have to state first is that in order for us to believe that those things can happen, it takes exhibitions like these. This is very large. I'm kind of excited for it. Um, I hope it comes here because I've already told my principal, girl, next year we're going to go see Picasso. <laughs> um, and it's really because I can only relate to my own memories. A lot of my students do not pass through any amount of museums, even though we have opportunities within CMS for students to be able to go. A lot of these students have come of age in the middle of a pandemic, and we're still rocking in the middle of a pandemic. Next year, I would really like to take my students to see something that they heard me talking about in the seventh grade and in the eighth grade, we're gonna go together and see the thing. The objects need to come up off the walls for the students, not something that's on a device. They need to get out of the building and come to spaces where, oh, this is what you do outside of school. Yes, absolutely. This is the other thing that I do besides be with you for 180 days. It matters a lot. They're not going to forget why I left school early today. But they will remember in February when I do plan this field trip for my eighth grade students, that this is what Ms. Lopez was talking about, and now we get to go see the thing that she was a part of. I hope I clarified enough for everyone. I think you did a mighty fine job. I yes, mean, I know. <laughs> we're lucky to have, to have Carla here. Um, uh, so, uh, I can't say anything more than what she just said. So I'll just move on. Um, accessibility is extremely important um, for us, for the Mint Museum. And what the funding um, that we're receiving for this exhibition allows us to do is have a, one, a very minimal upcharge for the exhibition of $10. Um, we're, K through 12 will be free. Um, and that is, partly to pick up those people, um, those kids, who we aren't gonna be able to capture through all of, through the free school tours that we're doing in conjunction with CMS. Um, we've been talking to CMS and you know, there's been some, you know, some turnover there. So we've been um, keeping in conversation with them and what they're able to do, but because of buses, you know, having to be back at schools at certain times, there aren't enough days and there aren't enough hours for us to get every CMS student here. Um, so we're really targeting those free tours. But what we wanted to do was make sure that every, every student could come in and see the exhibition for free. So all K through 12 um, will be free for the entire run of the show. And then of course we'll have some scattered free days and evenings um, throughout the run of, it, of the exhibition so that we break down um, that barrier to admission. Um, and we're also offering free admission for CMS art teachers because they're, you know, as Carla was just saying, I mean, they're the ones who, who um, will be able to sort of take that experience, it, uh, that experience and process it and turn it into something really vibrant and exciting for those kids, not just for this year, but years to come, right? And as Carla also mentioned, because these paintings are coming from so many locations, I mean, it's rare, not just for the teachers, but for our local artists, our local and regional artists. They don't have to travel to you know, Madrid and Paris and Barcelona and Japan and New York and all of these places to see these paintings. We're bringing them all here. And that's a, a rare opportunity. 
Oops. So that's it. That Thank concludes you. my presentation. So I have Mayor Pro Tem followed by Mr. Bakari. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Todd and Carla, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm so excited about this. This hits on um, a number of levels of what we've talked about as a council that we want to see our city funding support in terms of building our arts and cultural community. A, it puts us on the map as a major art city when this exhibition is here. Um, it hits the, the point of bringing people to Charlotte, uh, getting them to come here, heads and beds, as we say, um, which is very important to us from an economic development and tourism standpoint. But more importantly, I think you've done a really great job of how do you take something that's a major exhibit like this that people are going to come you know, from other places, but make sure that the local community benefits from it? And I think your point, you know, Ms. I'm going to say Ms. Lopez, because I, I think of my art teacher when I was a kid. And you call me King Carlos, what the streets do. OK. <laughs> King Carlos. I like that. Um, I just remember I grew up in Milwaukee and, and getting on the train to go to Chicago to see a major art exhibit or the, even the Shedd Aquarium. It just that that trip was so it was so powerful as a child. And it, I have no doubt there will be kids that want to become artists or want to become art teachers or teachers that after they've experienced this. And I think I'm, I'm reminded of when Hamilton was first here and we had 2,000 Title I students see Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it four times. That was the best show I've ever seen because mm -hmm. those kids, they knew the curriculum, they knew the, the program, they were so into it. And a lot of those kids ended up getting um, spots in the traveling shows, mm -hmm. which was just amazing. So I think this has endless possibilities for our local community of artists, for the local, um, for our, our school children, for all of us, and I'm really excited about it. Thank you. Yes, uh, Justin Pierce is the visual art specialist for CMS Now, and I have been, oh, I forgot, microphone. <laughs> Had my teacher voice on, I apologize. <laughs> uh, Justin Pierce is our new visual art specialist for CMS. Uh, he's new to the position, but he is looking, he's seriously actively looking for more ways for students to experience the arts in Charlotte based on what we have in CMS schools. Um, I do believe a few things. The school funding opportunities from the Arts and Science Council that many teachers across CMS take advantage of yearly, it was on pause just for the pandemic for reasons we all can understand why. It came back a little too late this year for teachers to fully be able to take advantage of it. But what I anticipate is that next year when the school funding opportunities open up earlier, more arts teachers or anyone who is the ASCAR rep for that school within CMS uh, will take advantage of seeing, to, seeing if students, to get the students to the museums. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Bakari. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and in addition to all of those things, which are excellent points, I think there's a really exciting economic development opportunity here. And it reminds me, uh, again, he happens to be in the room, when we started talking years ago with Fred Whitfield about the opportunity to leverage uh, the Hornets in the international markets with uh, Paris and France with the, with the trip. And what a lot of people don't realize that don't recruit regularly uh, in the international, particularly European markets, a lot of people still don't know where Charlotte is, if you d can imagine that. So whether it was the Hornets and they know what the NBA is, uh, or and, and, and the team was traveling there, or in this case, Picasso, um, I think it, it, it presents a big opportunity. And if we learn from the lessons that we went through that last iteration, which again, picked up from quick lessons in the iteration before that, when it was thrown together at the last minute, when we have time to plan, we really can do something special. So Mr. Manager, I'd encourage you to ask Ms. Dodson and the entire team to put a really targeted international recruitment economic development strategy together. Just anecdotally, I know a lot, um, if you look at that Spain market, there are nine tech unicorns that are in that market. And, and again, we have a unicorn here in Avid Exchange and, and several others. Um, Barcelona is very similar from a fintech perspective to the dynamics and growth of what Charlotte is right now. It wouldn't be like going and banging down the door at London or you know Berlin or a couple of these more established places. It would be like knocking on a similar door as ours who would jump at the opportunity to, again, come and see something that has such 
um, uh, uh, from a country perspective, relevance to their history, while we could be spearfishing again for opportunities to have talent partners, to have innovation and U.S. expansion. So, if it was me, I'd be all over this, and I'm glad to help. All right. Anyone else? Any other comments by council and virtually, Mr. Winston? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, no, I, I do. I do think th this is great. Um, uh, you know, when I was in high school, I, I was able to spend a summer in Madrid, um, and I, I, I was able to to spend a day in the Museo Sofia Sofia Reina, uh, Rea Sofia, excuse me, and uh, I, I got a chance to see Guernica up close and personal with, with, with my own eyes, and um, it was even more incredible, um, you know, than than uh, than looking at it <clears throat> in a textbook. You know, you don't even get the size and uh, and scale. Of, of such a work of art, and you really do, um, when you when you get in front of it, you really do uh, see why it's so great, and see why it was so telling um, of of the social um, impact of, of of that bombing, that conflict, um, and, and that struggle. Uh, so it, it, it there is nothing um, like like spending time uh, uh, with a piece of art. Uh, 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 from an individual, especially as a young person. Um, you know, at that time, I was also able to um, walk through the galleries of, of Dali um, and, 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 and really get to know um, his work. Um, and it just reminds me, um, you know, you know uh, as it was presented, the, 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 the co-exhibition um, uh, with Romare Bearden, how important it is uh, for cities uh, for, for states, for countries, um, to have their artists um, represented um, in, 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 in their halls. So I, I would love, while I, I definitely um, um, am, am very supportive of, of this investment, I'd like to find a way that we can have um, um, a, a bigger conversation. Hopefully this can spark a bigger conversation and movement um, to bring um, uh, our local artists um, um, from back in history to, 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 to present day, um, make sure that their art is is, is displayed um, in, in our hall. So I, I think of why why should Charlotte not be uh, the place that you come to see Romare Bearden's? How do we get some of the photography of people like Rosalie Guatheme um, um, here here in our halls? Um, uh, it, it will bring yes the economic development, um, but I think it will be bring. Um, uh, the needed perspective of, of so many of our young, not just young people, um, but of our, our citizens uh, about um, what is inspirational um, about um, our city um, and our region, um, but it will also ground, continue to ground us in our history um, as our city and our region continues to grow. So I'd love to have that conversation offline, maybe uh, as, as, as we progress in, in this investment. And hopefully, like I said, it could, it could spark um, uh, new approaches uh, to the visual arts in Charlotte. Great job. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Phipps. Mr. Phipps. Uh, yes, I recall in uh, 2005 when I was on uh, council back then that we did the cultural campus and bought the uh, Andreas Beckler and the Beckler Museum to Charlotte. And I think we, we, we got a, that, that uptown campus of the Mint was part of that also. So now is this exhibition scheduled to be exclusively at the Uptown Mint Museum? Yes, it is. Yes, yeah, so it'll okay. be at the Uptown location. Now, uh, also, that $10 fee, is that going to be the entry fee for everyone? It's, it's an additional, it's an upcharge of $10,000 for the Picasso exhibition. So there's currently an entry fee um, to the museum itself of $15. So all in, the most a ticket would be is $25, but there will be free nights, there will be um, you know discounts for military for senior citizens, obviously K through 12 get in for free. There will be, you know, reduced evenings. So there will be opportunities that will that will make people aware of where we can eliminate those barriers. Great, I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited already. Thanks. 
Good. Thank you, Mr. Phipps. Ms. Ajmira? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm very excited and I'm looking forward to attending this exhibit. I remember last year when we had Van Gogh exhibit, uh, I met a couple of uh, tourists who just came to Charlotte to see Van Gogh. And we need to attract this kind of exhibit to uh, bring tourism, but then also provide opportunities to our local residents so we don't have to travel uh, to see some of this rare work uh, and obviously highlighting our local talent. So it's great perspective we received today from Carla and how this is going to also contribute uh, greatly to our young people. So I'm really excited about that and I'm looking forward to attending this. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, hearing none. Do you mind if I have one oh, more? Yes, you. <laughs> Literally my last one, because I, start, I started thinking about what you guys were saying in terms of um, economic development. Uh, here's what I've learned in one year of coming out onto Charlotte's art scene and why I have been blessed with the opportunity to speak beside Todd Herman today. What I've come to learn is that we have so many transplants coming to live in Charlotte, because Charlotte is a wonderful place to raise a family. I felt that in my childhood. I feel it as an adult. Risks like these, I promise you, will play into our favor. I have been keeping track of the art world and the art industry as an individual artist for 16 years. And for 16 years, there are a lot of arts organizations that haven't truly paid attention to cities and towns in North Carolina. What I can tell you is that with wise choices, such as this Picasso exhibition, this will put us, hopefully in future's time, in a position to be another city, to be known as Charlotte, to be known for the arts. Because as of right now, in the arts world, there's Atlanta and there's DC, and there's nothing in between. I work hard and will continue to do so to get local creatives to understand how many levels of art that there is, I will continue to work hard to put Charlotte on the map as a town of creativity. My family's here, my child is here, and when we agree to opportunities like this, it works in our favor in so many different ways because my end goal is to continue contributing to the sustainability of our arts community. Thank you. I want to be in your class, actually. Um, the, the way that you frame, frame that is exactly what I think you heard the support around this dais express for this. Um, this community, we've sometimes been up and sometimes down, but I think that when we make these types of um, opportunities happen, we're definitely telling people we're moving in the direction up. And so thank you both very much for the presentation. And. Um, I'm sorry, who was that? Greg. Oh, hi, Mr. Phipps, yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to emphasize something that I think was critically important that Mr. Bakari mentioned about the international uh, economic development strategy. We have, in Charlotte, we have so many foreign dignitaries coming to Charlotte all the time, ambassadors, and, and this would be a, a, a great opportunity for them. Now. I might have missed it, but how long will the exhibit be with us? The exhibit is going to be in the Mint Museum from February 11th to May, correct? May 21st. May 21st. Great, so that's a good spate of time, and uh, I know that we'll have some of those foreign dignitaries uh, to, to, to visit that. I mean, that's a, that would be an event for them to visit while they're visiting the city. Thanks. Thank you. vision and energy for what's going to happen in this wonderful time period that we're going to be able to be shine our art, our own artists, as well as a 50 years older after loss of fabulous um, European, I mean, I guess European artists. So thank you very much for this. All right. So the next item that we have are our council committee report outs. And I want to encourage you, um, we're going to start off with our economic development committee, which met for three hours today. And um, 
to have the opportunity for what the council asked for, the questions surrounding um, the issues of um, what are we going to do in terms of working with the um, Charlotte Hornets and our arena and what the future can look like. I, I just want to point out that we have, um, I think what we have are two opportunities here. One, we have to consider by the end of this month, or June, it is June 13th? No, 13th. 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 The, um, the agreement that we have to continue to have the um, Hornets um, for the next 15 years, expansion of the time that they would stay in the arena with arena repairs that we are required contractually to do, as well as those that we think that would do and um, fulfill the other um, important, important parts of keeping our arena the kind of place that we can attract really good talent and have that a team that and an arena that we're both proud of. Um, I think that um, the second part of what the committee talked about today was perhaps what is the future like for sports? And we have engaged a number of um, people in this community, or not just in this community, but in that arena of sports and, and entertainment along with our economic development team to present something. So with that, I'm going to turn it over knowing that Mr. Um, Graham conducted the meeting today. It was a very exciting meeting in a lot of ways because it showed us what the future looks like when we talk about this industry. So Mr. Graham, I'll turn it over to you for your report out. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor and, and members of City Council. And I think you used the right word in terms of excitement. Um, I, I left the meeting today very excited about the future of our local uh, 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 NBA team um, and that partnership with the City of Charlotte. Let, let me just re remind everyone uh, again, uh, as we discussed the Spectrum Arena um, um, update, um, uh, renovations, uh, $173 million we're contractly obligated to do. And so I, I, let me say that again, we're, we're contractly obligated to do it. Uh, and, and I think that kind of pits the whole plan, the whole $275 million plan in perspective, uh, because th th this is our building uh, and the investment that we're making is um, an investment in ourselves uh, and it also helps um, retain our NBA franchise um, to the year 2045 and at least uh, update. We had a really, really good meeting today and I thought that um, uh, the purpose of the meeting was one, to uh, ensure that we got all council's um, questions answered that they posed last week, uh, to do a deep dive um, in um, the, this, the, the proposal itself, uh, to hear from a number of our consultants from the city, the Hornets, that was working with us, our staff, and I think we accomplished a lot. Uh, let me first thank our, our internal staff, um, Tracy Dotson and John Lewis for Rager, Jason Snyder and Teresa Smith, representing the manager's office, Charlotte Transit, General Service, Communications and Marketing, and Finance, who really provided the response to many of the questions that the council members had asked. Uh, we had participation at the meeting today from those who are members of our committee, um, our Vice Chairman Ed Drace, um, Dimple Ashmira, um, Greg Phipps, and Council Member Wallington, as well as a number of members of the council who are not members joined us uh, to um, hear the presentation, to ask their specific questions, uh, and to ask follow-up questions, uh, and on tomorrow, staff will send each and every council member a written description and outlining of all the questions that was asked and answered. And all the questions that were uh, asked last week by members of the council were, were, were answered today. Uh, there were additional um, follow-up questions um, the staff will be working on as well. Um, but the staff did a really, really good job in terms of really um, helping um, kind of peel the onion back and making sure that we all understood uh, where we were headed. I also want to thank um, David Ambrose with Inner City Sports, uh, Dan Barrett with CAA Icon, Jeff Marks with Innovative Partnership Group, Tom Murray with the Visitors Authority, and Steve Patterson with Pro Sports Consulting. All of those consultants were with us 
uh, today um, here in the building, one virtually. Uh, they provided a lot of insight uh, in terms of their areas of expertise um, in helping the staff answer those questions and providing broader insight in terms of what we needed to know. We focus on six areas today, and those areas were grouped based on the questions that we got from you, the council, uh, and um, we answered them um, that way. Um, the first was sponsorship opportunities and revenue, um, getting a better understanding of how this works, and, uh, and they were provided examples to the committee as well as the council members there. Uh, so we had a great um, presentation there, understanding uh, how all that works, what it means for the future of the district. Um, obviously, um, uh, it's a vision that we're working towards. Um, I, I buy into the vision. Uh, there are some unknowns. For an example, the Epic Center doesn't go back on the market until next month, July. Um, but certainly, we outline a vision, a starting point, uh, with Spectrum Arena being at the heart of it um, and uh, the Transit Center being a part of it. Uh, we pivot specifically to the Charlotte Transportation Center, uh, CTC, and got, again, a deeper dive into that. CATS was available at the meeting as well uh, and really went through it line item by line item as best as they could today explaining how that would work. Um, going into um, specifics about the, uh, the design of the facility, um, uh, how the um, Hornets um, play into that design, but more importantly, really acknowledging that notwithstanding the fact that it's a performance center or a practice facility for the, for the Hornets, but first and foremost, it's our transportation hub, right? And making sure that we clearly understand what it does, how it works, how people get in around, where would people go when it's closed for construction, et cetera. Obviously, staff will come back later um, with um, more information about the transfer center itself. Um, I was one that raised a number of questions in reference to that, and I left the meeting being very satisfied with the response I got from staff. Um, we also talked about the community use, and we examined the uh, the pre-existing operating agreement, um, Tom Murray um, uh, outlined um, the language of that agreement. We talked about um, uh, special events, um, days that the city has um, usage of the facility. Um, I, I believe in the partnership that we have with the Hornets um, is a good one. Um, people can agree that they disagree, but I am all in in reference to that management agreement that we have with the Hornets, uh, our ability uh, to utilize the facility for events that make sense for the city of Charlotte and how it impacts our economics locally. So I was satisfied there with the responses we got from staff and Mr. Murray in reference to that. We also talked about the funding and the affordability, how the hospitality and the tourist fund uh, was impacted uh, the affordability and the, the fund impact. Uh, staff, once again, um, did a great job of outlining where the money is coming from, how this project will impact other projects we may have down the road. Again, speaking for myself, I, I'm therefore very satisfied that um, the staff has done its due diligence. Uh, uh, Mr. Drake's, um, uh, rightly so, asked for more comprehensive information in terms of the projects that we may or may not have coming on deck so we can know where the money is coming from to do some of the other projects uh, that uh, may be coming our way. Um, but staff did a, a good job again today um, um, analyzing um, the affordability of the project, where the funds are coming from, uh, where other funds will be, can be utilized for other projects if and when they should come around a dais. Uh, obviously, there's more questions to be answered, um, but again, I think I left as the chairman very satisfied that um, we were headed in the right direction in terms of the, the financing of this particular project. Uh, obviously, we'll work with staff to get more information that has been poised by Mr. Drake and others about how we move forward there. 
We also talked about um, small business and minority goals. And as someone who um, has done this work in a previous life um, uh, for almost 15 years, I served as vice president for minority business development for Bank of America and uh, led a nonprofit for 10 years dealing with minority and supplier diversity. Uh, I felt very good about the responses we got from our staff. Um, we talked a little bit about the performance uh, of MWBE goals and other city projects, um, Spectrum Center itself, uh, the Convention Center, uh, other uh, city projects. Uh, and I think we felt really good um, that as we move forward and contracts are developed, uh, working with our uh, staff, that we'll have the appropriate goals in place to ensure that uh, minority participation is um, um, top of mind. Uh, it is also top of mind based on the comments we received from the Harness representative themselves. Um, I think the work we've done in the past demonstrate that we can hit a good number when it's carefully executed. Uh, and we, we stand ready to work with the minority business community to ensure that as we move forward to build and reconstruct this, um, uh, the Spectrum Center itself, uh, establishing um, new relationships with the Transit Center, uh, that uh, minority participation will be top of mind and, and that we can achieve a goal that makes sense for um, the, um, the community without sacrificing any quality that um, those buildings will require in terms of their outfitting. So I, I left feeling that that box was checked as well. And, and lastly, we talked about uh, trying to uh, make sure that the community is aware of what we're doing, why we're doing it, when we're doing it, and to what extent we're doing. Uh, the communication department has done a great job in terms of outreaching via a number of social media um, um, postings uh, and communications to ensure that we're getting the word out uh, to, the, to the residents uh, about this particular project. Uh, and I think the, um, the committee meeting today, uh, all two hours and a half of them, really gave the public an opportunity uh, to hear um, council members' questions and the answers themselves. And so it provided a deep dive, I think, for the public as it relates to um, what we're doing, why we're doing it, when we're doing it. So in, in all council, we've, we've done exactly what you instructed us to do, that we uh, focus on sponsorships and opportunities, the Charlotte Transit Center, community usage, funding and affordability, small business and minority goals, community feedback uh, and, and work with a number of individuals uh, um, to get those questions answered. Lastly, uh, I want to thank the mayor herself uh, who uh, sat in with our meeting and, and, and took notes and, and made sure that we stayed um, within the middle of the roads, and, and, and we did. Uh, and like I said from the very beginning, uh, I left very excited, uh, not only about what we're about to do, hopefully uh, uh, to support uh, the um, the uh, MBA team here. Um, hopefully, um, a couple of years once it's done, uh, even before it's done, that we can have a ticker tape parade um, that kind of marches down the, in front of the building, right? When we're celebrating a championship. Um, so um, I, I think that, um, notwithstanding the fact that uh, there is a number of I's and T's that need to be crossed between now and and next Tuesday, next Monday, that we stand ready. Uh, to kind of turn this back over to the council for the council's consideration and support. Lastly, I'll, I'll end the way I started, uh, just reminding everyone, uh, $173 million were contractly obligated to do. Uh, the other sweetener allows the team to remain uh, in that building until 2045, for 15 years lease um, extension. Uh, and that uh, Spectrum Arena uh, notwithstanding basketball, concerts, uh, have a number of community events that generates close to $376 million a year for our community. The, the arena itself serves as our community's living room where we all come together as a, uh, as a community for a wide variety of events outside of basketball. Uh, and um, it's our building, uh, it's our investment. We're contractly obligated to do most of it. Uh, I think that the council and the committee has fulfilled this charge. Lastly, uh, as I said from the start, uh, each council member will be getting a written correspondence tomorrow uh, with the question that you've, you asked 
and, and the corresponding response from staff and the consultants who was there uh, to help us walk through it today. Madam Mayor, that's the report. I think you did a really good report on the actual conversations and dialogue and the expectations that people talked about, so I'm really glad. All right, so I would like to um, separate these two topics, and I'd like to have um, Tracy come up. And first, let's have a, um, I would like to go around the room and have the conversation or your comments and suggestions on the first item, which is the extension of the um, Hornets contract um, with the city of Charlotte for the arena. So that is the, um, the reference that the committee made to the contractual obligations and the commitment that we're making um, to keep the arena and the Hornets here for until 19, oh, not 19, that's it, 20. Oh, my God, it's been a long day, y'all. Um, so, and so with that, I'm going to, Tracy will be here. So let's start out, and Ms. Watlington, we'll start with you and come around. Um, comments on the existing extension of the lease. I'm sorry. Uh, Mayor, I think it, it may be helpful if Tracy could frame what would be coming before the council. Okay. That's um, a great point. First. Okay. Of course. Yeah. That is absolutely a great idea. <laughs> and so and, and I'm going to wing it a little bit, but I'll also tell you that we'll frame this tomorrow as like one of the questions that we report out. Um, but what we would like to do is bring forward for a vote next week um, the what I'm going to consider the Spectrum Center Hornets deal, right? And so it is for the contractually obligated it is for the additional are arena improvements, and then it is for the practice facility. All of those pieces included get uh, together get us to the 15-year extension. So the council action would be like it is a lot of times when we do this, which is allow the city manager to negotiate the contracts under these basic deal terms, and we'll frame out a lot of what you've seen in front of um, in front of you last week and and this week. That does not mean that we are done. Right by any means, we'll be back several times um, <clears throat> before we take anything to the LGC. Finance will be back with council actions related to that 215 million, for example, before we finalized any naming rights or anything like that. We would be back to you on that piece of it. And as I mentioned several times today, we'll be back to you on the CTC project later this summer. Okay. You've heard um, Ms. Dotson's explanation of the action item for the arena deal, the contract extension. Okay, Ms. Watlington. Thank you. Um, so I had the pleasure of attending the first two hours of the ED meeting today and was um, pleasantly surprised with a lot of the things I learned. As I mentioned there, I think this is a great opportunity. Um, I'm particularly interested, as I know several of my colleagues are, with what is the overall vision uh, because that is the critical piece of what is it that we're buying into um, and how does that dictate or um, give us a guiding light or a northern, um, excuse me, a north star for who we choose to partner with when it comes to the naming rights and how we, how we brand this space as a whole. Um, I'm particularly interested in the minority participation, but also the grassroots and the smaller local businesses and community organizations and how they'll be able to be a part of this, um, part of this initiative. I was very pleased to see the tiered approach. Uh, I'd love to see a another tier even under some of the ones that we heard today where folks can come in and use some flex space. Uh, or we can even activate that space for when there's not a special event going on or there are not games happening because we know that d throughout the year there's more times where we don't have a game going on than when we do. So to the extent that we can really create a cultural center there that is specific to Charlotte uh, and that people can be a part of who would not otherwise be a part of a deal this size, that would be fantastic. Uh, so I look forward to seeing and those kinds of things get hashed out. I'm aware that that's not necessarily going to happen to the level of detail that we would love to see by the time um, this vote comes forward, but I would like to see a good faith effort to flush that out so that we can give some direction when we get into the details. Um, I've asked before, are we able to go and see what we delivered versus what we've asked for when it comes to minority participation and other community benefits? I would like to see a stronger plan for how we intend to track that uh, with this going forward. So those are, those are my comments, but I'm, I'm excited about the work. 
um, as it relates to this specific deal. I know the CTC is another matter, so I'll reserve my comments on that for later on, but thanks. So I want to um, make sure that I can get this right. right. So, Ms. Dotson, I think what we're talking about is the contract extension, and Ms. Watlington was addressing those issues that were raised that would go into the district and beyond um, for further discussion. And I think that everyone has an opportunity to state that and get their interest out so that we can make sure that everybody has been heard and what's important as we go to the next step. So well, I appreciate me, the way that oh, I'm sorry, you no. framed that. Yes. Okay, so I want to make sure based on what I just heard that I'm understanding the option correctly. This $60 million for the performance enhancement piece is part of the condition for the 15 year extension, correct? Okay, got it. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Well, I didn't have the pleasure of, of watching the entire three hour meeting and there might be members of the public that did not either. So I know that you're going to send the answers to us. How will members of the public uh, hear the answers or how will this information be communicated? Specifically, my, my question last week was regarding the uh, an increase uh, for the MS uh, WBE uh, goals. So I know that you all talked about that. How will this information be, or MWSBE goals, how will that be communicated? Um, was there, is there a goal for increased um, so, percentages? So Steve and Phil talked today about kind of city policy and where we were with city policy related to the MWSBE goals. Um, and I think that will continue to evolve. We can post all the responses that we give to you all on the website. And we have, as we talked about today, we're really trying to push the website out for comments. But I was just in the back talking to Jason where we said, okay, how do we even respond to the comments that we're getting from the public? Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what we were talking about of, getting the information back out is one of the benefits of the website and being able to do that and respond kind of in real time. So whatever we give you tomorrow, we will also post on the website. And will this item go before the public for a hearing before our vote? There is a public comment period next week as a part of the meeting that would be before your vote. So there is an opportunity if the public wants to sign up um, that they can speak um, at next week's meeting. Okay. Um, th so just to clarify, I'm sorry, so the goal, you'll give us the answer tomorrow as far as if there's going to be an increased um, requirement or yeah. request. I'll give you the answer and then we can talk offline if you'd like to talk more detail with uh, Phil and Steve and I just kind of how we got to where we are and where we're going from here. Okay. And it's not just for me, it's for the public mm -hmm. to hear that information. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Mayor Pro Tem. I didn't have a question, Madam Mayor. Are you just going around the room? Just around the room, yes. Uh, no, I appreciated the conversation today, Mr. Chair. I thought you did a good job of, mm -hmm. um, I think it brought up a lot of questions that helped me sort of sort out maybe what we're not really ready to talk about. <laughs> um, and I, I, I feel like that was more the focus and not so much on um, the Hornets, which I think we all agree is a great economic um, development booster in our community and we're supportive of them. So hopefully we can get some of the other answers, questions answered. Thank you. All right. Mr. Eggleston. I think we pretty well covered it in the three hour committee meeting earlier. So <laughs> won't subject everybody to listening to us repeat it all, uh, but we'll look forward to the answers we'll get tomorrow. All right, Mr. Bakari. Um, yeah, I mean, I, for me, it's the same thing that as we talked about before, and the, the purpose of today's meeting, other than us getting more in the weeds of things that probably we just don't have answers for yet that we know are to do's in the future. It was really about the community having an opportunity to hear about a lot of the things that we've been brought along, but because it was a deal that was uh, very sensitive in nature, had been working along with small groups of people. So I still have the same concern, which isn't really, do we love the Hornets and are we contractually obligated for this? It's, you know, what, what does the community think about all this stuff? And, and, you know, we can say we're contractually obligated to a large amount of money because of, you know, contract language and things that were handed to us long, long ago. But there's still a negotiated deal that has been negotiated artfully to this date that has additional uh, discretional money that we're going to spend there. And 
I, you know, I think f from a, it's, it's, not, it's not minimal and there's a lot of priorities. So there's probably a lot of people that pay taxes in the city that are fans that would want to weigh in. But more importantly to me, there's probably a boatload of hospitality and tourism employees that this, you know, the, 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 the fund, the, the hospitality and tourism fund that funds all this, that sits on their back. It's an investment into the fu their future to make sure we're continuing there. I'm not saying at all this isn't a, a good or bad deal. I'm just saying, like, it makes, I'm just nervous that here we are just at a rocket speed from last week going into next week where people can sign up on the same meeting we vote. I would just, I understand this is how it is, but I would just feel a lot more comfortable if I had some reason to believe we didn't vote on this thinking everyone was cool with it, and then all of a sudden that's when people start paying attention and voicing how they feel, just because of the nature of how long this has been in the public's eye. So I guess just take that as it is and see if someone can figure out how to solicit more of that feedback, particularly from the hospitality and tourism industry, um, but, you know, prior to us sitting there having to make a decision on the fly in the same room that we're going to be hearing really public feedback for the first time on this. Right. Now we'll go to those that are attending virtually, and we'll start with Mr. Winston, followed by Mr. Phipps. Yeah, so, you know, um, again, I, I, I said a lot, but this, this continues to be a very strange situation for me. Um, you know, for the past 18 years, uh, one of my part-time jobs um, has been to produce uh, the in-house production uh, for the Charlotte Hornets, the Bobcats, and the Sting, and other events that come through the arena. So if I was, you know, just making the decision and, and analyzing it on that behalf, this would be an easy decision. Uh, but for the past five years, um, my other part-time job, um, has, has the, the primary responsibility has been uh, to be a good steward of, of taxpayer dollars. Um, and, and this deal... Um, and this question um, and this spend um, uh, really calls in uh, a lot of conflicts um, to me in terms of being uh, that good steward. Um, you know, I, I, I really, I have, I have two issues here uh, with what, what I heard um, and what I saw um, uh, throughout this process as became, we became privy to it um, late fall um, and you know, as I listened to the meeting um, last week, um, and as I participated in the meeting today, uh, what I heard from my colleagues and, and what I've heard from, you know, our staff is, is that, you know, past councils, uh, past, past councils really negotiated a bad deal uh, for taxpayers uh, uh, when we um, uh, built this arena. Um, and a big part of this spend, um, you know, for instance, um, adding more doors um, uh, to, to, to a building uh, that didn't, um, uh, didn't consider the security measures that would be needed to fill the arena um, is something that we're paying a premium on right now. Um, I heard all just about every colleague last week comment on how bad of a deal this, tax, uh, uh, this, this contract has, has been. Um, ownership and, 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 and that contractual obligation to keep it uh, to the top 50% of NBA arenas. Um, um, but I've heard nothing today um, and, and since last week uh, that shows how the negotiated uh, deal that is on the table uh, creates a better deal uh, for taxpayers moving forward. It in fact seems to um, solidify and 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 really harden uh, the, the idea uh, that taxpayers will will uh, have to invest disproportionately um, in the capital investment of this arena um, and any future um, arena uh, that uh, will be necessary to keep an NBA franchise. Uh, in Charlotte, um, you know, again, my colleagues uh, talked about how past councils um, um, put us right now uh, in, in, in a tough, hard situation, and I agree with that. 
And I feel like the deal that is on the table is going to put future councils um, in an even tougher um, situation when they have to negotiate uh, new deals. Um, my second issue that I have with what is on the table right now um, is uh, with the way we are going as an organization, separate um, and, and apart um, from, from just the, the way um, our partners are, are approaching this. Um, you know, we're being asked to spend around $300 million, uh, you know, without a larger plan or direction of how this fits into the other spends um, that we will have uh, coming down down the line, um, whether it be with Discovery Place, uh, other um, uh, entertainment districts in Third Ward, the future of, of the Panthers, the Convention Center, Bojangles, and I, and I know that there are many different funds, um, but these all of these things um, work together, and we don't really um, have a plan. Um, felt like this was put on us rather abruptly, even though uh, negotiations have been happening for three years, we have known about this for about as a council for about six months, um, and, uh, and and have only been able to talk about it publicly for for a, a much smaller uh, a time period than that. You know, so this feels like a very transactional relationship uh, and not a, a truly intentional partnership, uh, and, and I find that um, disappointing. Um, and this is going to weigh heavily on me as, 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 as I consider the decisions uh, that we have to make over this next week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winston. Mr. Phipps? Mr. Phipps, thank you, Mr. Winston. Mr. Phipps? Yes, I look forward to uh, the responses uh, coming uh, next week uh, based on our discussions today. And, and, and really, we have two choices. I mean, we got two, we got two pathways. One was one was like no extension, just paying invoices as they come come through uh, 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 by the Hornets. And the other one was uh, 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 a more uh, um, a broad-based uh, 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 opportunity to keep the Hornets here another 15 years with some with the uh, performance center and things. So I really do think that this particular deal that we got before us is is better than what we had before. So to, to agonize over what was, I mean, it, it serves no purpose to me in my, in my mind. I mean, it either comes down to if we want to uh, have the Hornets here or not. Uh, you know, I mean, people have choices. As far as the community is concerned, I was here when the Hornets was here, the Hornets left. It was a big void here in the community. The Bobcats came in, they left. But we finally got the Hornets back. Everybody was glad. And I've got the feeling right now that the community loves the Hornets being here. So I don't know. I mean, we can, we can, we can agonize, uh, you know, the paralysis of analysis, uh, uh, all of this. But it just comes down to what is it that we want to do? Do we want to go forth with, with this plan? Or do we want to, uh, uh, you know, him and Hall or whatever? Granted, there are uh, questions that need to be made, answered, things to straighten out. But at the end of the day, what 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 will we do in this instance? And I said, if we don't, we really, I, I think the plausible choice for us is to go for this option two, and 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 make it work, iron out plans as we, as we can see them. And, and, and just try to make the best deal for the community, uh, fans, for everyone. And, and I still can't understand, this is the third meeting that I've attended right now, and I still haven't gotten an answer to my question. Council Member Phipps, I have, I have the answer. Okay, good, because uh, I want to know what that split breakdown, I know it's probably predominantly the Hornets, but I still want to know uh, that breakdown. I would be interested in that. So. so so, we'll give it to you in more detail. I just wanted you to know that we found the answer today. 
<laughs> um, while we were right. going through the economic impact study. But um, Council Member Phipps' question was, of the economic impact at the $376 million, how much of that is really attributed to the Hornets versus Ancillary and other? And the answer is about 70% of that is, is attributed directly to the Hornets. Right. So you can see that the, 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 the whole impetus and focus of, of, of these naming rights and all these things want to do Without the Hornets there, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you just wouldn't get that. I mean, we, I don't know if the Spectrum Center with 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 with, with Frankie Beverly and Mays and all that coming would be would, would, would be something that nobody's going to be giving a naming rights to. All right. So so we got to be practical. And uh, I, I mean, the, the, the center just can't stand on its own, even though it gives us a lot of venues that people enjoy in the read. So that's all I have to say. Thank, thank you, Mr. Phipps. I'm about to get up and start doing a line dance to Frankie Beverly. I tell you, I don't think he can even dance anymore. Um, so um, Mr. Newton, followed by Mr. Driggs. Mr. The, Newton? Uh, the, the, yes, ma'am. I don't have anything to add or, or additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Mr. Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I thought it was a very productive meeting today, and we are much closer now to knowing all the things that Council should know before making a commitment like that than we were before, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, I think we do agree that the Hornets are a valuable community asset, and that therefore there is reason for us to invest uh, and, and to want to keep the team here and, and do what it takes to keep them here. Uh, the chair referred to a couple of issues I raised, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to kind of hearing more about that. Uh, the $60 million commitment that we're making for the Performance Center is not supported by any assurance or guarantee of proceeds from naming rights sales because we don't have those contracts in place. And that, that to me, just as a risk management guy, is a gap that concerns me. Um, also, the interdependence of the plan for the transportation center and the commitment that we're making to the Hornets. I mean, these are presented as kind of two related projects, but the fact is that the performance center, which is part of our Hornets deal, uh, is tied to the transportation center. Um, I, I think as a general observation, there are a bunch of things we should have done before we got to this point, and I think that's reflected in the questions that are being raised about you know, our policy choices and so on. Uh, but the fact is that here we are, right? And so we need to decide what is our best act, course of action going forward. Um, I think there's also a consensus that we want to do a deal with the Hornets, and that those terms are um, that those terms are okay. Uh, the real question for us is whether those are good terms or not. So uh, we want to make sure, for the benefit of our constituents, that we're getting a deal that's competitive with deals that are done in other cities and that properly reflect the value of the team to the city. And I think some of the questions relate to that. Uh, but uh, once again, there is a deal on the table now, and we have arrived at a point where we're kind of yes or no. I will note that from a public perspective, the fact that uh, we are dealing with a $173 million hole that we got into without knowing we were getting into it doesn't reflect well on us. And we can point to people in the past and we can we can say, hey, that wasn't me. But if I were you know, just looking at this as a member of the public and I heard that we had managed to get ourselves into a position where we had an inescapable liability for $173 million, I'd be a little upset. And I think that if we have a challenge, to Mr. Bakari's point, with public opinion, part of it is going to be about that. Uh, this is not exactly analogous to the Cross Charlotte Trail. But it, but it has, you know, a feel of that about it. And I, I think that we should not sort of sail through this and, and minimize the fact that there are going to be people who are properly upset that we are now having to commit these funds to an obligation that we should have known about. Uh, it's been there at least for four years from what we were told. And in fact, it's been accruing over the last 10 years. So uh, we need to be accountable for that. You know, I think my bottom line is that we should do the deal with the uh, Hornets. Uh, I want to keep the team here. Um, I just think that we have a little more work to do to make sure that we present this thing properly to the public and that we 
um, that we cover our exposures and, and make sure that we have a good deal for the city. Thank you. Ms. Ashmira? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Some of my questions were addressed earlier at our committee meeting, and uh, Mr. Chairman did a great job with uh, covering all the concerns and all the topics that were raised uh, as part of our full council discussion a few weeks ago. And um, specifically, I just want to highlight the transportation center and the questions around whether it being underground or above ground. Uh, so our commitment here, I just want to make sure that I clarify that our commitment to Hornets about having a performance center, it, it, whether we decide to move forward underground or above ground, that, that is mutually exclusive. Is that correct, Mr. Ms. Dobson? Yes, that is cor that's correct. I mean, the CTC project discussion is a completely different discussion. Yes, and I, I just want to make sure that uh, as public is hearing this, they are aware of this, uh, because I have seen some social media uh, feedback on, on our uh, CTC specifically. People would like to see that above ground, but that's a topic for future discussion. Um, also, my concerns around community use, including recruiting the CIAA back to our city were addressed. I appreciate that and also appreciate the leadership of Mr. Murray at the CRVA. Um, and like my colleagues, I, uh, I have also concerns about contractual obligations. However, we must recognize the value that the Hornets provide to our city. They are an asset to our community. and. Um, uh, we have to make the best decision for m moving forward to keep the team here. Um, and as I was going through uh, the presentation materials after the committee meeting, I looked at the community feedback received to date. And overall, it's been very positive. Uh, yes, I understand we have some that, that are not on board, but overall feedback has been very positive. So Ms. Dobson, for those who did not attend our uh, committee meeting. Could you just share the overall yes, no, and uh, a maybe percentage? So just uh, full council is aware of the community feedback received to date. So Councilman Manager Mayor, I do not have that in front of me. However, you, you did get to one of my um, closing remarks that I wanted to make, which was um, overall the comments have been more largely um, positive, but I want to make sure that you all have the visibility of all of the comments. So as we send stuff out tomorrow, we will send you all of the comments as well um, on that. I don't know the exact percentage. I'm going to call it around that 60% if I'm going back to the um, pie chart that was used today that have been supportive of the project. But again, we want you to see all of the comments that have come forward. Um, with that, in addition to that, just while I'm talking about the public comments, um, we have been working with all of our partners um, across the city that we think um, this subject matter fits into. So CRVA, uh, Tom and his team sent the website out trying to generate more comments back. We work with Center City Partners. We worked with the Alliance. We've tried to touch as many people as we possibly can in getting this out to ask for comments back not specific comments, but ask for any comments back about how the, how the public feels um, about this deal. Yes, and I think that just gives, an, gives us an insight into how community feels about the Hornets. And I know I have seen uh, Facebook ads uh, for getting community feedback in this, throughout this process. So I think it's been great to see that overall community values uh, the Hornets and, and this proposal. Uh, obviously, how we go about it and how much that all uh, will continue to be part of the discussion, at least uh, addressing some of the concerns and questions around the funding and what is potentially that could come up of, um, from our tourism fund and how we need to manage that. Uh, that is something that I would be looking forward to hearing more about. But thank you so much. All right. 
So every council member has had a chance to um, provide their perspective, and Ms. Dotson has said that he, she will have the detailed responses out to the council and the community on the website. Um, feel free, all of you have a major, strong, very strong social media presence, and so you can also take those questionnaires and push out beyond what we have already um, on our website. And with that, I believe that we'll accept this as the Economic Development Committee's report and move to I've the next I've got one more side. comment. <laughs> yes, sir. Mr. Phipps. Yeah, I, I want to make sure. I think it would be a, a, a mistake for us to infer or any way uh, 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 give reason to uh, uh, the public to presume that within this deal that we are somehow uh, uh, going to be able to uh, attract the uh, CIAA back to Charlotte. Uh, I, I think that's something that's, uh, that's really not up, all in our control. I think the, the CIAA has really spoken in terms of their, uh, their uh, uh, agreement uh, last week to, to extend that contract uh, with Baltimore. And I'm also struck by the fact that it was a unanimous decision by all of the member schools to do that. So I don't know. I know, I know we want it. I support the CIAA and we want it bad. But uh, I think other, other schools and other cities look at this economic impact and they probably want a piece of it too. So for us to try to infer that we wanted to make it uh, 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 an anchor tenant here in Charlotte to perpetuity. I don't know that that is something that we could do. They were here for 15 years, and I got the impression from the comments that the commissioner made that they were kind of glad to be getting out of Charlotte at the end of this uh, period uh, that we just went through. So I think we need to be careful not to give the impression that uh, this deal would somehow solidify our chances of getting the CIAA back in town anytime soon. Okay, thank you for your comments, Mr. Phipps. You just jumped into the real debate here. You sure okay, did. Okay, so with that, <laughs> um, we are going to move on to our next committee. Madam Mayor, uh, I just, this may, not about it's something else. Okay. Economic development related. All right. Um, since we're still on my, on my time. I, I just wanted to, to uh, ask the council to read the economic development report. There was a lot of conversation about international recruitment, international development. We did have the international cabinet at our last meeting. Um, there were some follow-up items. So I just want to make sure that the council didn't um, overlook that at, during the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. That's really important. So as we do that, Ms. Johnson. Um, I just have two more questions. Is it possible that we can get a, a copy of the event calendar um, for the events that are being that are scheduled at the Spectrum Center for 22 and, 20, and 2022 and 2023? Uh, I wouldn't say, excuse me, I wouldn't say after 23. I mean, a lot of these buildings are so full. Okay. Um, but what I will say is, um, um, sure, if something like COVID We can't hear the conversation online. Um, Miss, I know, this is, okay. you have so to, we'll, to, if you just Miss Watlington is going to give you a mic. Okay. Mr. Whitfield. I mean, a current, like a current calendar. With yes. So for this year, so, so what's going to happen the yeah. remainder of this year and yes. next? Yes, and, and our fiscal year ends in September, and we'll be north of 100-plus events. Um, we're holding on the calendar for 22 because there's uh, 2023 because there's a, a big slot for renovation. So a lot of this is contingent on how quickly we can get to um, architects and have drawings done. We vowed that we're going to do everything we can to keep our building active, even during the reno renovations. So, believe me, our goal is to get to 150 to 160 events a year. We aren't satisfied at 100 plus. Mm -hmm. We want that building to be active every night we can. Okay. So then we'll just get a, a we'll, we'll calendar. Get, we'll get the calendar up. Okay. Thank you. Things we have on the books, and, and we have ongoing conversations as we speak about additional concerts and family shows that hit every demographic. Thank you. And right. then my next question is for the, the mayor. Now, I just want to make sure the process. We're, we're able to have a public hearing and then vote on the item on the same night. I thought that we were 
that there would need to be a week Would in between there's that. an item on the agenda the public can sign up to speak um, pre-COVID for some of the folks that weren't here before we have had as many as 125 speakers speak on an agenda item and then vote the same and then day. vote on okay. the same night so okay. we're just we have we have done it and it's just because of COVID we haven't okay so yes everyone as long as it's on the agenda you can sign up to speak and we usually do <coughs> two to three minutes so we'll okay. be good thank you all right thank you everyone I have a follow-up. Mr. Winston? Yeah, so um, again, in relation to this plan, uh, Mr. Whitfield uh, just commented that uh, the goal is to get to 150 or 160 uh, events, which would be you know, a 50% increase um, in events uh, that occur now. However, in the conversation that we had with um, his team's representatives today um, and the consultants, um, we were told that um, that was actually not the case, uh, that the investments that um, we're being asked to, to, to make uh, would be to basically maintain the status quo of, of the level of use of the arena um, and that, you know, that these investments, um, if they were not to happen, would not be able to keep the, that level. So, again, I, I, I would like uh, uh, some type of plan, some type of expectation, um, some, something that we can reference um, besides rhetoric as, as we make this decision, because um, the Hornish representatives just contradicted themselves. I, um, I, I think we need to go back and look at the record and see. I, heard that. I don't know that everyone heard the same way or framed it the way yeah. they, heard, they yeah. fra heard it and framed it the way that you did. Exactly. So we'll come back with the record from that. So with that, we do have four other committees as well as an agenda item and a closed session tonight. So with that, um, we're done with our Economic Development Committee, and we will now go to our Triple E Committee. I know. Ms. Ajmira? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the Triple E Committee has made great progress on the over the first quarter uh, tackling very important initiatives. So I'll break it down in three categories. One is the areas of the environment. We were provided an update on the CF and we did a deeper dive on the progress on CAT's electric bus pilot. Uh, second, under the environment, uh, we provided input on the city's uh, engagement with the Public Utilities Commission in support of our carbon reduction goals. And last, uh, the committee continue to focus on how we can align efforts across our transportation and energy plan and action, and to look for, a way, to look for ways to keep working with the community and private sector to help them understand their role in, um, in helping us meet our low carbon future goal. Uh, second, in the areas of engagement and equity, we discussed our ADA plan, and the committee advocated for full funding uh, for the American Sign Language and Spanish translation. And I know that was part of our this year's budget approval. Um, second was we received an update on our quest to become a welcoming city. And if you have not heard, uh, this, the city of Charlotte have received that certification thanks to Mr. Rios uh, and his uh, team's work on that. And the most critical item that we were charged with was creating an equity in governance framework. Uh, so Mr. Rios will provide an update on that. Uh, he will do a presentation uh, after my remarks um, on, on our government, on our equity in governance framework. And um, for our next quarter, we will be providing input and receiving updates on four items. Number one is the community engagement toolkit. Uh, and I know that Ms. Johnson is very passionate about that work, so we'll be uh, giving you all an update on that. Uh, second is community engagement around elements of our CF, specifically around, we, uh, specifically around branding. And third is energy performance benchmarking. And the fourth, uh, our continuing work on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and the progress on our equity framework. Uh, and we have a goal that we will have uh, equity in governance framework in front of the full council in August. And I know Mr. Winston 
um, has been um, very passionate about the DEI and how we continue to make progress on the framework and the policy item to address the inequities in our system. So with that, um, we, uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Rios to provide us an update on equity and governance framework. Uh, but also I'd like to recognize the committee members, Mr. Winston and uh, Madam Vice Chair, Ms. Johnson, and also our uh, support team, uh, Sarah Hazel, um, Frederico Rios, and Willie Ratchford. Right. Thank you. Mr. Rios. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Johnson. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, members of Council, uh, Mr. Manager and staff. I will try my best to be expeditious with the presentation, uh, given all that you all have to look at tonight. I'll start by mentioning that as we go into the presentation, we will be uh, I will be reaching out to council members that are not on the Triple E committee to have deeper discussions about the material, given how rich and in-depth it is. Moving on to the next slide. So tonight's purpose is really to give you all uh, a list of or, or a composite of all of the presentations uh, that we've gone through in the Triple E committee since its establishment. We're going to be looking at an equity and governance framework the guiding questions that arose out of the usage of that framework and the engagement strategy. Uh, we hope to provide to hear a bit of feedback tonight. Again, we'll have those one on one conversations going forward in the next month or so. Uh, but the goal again is to review the feedback, uh, move forward with the targeted engagement that will be presented as a strategy. And then, uh, as Council Member Ejmira has mentioned, get full approval at the end of August. Moving on to the next slide. This effort is an effort of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the city of Charlotte. I'm proud uh, to serve as the lead on uh, our diversity, equity, and inclusion works in, through our Office of Equity. And so I uh, just want to make sure that that's put out there initially. Next slide. We started with the committee really looking at uh, the definitions that we have for particular items that will continue to arise as we undertake diversity, equity, and inclusion work. We wanted to ensure that we had shared definitions. We know that um, across the spectrum, we will get different uh, perspectives on these particular phrases. And so we wanted to have definitions that we all uh, were sticking to as, as you know, really composite definitions that took into account a variety of viewpoints and were um, used by experts. Moving on to the next slide. We spent a good deal of time really talking about how we ended up in the space we are in relation to equity in our community. So uh, we discussed really what's occurred here from a systems level and a political approach um, in, in the history of Charlotte. So we talked about the history of segregation. We talked about the history of uh, the raising of Brooklyn and other communities of color here in Charlotte. We talked about uh, the leading on opportunity report and its breakdown around the continued reverberation of these impacts that have started very early on in our history uh, as a cosmopolitan metropolitan city. And so you'll see the uh, slide there at the bottom right is a slide from the federal government in regards to redlining, what communities uh, you could receive mortgages and what communities were more difficult to do so. And you'll see uh, the slide at the bottom left is a slide from the Leading on Opportunity reports that we are still very much a bifurcated city, a city that is highly segregated. So all of these things have happened in a policy frame and continue to impact us uh, to this day. Moving forward. I, will, I, I wanna give kudos to council uh, because you all's efforts have really been around establishing equity. Uh, we haven't framed it as such. You all have not uh, necessarily touted them as equity efforts, but each one of the things that are captured here on this slide uh, so especially for the members of this current council, have been equity efforts. You're trying to undo um, some of the historic disenfranchisement that was categorized in the previous slide. Offering yet another example of our work uh, to address the historic disenfranchisement of peoples and our, our passion and desire to uh, be a organization that focuses on DEI. Uh, we have the equity statement that was approved by our city manager earlier this year. And so again, we've prioritized this in the work that we conduct internally and continue to do so through the work of the Triple E Committee. So we offered this uh, as an example of something that we're doing internally around equity. Then we did a deeper dive really looking at what's occurring in other communities around the country. And so we spent time talking about 
uh, Richmond as a community and the work that they've done around equity. Um, this is a scan of a flyer that had been produced in that community that was seeking community input around different uh, things that specifically tie back to equity. Uh, so it was very front facing. Uh, it was structured in a way to get community input and prioritize that input. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, we spent time also looking at what occurred in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm proud to say that um, Louisville, Kentucky's work actually very closely mirrors the State Charlotte report that you all are very familiar with. Um, although it came from two very distinct um, occurrences, a lot of the best practices mirrored each other uh, through that process. So again, different communities undertaking their uh, equity work in vastly different ways. We spent a great deal of time looking at Fairfax, Virginia. Fairfax's uh, equity plan and the application of an equity lens is really highly touted and for many a North Star in relation to equity work. And so uh, their structure is impeccable. We really spent time digging in on that structure and this very much informed uh, the framework that you'll see shortly. We also spent time looking at other efforts that were occurring in cities that maybe we don't always track. Uh, what's really important here, what I'd want to um, really hone in on, is the fact that you'll see in the cities of Long Beach and New York City, particularly on this slide, there has been a focus on measuring equity. So not just um, creating a framework, but also how do we measure equity in the work that occurs in a city? How do we continue to provide that information externally? And so we have the quality of life indicator. Uh, there's been really good discussions around how that can be continued to be adapted um, to better capture equity measures within it. There's also a great tool that's used by the City University of New York that's been applied in um, at least 12 cities around the country in partnership with the Government Alliance on Racial Equity uh, to establish some, some baseline measures around equity. In addition, um, leading on opportunity, a local organization that has really uh, been focused on economic mobility and equity within that construct is, uh, is producing a equity measure as well. Uh, excited about the rollout of that measure uh, soon. And so all of those things together are helping to inform us as we take the next step towards measuring equity. Obviously, we had to start with a framework to get us to that space. We shared with the committee that uh, this work was in no ways uh, linear. Uh, there were times where you would feel like you're in one space and then something would change and you'd have to devote your time, your attention, your foot to another space. And so it's constantly changing, constantly moving. Uh, but the fact that it is not linear does not denote that we are somehow uh, successful. In fact, uh, the nature of this work is really to take time to evaluate multiple things at once. And so though it is not linear, uh, we are still moving towards a space where we're exhibiting the values of our community. So after spending time with the items that I just shared, uh, the E committee members uh, really wanted us to hone in on the acknowledgement of our role, which you saw um, a bit there, and you'll see a bit more in the next set of slides. So the role that government has played in the inequitable state that we currently find ourselves in, um, the real need to apply an equity lens, ensuring that it is embedded in the processes that we undertake in the review of processes and policies. Um, we, we were sure to, we distinctly heard from the committee members that we didn't want to really center the conversation on unintended consequences. So often that is a focal point. We wanted to ensure that there was a path forward um, that you know we didn't want to hone in on that particular item. And then we really heard that engagement is important. And so how do we utilize structures that already exist um, to better inform our process moving forward? This is a lot, uh, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's this great depth uh, to the material you're gonna see, but this is really where we started from. And this framing statement acknowledges um, what past councils and uh, other government structures here in this region um, have have uh, exacerbated in regards to inequities and how we as a community and particularly the members of the committee are choosing to move forward to get to a more equitable community. And this is your, your equity and governance framework. So this is uh, what the members of the committee have signed off on and hope that uh, council uh, also signs off on. We are looking at um, 
the structures in which decision making occurs. And so again, staff service delivery is the strategy, the implementation of the work that occurs from city departments. Uh, council decision making, again, really looking at that policy piece, how we review policies, what tools we utilize in that review, and then this continual conversation that's occurring with residents uh, through community engagement processes where we share accountability, uh, we work together towards our shared results and goals. Resources and investments, so again, that goes across um, and is necessary in this work. And at the bottom, you'll see the foundational items we're trying to get to the real goals in this work. You saw that in the previous framing statement, but I'll uh, mention these out loud. We want to prior prioritize disenfranchised residents. We want to mitigate dis disproportionate impacts. We want to acknowledge and address historic inequities. We want to create more opportunities for upward mobility. We want to consistently evaluate government systems. And lastly, lastly we want to meaningfully engage our residents. Moving on to the next slide. So again, um, th this slide was really informed by the committee members. Uh, as we look to apply an equity lens, uh, committee members shared that it was important to not only capture the council initiatives, where, which are obviously um, of you all's making, but also council responsibilities, those things that hold true uh, beyond this council and are to be taken on by all councils. If we marry those two items together and as staff take on the, poor, the core approaches that are listed here, uh, we believe that we will get to an equitable, thriving community. Uh, and so you, you see that captured uh, here. Moving forward to the next slide. So the application of an equity lens really falls uh, in regard, is really captured in the list of questions, these guiding questions that you see listed here. And what we're asking council members um, to do is to utilize these questions in the review of policy proposals that would come before you. So again, I'll, I'll read this for the, for the sake of the record. What does this policy seek to accomplish? Have most people impacted by this policy been engaged and how? Who benefits or could be burdened by this policy proposal? proposal? What benefits or adverse impacts could result from this proposed policy? How is addressing racial or other inequities considered in this policy? And will it reduce disparities? Again, we recognize that this list of questions is not exhaustive, but it very much captures the spirit of each policy proposal and gets us to a point where we can ask deeper questions still in regards to what it is that is being constructed and how it will uh, eventually impact residents in our community. Moving on to the next slide. Lastly, um, and this we're specifically seeking for feedback from you all in regards to uh, we would like to go before, spend this uh, month of July and part of August uh, reaching out to specific uh, council, council boards and commissions, recognizing that those are groups uh, that serve uh, to advise council members. And so uh, these are the groups that we would like to specifically speak to. And we've already uh, begun discussions to hopefully get on the agendas for each one of these uh, groups. Again, this is a pilot, we're really just getting some baseline information, recognizing that each one of these groups ties back to the broader equity work. In addition to this, we would seek feedback from community-based organizations. Um, and we have a list that thankfully, uh, Willie Ratchard has put together for us, but we seek additional uh, organizations that you all may feel are important to include in this process. And again, as we speak one-on-one, -on -one, we can uh, determine how and when to reach out to each of those organizations. Second step, is to continue our work with the Duke Sanford Policy Lab on researching these two questions. How can policy debates include an equity lens and what is the best public policy definition of equity? So again, leaning on experts to get information that will help us as we continue to prioritize equity in our decision-making processes. Lastly, we would report back uh, August 22nd in regards to what we've heard uh, from these groups and what we've heard from you all in these individual conversations. And with that, I'd love to open it up to any questions you all may have. And before we go to the questions, I just want to um, really express my appreciation to the committee members, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Winston, Ms. Ajmira, the staff team that has put this together. This is exceptional work and so well um, done and, and outlined in a way that's understandable, but impactful as well. And giving us this guide is, is just 
what we needed. So I wanted to just say thank you um, and appreciate all of the effort that you've put in. And I'm sure that there are other council members that have questions or comments. And I think Ms. Watlington was wanted to be recognized. Yes, I was, but I didn't know if um, council member Ajmira wanted to circle back if you had anything else additional before we started. No, uh, okay. we are interested in hearing full council's feedback and thoughts along the way as we develop this, as we continue to develop this framework. Got it. Well, um, I had the pleasure of seeing a little bit of this a couple of uh, months ago. Federico was already well on the way when we first started having a broader discussion about this. And so I was pleasantly surprised to see um, the level of uh, analysis and investigation that we were already looking at both within um, the city and external. So I'm happy to see uh, that that this is coming together very well um, and see it starting to permeate all of the dis discussions that we had. I love that you noted that in a lot of ways, even without explicitly doing so, we were uh, baking the tenets, if you will, of our equity policy into our work. So um, kudos, great work that you all have done so far, and I look forward to seeing the rest of it flesh out. Um, I had a follow-up question that's really kind of um, it's a more general question as it relates to equity, and it's, almost, it's a spillover, if you will, from the previous conversation. I was just curious um, as to how we're thinking about that or if we are yet thinking about this. Um, but as I think about our CBI program, and I know that it's externally facing, but as I think about our current target of 15% and how we got there with our um, disparity study and whatnot, I would love to understand a little bit more about what we're, or if you all have started to investigate this, um, where we're hitting versus our targets, because I know that we create the targets based on the data, but I'd be curious to know whether or not we, um, we are in the position to hit the targets, and if not, what the barriers may be and how you think that fits in here. So, Ms. Watlington, committee had a robust discussion on uh, on our equity framework, where we really had started at 50,000 feet, that uh, we are building a framework, and then ultimately, framework will be followed by the policy, where a policy will be applied to everything we do, from affordable housing to arts and culture funding to economic development to some of the procurement and CBI goals. Uh, so the committee is really right now focused on high level framework and once it's adopted by the full council, where full council gives us green flag, uh, we'll be doing some deeper dive and deeper uh, discussion policy work on the procurement, including the CBI and, and economic development work. Thank you. Yep. I'll be interested to see uh, how that shakes out because I definitely uh, like the approach that we're taking as far as the guiding questions. Um, it strikes me as more, um, or it strikes me as a tool to be used for new policy. Um, and so I would imagine there's going to be some assessment of existing policy that will accompany it for policy improvements. Am I thinking about that correctly? Yes, absolutely. So if you can go back to this, that slide, Mr. Rios, where we have those questions. Oh, that committee provided the feedback on those questions, uh, the criteria, yes. So this is really our guiding force. Um, you know, so every time we will look at the policy, we will look at these questions and, and address, uh, and this is the way to look at everything we do from the equity lens, from the equity perspective. So that will also apply to the CBI work. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so to that end, I would do, I'll look forward to um, what, how we augment this to assess existing policy as we think about uh, where where we can close gaps. But great work. Thank you all. Yep. Thank great, you. Idea. great great comment, Ms. Watlington. Um, Ms. Johnson, any comment? And since you've sat through the committee, maybe not. <laughs> well, I yeah. always well, come. <laughs> well, you don't have to now. No, no, I didn't say no, you no, had no to. it's fine. It's wait, fine. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so this work is, um, it's an honor to be on this, on this committee. Um, I, I think that, I, I've said during committee meetings, I hope we can eliminate the term unintended consequences if we take a step back, because some things are foreseeable. 
Um, so I, I would like, I'm, I'm happy that we would, we've discussed the, the ASL interpreter and it's in the budget. So this has just been an honor to be a part of this committee. Um, as far as the CBI goals, see, so we're looking at this for future policies, but the next presentation is August 22nd. However, we have a vote next week where these kind of equitable considerations we should be considering. That's a lot of money. And if there's an opportunity to, to raise that level of minority contractors, I think that, that we should be looking at that. We shouldn't, we as council members, and, and I'm very happy to be on the committee, and Federico does a great job, but we as council members, this should be a part of our consideration all of the time. I mean, it's what we say when we're campaigning. So um, is, is Mark, Mr. Jones, can you comment on the, the current CBI goals or is Mr. Yeah. Coker available to give us an idea about that 15% and what the justification is for that policy? Sure, so uh, thank you, Council Member Johnson. So uh, every five years you have a disparity study. The last time we had it is 2017. Uh, there's a disparity study that's uh, being conducted as we speak. I don't have the um, schedule in front of me, I think Phil's in the other room, but it um, will come through the ED committee, much like in 2017, where a part of what happens in this process is there is a look back to see how you achieve the goals, how the goals were set, and the, um, I guess the best way to say it is, it is what is the, um, uh, not the process, but as you move forward, were you really establishing the goals in the right way using the right metrics? So um, there's been a preliminary briefing that I received on this. So I think what the council will see is that there's a, um, I would say more thoughtful process going into this. So again, uh, not necessarily what the triple E committee is doing, but in terms of the disparity study, you'll, you will have an opportunity to revisit that because you have to do it every five years. And we're in the, the final stages of being able to bring that to committee. And I w I'd like to follow up to Ms. Johnson's question because I would assume that the 16% that is being looked at for the goal for the um, construction, but the each contract would have a specific goal. And I would assume that you set an overall and it could be changed as you as these contracts come on board because we're not gonna be doing these contracts in the next couple of weeks. There's the architectural and all of that. This has to be scoped out. We don't, at, my understanding is that we have not actually bid these contracts yet. So when it does come and we have these questions, which are great questions to be able to ask and almost like a little checklist, then we'll be actually, if it's not next week, it's probably several months out that would impact that large amount of money. Okay, thank you, because we know equity is not equality. We have to be intentional about um, reducing these disparities. So 16% um, does just, it just does not seem like a, a justifiable number. And I don't know where that policy came from for, from a, for a city our size, when there's so many disparities in the black community and in the minority community, and people are really hurting. So if we're intentional about giving this this process, something we can control, a boost, I think we should, we should do everything that we can um, to do that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments from council members? I'd love to comment <laughs> as right. well. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Winston? Uh, yes, I, I, think, um, I, I think the committee, uh, Mr. Rios and, and staff have, have really captured um, the intention um, I think of the charge of the committee, um, and I can say personally um, from, um, you know, what I think equity policy work on a municipal level um, uh, sh should be uh, going uh, towards. So I think we're on, on, a, on, a, on a, a right path, um, but I'd like to build on something that um, Ms. Watlington uh, said. Um, once we finally kind of uh, tie a bow on this and, and adopt this, um, this work can't stop, you know. Um, we're going to have to look <laughs> backwards, forwards, and where we're at um, at, at the present time uh, uh, to see 
how to apply uh, this policy, because uh, it's not going to be uh, a one size fits all. It's not going to be uh, the same application, uh, decision to decision, and even in, in the category of decisions, um, it, it, uh, you know, for instance, whether it's, it's zoning, economic development, um, 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 public safety, um, uh, the application might uh, be different, um, um, a decision to decision. So as we continue on this path, and, and, and you know, I, I think we're, we're, we're on a strong path, I would like council and, and, and staff and, and, and the mayor um, to consider, you know, that this is, this is not going to be um, ad hoc work. Um, this is going to be continuous work. So we need to kind of think about um, um, how do we progress into the next phase of implementing uh, this equity lens. Um, and, and, and again, I think that's something um, that um, might not go away um, anytime soon, as, 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 as we see, as, as Ms. Ms. Johnson um, mentioned, um, we're going to be asked to make a decision um, and next week um, that not every council <laughs> gets to make, um, not every two or three councils um, gets to, to make. We are a body uh, that works in continuity, um, uh, so we're going to have to figure out um, how to empower um, uh, not only uh, uh, the iteration, this iteration of council, uh, but future iterations of council um, to inter interact with this policy and, and lens. Um, so I'd like for us to keep that in mind as, as we continue on this work, and maybe that is something uh, uh, that we can um, address uh, down, down the line uh, in, in our committee. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Winston. All right, let's go ahead and move from our Triple E committee to our Great Neighborhoods Committee. Report out, Ms. Watlington. All right, so I'll be brief. I know we've got a ways to go, but essentially the Great Neighborhoods Committee, which is comprised of myself, Council Members Graham, Johnson, Newton, and Phipps, have been focused um, over the last two months specifically on a couple of items, namely, first and foremost, anti-displacement. We were able to receive an overview for, about the Silver Line TOD study um, because we want to be a lot more intentional as we've all spoken about as a council and how we plan around this. Some of the specific topics of interest that related to the Silver Line included our land acquisition strategy. We know that was an opportunity along the blue line, so how are we going to do that? Um, how to support and protect existing neighborhood character. So when we think about um, the route of the Silver Line, we know that there are a quite a few communities that are also vulnerable to displacement as highlighted by our dashboard. And so as we think about how to um, incentivize denser development around our transit projects w without uh, creating and even incentivizing displacement, we've got to get clear about that. Uh, we also are wanting to be more intentional intentional about identifying how those that benefit from the investment uh, through future development can help pay a fair share of the cost. Um, small business retention in the corridor. We want to make sure that as owners have an opportunity to get the equity out of their property that those tenants that are usually small businesses are able to um, stay along the corridor and we can continue to have the culture and the vibrancy of the neighborhoods that we previously have had. Um, and then also uh, wanting to make sure that the neighborhoods and the citizens themselves are informed about the work on the project so that they've got an opportunity to engage at the appropriate times. And then finally making sure any recommendations that uh, are made are also supported by the UDO, again, to prevent that potential conflict in terms of achieving our COP 2040 goals. Um, the next component of the anti-displacement update that we received was the staying in place pilot program. Uh, we are currently piloting our staying in place expansion in Hidden Valley, Washington Heights, and Winterfield. So staff has been engaging with those communities to identify specific household needs as well as broader community needs. So we look forward to the lessons learned out of that pilot and how we can continue to uh, expand our uh, efforts there. And then finally, the Nest Commission has been meeting. They've been meeting since February and have outlined three key work streams uh, in response to some of the priorities that have shown up uh, at, at this dais over the last several months. So the first one being lay of the land, and that one's focused around land acquisition, site control, home ownership, uh, and what potential tools that we can expand or create, like our land trust models. Um, I already mentioned acquisition along transit lines, co-op home ownership models, and education programs um, 
for our residents. The second work stream is program improvements and policy gaps. So we want to take a look at our existing toolkit and see where we can make program improvements to increase utilization and also to ensure that we have all of the, when we look at the housing spectrum, we've got all of uh, the components covered. Um, and then finally, the understanding the impacts of the UDO work stream. And that one, as I mentioned, is all about how do we make sure that we get what we are seeking out of the policies without creating foreseen conflicts. <laughs> uh, the next piece that we uh, reviewed and spoke about on in our May meeting was community engagement and really focused around neighbors building neighborhoods and how do we really strengthen that uh, neighborhood engagement. So coming out of the pandemic, we know that a lot of our communities, particularly in our areas that are also vulnerable to displacement, have not gotten back to their original drumbeat um, because they may not have converted over to the digital platforms through the pandemic. So we want to be um, intentional and make a concerted effort with helping those communities do so. Um, special thanks to Travis Roseboro with the Back Creek Chase community and Adrian Martinez with North End Community Coalition. Those were two neighborhood leaders that came and shared some of the work and some of their best practices and how they've been able to drive engagement in their communities. Um, we appreciate uh, that and want to continue to establish a collective and a cooperative kind of approach. So definitely I'm open to having more community leaders come to the uh, Great Neighborhoods Committee and be a part of the discussion because that's what it's going to really take as we want to make sure we're getting um, down into our communities. We want to make sure that our community engagement programs like Civic Leadership Academy and like Neighborhood Matching Grants, that we're able to meet the interest with the resources. And right now we know that we're often oversubscribed in those areas, so we want to make sure that we are right-sizing that. Um, we also received an update from staff regarding all of the housing, uh, um, housing initiatives update. We want to make sure that the things that we set out to do in our strategic plan are actually coming to fruition, so we will continue to uh, go back and take a look at what we have achieved versus what we said that we were going to achieve, um, and that is actually in my packet, so I'm assuming it's going to be available to the public um, as part of the notes from this meeting. Um, it will show you our areas of focus, our year-to-date actions and accomplishments, as well as key next steps. I will hit three key next steps that I want to make sure are highlighted, um, and then I will close out. The first one is our Housing and Jobs Summit. So as you all are aware, we are working to have a um, the Housing and Jobs Summit later this year, so Council Member Graham and I will be meeting with our support staff to discuss that, and we'll be able to hopefully get something um, in front of you for feedback um, in the next month or so. Uh, the other piece is that we know corporate investors is a huge discussion here in our community right now. Some of us had an opportunity to meet with the National Home Rental Council um, last month. Uh, we've also asked the NEST, the NEST committee to prioritize this analysis associated with uh, what are the implications of going into communities as corporate landlord investors and uh, buying up properties. We know that some HOAs have created some innovative solutions, but we also understand that they're starting to see across the country some pushback from, um, from the special interest groups that may be um, impeding the ability of HOAs to uh, determine how their neighborhoods are going to grow. So we are definitely interested in that and coming alongside our residents to make sure that we are able to work with um, uh, investors and residents and owners to make sure we've got a good balance of options for people who choose to rent, but also making sure that our neighborhoods are um, are indicative of the will of the people. Uh, we're also developing educational collateral that we will be sending out as part of our staying in place um, program. So again, starting with Hidden Valley, Winterfield, and Washington Heights, but the intent there is to really make sure that residents have the information that they need in terms of what we have available in housing um, and great neighborhoods resources and that they know how to leverage it. Um, and then finally, our Great Neighborhoods agenda topics for the remainder of the year. We originally had uh, not planned to meet in July and August, but given the workload, we decided that we would go ahead and have meetings during those uh, months to be scheduled. Uh, so for those that are in the committee, we'll work, we'll work around folks' availability. Um, 
some of the things that are going or that are currently in the hopper, as you all are aware, are the source of income advisory group recommendation number two, which is the increased public private funding to support nonprofits with programming designed to increase landlord participation in the housing choice uh, program. Um, housing trust fund tune up, we're gonna do the SWAT recommendations. We know we've been talking for a long time. How do we better utilize our housing trust fund dollars to drive home ownership? So we're gonna take a look at that. And then finally, the referrals that came out of our budget adjustment process. We're gonna be taking a look at those throughout the rest of the year. Um, and that concludes my report. Happy to take any questions. Questions? Ms. Um, Johnson? This question might be for, for you, Mayor. Um, when will the source of income discrimination vote come before full council? I don't know. Okay. Do you have any uh, idea? Yeah, I was told it would be uh, late this month, actually. Okay, so June, okay. And then, thank you, that was a great presentation. Okay, so I wanna ask some questions about anti-displacement policies. And this might be for Mr. Jones. I don't know, these are just some ideas that, that I have. So we know that we are dealing with residents from Sterling and Southern Comfort. And I, and I would like for us as a council to talk about anti-displacement policies for renters. Um, and, and I don't know if that's a change in zoning policies, if renters should be notified or we should be doing something different. But on our next zoning meeting, we're, we're gonna be deciding on um, petition number 2021, I think 256. And it's the Econo Lodge that's for sale. You right? got deferred one more. Good, okay. But how do we as a council get in front of something like that so that in a couple months, we're not having people that are displaced. Are we, we need a way to ensure that at least when hotels are, are sold, that we're meeting with the residents and that information's out there as soon as possible. So Mayor, I don't know if that goes to the, the committee or what can we do as a council to, to do something different or to notify renters when, they're, when the, uh, the dwelling is being sold? Sure, um, just to speak on the Econo Lodge one, and I think there's two buckets, right? There's the uh, displacement that occurs when a private sale is made, um, and then one that occurs as a result of a rezoning, which obviously will trigger a private sale and some development. Um, for the Econo Lodge one in particular, I did speak with the owner today. I um, encouraged him to, to reach out and start to put together a plan um, that could be communicated to council so that those of us who are going to be voting on it would be comfortable that there is a, a uh, a transition strategy available right. for the residents. So that's one that, as it comes through rezoning, um, I believe we have an opportunity to really talk about, well, what does this look like and considering uh, what we know will be the implications for the residents. For the private ones, that's a very interesting question. I would be interested in some of the ability that we may have at the local level to, um, to help notify residents and what we can do to safeguard. I'm not aware of anything at the moment, but. After I got your email, I asked the city attorney to advise us on what options we have. And so I, talk, I spoke with him this morning. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I mean, I just, I don't know if that goes to the committee, but we have, we have to do something. It, again, if it's including renters in the public notification, especially on the, on the hotels, that seems like an easy one, but um, yeah. So okay. I think, I, I hope that he will be able, um, I hope Ms. James will say that um, Mr. Baker, who's still working from home and we see him here. Um, hope he's doing well, but ask Tim if he can give us some of the things that we are legally, as, uh, as an arm of the state, are legally able to do. And it may be something that, um, I think Ms. Watlington said she spoke with an owner. Maybe it's a time to talk to some of the realtors and people like that um, that are associated with those kinds of transactions to see what their thinking is as well. Well, thank you, because every time a property sold, I mean, when the rents are increased, so either overtly or covertly, people are being displaced. So we just have to figure out a way, a way to get renters at least notification to give them more notice. That, that's what I would like to see. So mm -hmm. thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Wellington. All right. Any other Ma comments? Ms. Ajmira? Yes, thank you. Uh, good presentation, Ms. Watlington, a good report. Uh, I know you mentioned something about career job fair opportunities. 
Um, have you also considered including some of the renewable energy initiatives and uh, partnering with our AAA committee? Uh, for an example, the Renew program and some of the opportunities we have seen in renewable energy sector, and we have similar opportunities that uh, Ms. Hazel has been uh, discussing with various partners in the community, especially the private sector. So I think it would be a great opportunity to also include those in the overall uh, uh, career and job fair outreach. That'd be great, thanks. And second, uh, I know you mentioned something about uh, incentivizing the use of housing uh, choice vouchers. Uh, is that a topic next for committee discussion? Um, it actually was one of the recommendations that came out of the source of income work. So we did cover it to some degree in uh, committee once before, but it is on the docket to go to come before council separately. So we'll probably have another discussion regarding it specifically before it comes back to full council. Got it. Well, I look forward to um, hearing more about that uh, before I ask any questions. But thank you. All right, Mr. Winston. Uh, uh, no, thank you. I, I just wanted to uh, respond to uh, Ms. Johnson's um, um, concern about contacting uh, residents in hotels. Um, it, it just, and I think it's a good thing that um, the mayor um, asked Mr. Baker um, to respond to some things um, because um, a couple years ago, uh, uh, on iteration of the Great Neighborhoods uh, co uh, Committee, when I was on it. Um, it's not as easy as it may seem. There was a, some Supreme Court um, rulings uh, that limited the ability uh, for um, governments uh, to to get um, information of who is staying um, in certain um, hotels um, and rooms. Uh, this is, is stemmed out of um, uh, some law enforcement actions. Um, but again, I, I look forward to uh, Mr. Baker's uh, follow up. Um, because while it may seem logically like it, um, it should be easy um, legally. It, it's not as easy a, a, as it may seem, and that 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 should preclude us um, from trying to find um, legal avenues um, um, to to deal um, with this. But I, um, I just wanted to give that a, a bit of a vision um, on past work of council as we we've tried to um, um, kind of deal uh, with with this specific and that specific issue about notifications. Um, to people who might be um, at risk and, and, and living in these properties. Thank you, Mr. Winston. Thank you, Mr. Winston. So now we'll go to intergovernmental relations. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, since this strategy session has last met, the committee's met. We have had updates and have been tracking the federal and state agendas. You can read about that on your own. And we have been uh, pursuing functional consolidation. We've met with the Intergovernmental uh, Committee of the County, and that is progressing as well. You can read about that in the package. Thank you very much. Our next report, um, are there well, questions? Uh, two, uh, two chairs, and I was gonna give- um, All right, Mr. Winston. Yes, um, so uh, as part of um, uh, the, the, the follow-up, I think there was, there's two things, well, one I'll give, uh, to the functional co consolidation update, I, I, I've talked to the co-chair, the chair of IRC, um, in um, um, Mr. Jarrell, um, and as you can read, I think we had a a, a good um, meeting with with the county. Um, uh, there's one note I, I think, as we all know, um, language is very important. Um, the the term that the county um, uh, committee was using um, and was um, uh, uh, felt was, was most appropriate um, was a consolidated approach. Um, and I, I think that's language that we have used um, in committee um, and in full council. Um, and I would, I would, caref I would, I would, I would carefully uh, hope that we consider um, utilizing um, the, the same language um, as, as our counterparts um, as we move forward. Um, uh, functional consolidation, I think, um, might um, uh, be interpreted um, differently uh, than um, uh, the idea of uh, a consolidated approach, um, especially as the county um, kind of considers what, what that may mean, what their appetite for the breadth of that may mean. Um, I was also able to talk to the chair 
um, uh, uh, today uh, to get a, a little bit more of the timeline for us to understand. Um, they will not be meeting, the committee will not be meeting um, for the rest of the summer. That's how their workflow works. Um, but they will be, um, so the next time the committee will convene um, will be in September. Um, so, you know, as, as we kind of look at this kind of quarterly or a halftime report, um, I think uh, the committee has done a, a, a great job. We've done our job and we, we are successful um, and we should um, kind of um, consider um, how we interact um, with the county as, as, their, pro as their process progresses, progresses, again, starting in September, obviously knowing that we will have um, a different um, uh, council um, seated at that point in time and, and, and perhaps a, a, a different committee. Um, one other thing I, I wanted to know um, as we think about this intergovernmental approach, um, one of the questions that came out of our state updates uh, was from committee member um, Driggs. Um, uh, he wanted us um, to look at, um, uh, the, 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 with the, but the state budget surplus, how can we advocate um, for m more of that funding um, to go to our court system? Um, our court system is one of the least funded um, per capita in the, in, in the state. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is, is something that um, we've heard from, you know, talking to the district attorney, talking to the courts, uh, as I've sat in um, meetings of, of CJAG, um, of, of how do we advocate um, for that. I think that this, personally, I think that this is um, something uh, that we as a city can lead on. Um, um, but in the same vein as, as, as we've been taking this intergovernmental approach, I think we need to be careful um, to engage, if we, if we so choose to do that, uh, to engage uh, the numerous partners that we have that are in or interact um, uh, with uh, the county court system uh, to see how, if, if, if city council does choose, um, uh, to, to best uh, um, advocate for that. With that said, um, uh, what we have also done in over the past two months is we have uh, finished um, uh, presenting uh, the current legislative agenda uh, to our federal and state delegations. So um, with that request of, of, that Mr. Mr. Driggs asked us to look into, um, uh, that kind of segues into the idea that, hey, um, we, need, we need council members uh, to start thinking about uh, uh, what are their priorities for our next legislative agenda um, so uh, we can uh, give uh, the right runway um, to the committee um, and staff uh, to figure out how to best um, approach some of the uh, more complex issues. Again, um, understanding that we have the the, um, the strange um, situation of having a new council um, uh, that will be set um, um, in September. Uh, so that completes my update. Happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Any questions or comments for intergovernmental? Hearing no questions and comments, we'll go to safe communities. All right, and we will try to keep this short because we have a lot more on the agenda tonight. If you are interested, um, well, first of all, one of the things that we're going to get to here in just uh, a couple of items further down our agenda tonight is our neighborhood traffic calming policy, so that will be the appropriate time to get into the weeds on that if you so desire. Um, also, we have a meeting tomorrow at noon of the Safe Communities Committee meeting, which I would encourage anybody to join that is interested. We will be getting an update on our Vision Zero traffic safety um, efforts around speed enforcement. Uh, we'll be getting a Safe Charlotte update on our Safe Charlotte initiatives, and we will be hearing the community input group that um, we had going through all of the Safe Charlotte work uh, earlier in this term, we we'll reconvened to discuss some of the city code issues that we had been discussing as a council. Uh, they have provided some feedback. We will hear about that during that meeting tomorrow as well. So join us for any of those discussions. Um, some of the other things that are still sort of in the hopper on this front, the Umbrella Center is moving along and continues to make progress. Um, so look forward to some news on that in the coming weeks and months. Um, the Travel Safely app is in its rollout phase and we will continue to get updates about that. Um, most of the other things I have mentioned here. So we'll talk about traffic calming in probably two hours when we get to that agenda item. And we'll talk about the other things tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, that's number four. All right, number two. I'm sorry, no, are there questions? Hearing none. I have a comment to make, and I'll be I'll be really really brief. Uh, 
I, I'm just concerned about all the gun violence in the city. I'm not sure what we can do, what we can say, how we can say it. Uh, but I think we just acknowledge that over the last couple of weeks, it's really been heartbreaking um, watching the news in mm -hmm. all parts of the city. And so I, I just throw that out there to, to let the community know that collectively, I think this is about the only time I'll speak well, for the council that we kind of we, we know what's happening out there. And we're not and we're not blind to that. I mean, that is obviously some of that is impacted by the Safe Charlotte work. But to put some numbers to what you're mentioning, I mean, our larceny from autos as of well through the period through March 30th, 238 guns stolen from vehicles, which is a 17 percent increase compared to last year. The University City Division leads all divisions in gun seizures, 67 percent increase year over year. 129% increase in the last five years in the university area. So, I mean, we've got to continue to do, and it is continuing to be done, but we've got to continue to talk about the importance of making sure that for folks who are gun owners in our community, that they are um, storing those properly and safely and, and not in their cars where they can be stolen, um, among a bunch of other things. But I think the Safe Charlotte work, too, is trying to divert some of the folks who end up being the victims or perpetrators of gun violence before they get down, that far down that wrong path. And so that's the long game. I think the short game is going to continue to be uh, encouraging people to be responsible gun owners and, um, and other things around that. But it is not just an anecdotal observation. There, it is statistically backed up that it is getting worse. And summer is coming. Ms. Ajmira? Yes. yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I also share um, concerns that's been raised by Mr. Graham on gun violence. And um, I understand the work that CMPD is doing to seize the guns uh, that, are illegals of, um, that are illegal from our streets, but I think we need to do more. Uh, I would I would like to inter, I would like to see if intergovernmental committee could work on adding um, adding um, gun reform to our legislative agenda. I know that is something that uh, will help us address the safety issue that we are seeing in our neighborhoods. And I think that is in, there is a serious issue that uh, we need to contribute. We need to contribute towards a solution here. Um, so I, I would really like to see that as part of our federal legislative agenda as well as our state legislative agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ajmira. Um, Mr. Jones and I found a program around youth for the summer that um, the Y has done a lot to bring people inside of the buildings, um, young people inside the building. We made a contribution, was it Larkin, when I shot that three-point um, goal and made it from, you know, like 40 feet, just like one. Poole did, you know, yesterday. And the question I have, though, seriously, is was two million enough and did we allow enough for so tomorrow when you have your meeting, I'd like to really see if we can figure out a way to expand our youth engagement programs for young men, 15, you know, 12, maybe even 10 to, you know, 18. And if that's, a, if that's working, if you can look at that and say, does it work? If it's working, we have it in certain wise, but we don't have it everywhere. And are there other venues outside of the wise where we know that there is a, a deficit um, of opportunity for people, to, for young people for the summer. So if you would look into that, I would certainly appreciate it. Okay, so um, our last committee report is from Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, what now? Oh, that's right, we have <laughs> Mr. Driggs. Mr. Driggs, you're, you're next, and then we'll go to TAP. Mr. Okay, Driggs. Thank you, Mayor. Uh -huh. um, yes, talk, the Budget and Governance Committee, the members are myself as chair, uh, Ms. Ajmira as vice chair, and council members Bukhari, Iselt, and Phipps. Uh, we got, if people remember, a not too gentle shove uh, at a recent meeting to clear a few items that have been referred to us. And so at our last meeting, the committee looked in particular at the question of four-year terms, staggered elections, and the 8th district. 
And it's all in your materials, but I'll just say that uh, four votes were taken and, and passed. Uh, one of them was that we should target a referendum in 2023 on the subject of four-year staggered terms. So the, 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 the committee recommends that the terms would be staggered uh, and that we conduct that referendum in 2023. We had some uh, information from the staff about trying to get that referendum done this year, but it's a, it would be a very crowded schedule and uh, uh, full of pitfalls. And, and personally, I don't think that voting on four-year terms for council at a time when there are no council elections taking place actually makes a lot of sense. Um, the other next vote was that uh, term limits. Now, the term limits issue was actually not referred by council, so the committee kind of took it up again, uh, even though that wasn't something that was included in the referral that we got. The issue there is that it does require an act by the legislature. We don't have the authority to do that. Uh, and But the committee then, by a majority vote, uh, proposed that we uh, pursue the idea of establishing term limits, which I think probably means that we would have to have a legislative agenda and work through the Intergovernmental Relations Committee. Um, another item that we actually didn't, uh, uh, we were not instructed by the full council to bring forward, but the committee brought it up again, was nonpartisan elections. Once again, in a split vote, this time four to one, uh, we decided uh, to, to take that up or to recommend to full council that we pursue that. Um, and the final vote was the 8th District idea. Uh, so uh, the 8th District idea has the same requirements around it that uh, the, ter the four-year terms do as far as being a referendum topic and so on. So the vote from the, the committee was to recommend to full council that we bring forward the idea alongside the four-year terms of an 8th District uh, for the referendum in 2023. Um, the other two things quickly that we talked about were our uh, virtual meeting rules. And we didn't actually reach a vote on this. We saw a reprise of the presentation from staff. Uh, and by the way, I want to commend Ms. James uh, for her tireless work on all of these topics. Um, <clears throat> so we saw a reprise of the presentation of the staff that included some language changes uh, that we could make to our existing policies uh, minor ones, but with the general goal of getting us back to in-person meetings uh, when the state of emergency is lifted. So that since we don't think that's going to happen right away, the committee will take that up at our next meeting. And the last one was uh, a question about rules of procedure, particularly referrals. And uh, the committee hasn't really gotten its arms around that. But I did have a conversation, if I can kind of point this out with the mayor and the manager, about the idea of allowing a member of council to offer uh, an idea for council uh, action and to have that proposal considered by the staff uh, with, so that a little background information could then be brought to the full council for our vote on whether or not that's something with which we wanted to proceed. So I hope we'll be able to formalize that as well and consider it in our next meeting. And that's my report. All right. Um, I'm surprised that the committee added things to the agenda that were not referred. So I, I just maybe we can talk about I that. I can address offline. that if you'd like, Madam Mayor. Of course. The uh, the referral it's said to take up the items uh, that were um, referred to us by the citizens committee, and while it specifically said items like four year terms. Um, we ended up voting on them because it didn't say items that were also part of that, which were uh, term limits and nonpartisan elections. So the referral was about the items that were referred to us from the Citizens Committee, and uh, we decided to vote as a group on them, and surprisingly, that was passed through. So that, that's the reason. I, if I recall, I thought that the council adopted portions of that report and not every part of it. I mean, I understand that here's the um, referral, the request for the citizens and the report, but maybe I just don't recall yeah, the, the, that they that those areas that were recommended. It's fine if chose that, but it was not the full report. Yeah, but I think the, the premise of our conversation was it's fine if we as a council are going to take up and say mayor and council want to do this. But if we're going back on the premise that we are acting on something referred to us by a citizens committee, those things are embedded in one topic. So it says 
you can do four-year terms that include term limits and are nonpartisan. That's one thing. So that was the referral. We took up that. If you wanted and would like us to, as a group, say this is what mayor and council want to do, then that's fine, but it has to be completely separated from the premise that some citizens group told us to do this because that is no longer valid unless we take them all up. Well, I so I, 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 I if need, I may comment, uh, the chair. we discussed mm -hmm. in, in full council uh, the recommendations from the citizens group, and at that time we did not take a formal vote, but there was a consensus opinion that some of the items referred by the citizens group should be referred to the committee and other ones not. And then because there had not been a formal vote defining clearly which and so on, uh, the, the votes were taken in the committee. But uh, I don't know whether uh, this is just a semantic problem that we should not make any reference to recommendations from the Citizens Committee unless we uh, consider them all uh, together. Um, but uh, I regarded them personally as being a, a, a list of, of recommendations, some of them interrelated, like the staggered terms, if we have four to your terms and so on. Um, but uh, what, what we now have back with the full council to think about, since we didn't vote and formalize our position on these issues, is whether or not we do want to take the recommendations from the Citizens Committee as one package uh, or whether we want to describe differently uh, separate actions that we might take on individual items. I, I think, thanks for explaining that to me. I understand the um, concept behind it and the thinking behind it. Um, I just believe that if we didn't help the public that we were going to do something a little bit different in what, besides what the committee said um, for the agenda. So at some point, I'd like to make sure that we have public input on this on the um, committee's stance. And I don't know when we can do that, but Mr. Driggs, you can figure out a time that when we come back um, to have this discussion with the um, allowing the public to comment. And I know that the committee had a comment, but I don't know that the public had one. So when we come back, we'll have an opportunity to do that. Okay, thank you. I think now we'll go to the, um, Ms. Johnson. Yes, I, I have a question. Um, there's, and this is for Ms. James, I guess, or you, Mayor. There's some policy that we have. If something, if, if a referral is made to a committee, and they have X number of days or months to bring it back before council or the, and help me out here, or, or the initiator can ask for it to be in front of full council, right? So if we could get clarification on that rule or if you know that rule, because we sent a, an issue to the governance committee back in April of 2021 I don't know. Um, it's the issue, it's the item of, about the number of council members that it takes to get something on the agenda. And I know that Mr. Driggs mentioned it today and hopefully, he said hopefully we can talk about it next week, but we do have a policy about that, that there is a finite time that it can be um, at the committee level. So if you can get that information I, and send an email out, Ms. James, if you could do that, please. Here, well, I'll take a look at it. I didn't know if Mr. Baker was on and could address that, but if not, we'll take a look at maybe something. Thank that you, because I don't, yeah, I just, if it's time for it to come before council, um, it's, you know, there's, the committee is, if it's been at the committee for greater than a year, then there's a policy that we need to bring it back before full council and not at the, at the pleasure of the committee chair. We'll take Thank a look you. and see what we can okay. find, sure. All right, we're ready for um, the TAP committee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the TAP committee met a couple of times since the last report out, once in April and twice in May, and we've got a, that's because we have a lot on our agenda. Um, we got an update on the UDO economic impact analysis study, uh, which identified potential refinements to the draft UDO based on detailed financial and physical impact review and analysis. Um, the final economic and design reports are being developed now, and those will be shared with the stakeholder group and with the committee, um, as well as the full council for consideration as staff moves into making uh, revisions for the next UDO, well, for the next UDO draft. Um, and then when the UDO is adopted, the recommended effective date will actually be nine months after adoption. Um, during that time, all conventional 
zonings will translate from current zoning districts to the new zoning districts. And if there's a conditional rezoning that's filed four months prior to the UDO effective date, it can be approved under the current zoning regulations. Um, UDO updates over the next 90 days, um, moving towards the council adoption in August. At our June 13th meeting, whoops, uh, we'll discuss highlights of the major changes to the public hearing draft, and then in, on July 11th, we'll review a summary of those comments received during the comment period and during the public hearing. And then at our August 8th meeting, we'll discuss a summary of the comments from the public hearing and preview highlights from the adoption draft. Um, the second item was the strategic mobility plan, and I won't go into that too much because we're that's on our agenda for tonight. Um, the but basically just to review, it's a culmination of the several of the adopted policy uh, transportation policies that we've adopted over the past two decades, actually, and it incorporates the 2040 comprehensive plan. Um, it's organized into two parts: the transportation policy and the street policy and the streets manual. Um, which includes the comprehensive transportation review and the streets map. The streets manual is focused on how the private investment into mobility is shaped and, ad and adopted, um, and the adoption of the streets street manual aligns with the UDO adoption. Um, public draft of the street of the SMP was released on May 20th. Uh, virtual. Engagement sessions are underway through June 13th, and then the public hearing is scheduled for June 13th. Um, we will discuss the draft strategic mobility plan on our June 13th committee meeting, and um, we're set for adoption of that on June 27th. Um, and then street ma streets manual will continue to be discussed in the July and August TAP meetings. The Silver Line, and the, the committee was given an update on the Lynx Silver Line TOD study, Transit Oriented Development Study, and that study began in January of 2020, and it covers multiple jurisdictions, Gaston County, Belmont to the west, and trans, transverses through Charlotte and out to Matthews and Indian Trail. Uh, the Silver Line project um, is taking lessons from the blue line, but also adding the, um, in the new element of equity, displacement, and affordable housing. Um, the TOD study developed six demonstration station area plans and um, with development concepts and infrastructure recommendations and identified affordable housing and anti-displacement strategies for further consideration. And the final report is available on the CATS website. Um, the equitable TOD is the next phase of this study and will focus on building capacity in the corridor and reflecting community values in the corridor. And CATS received a grant of $405,000 for this work. Um, and the plan will start later in the summer of 2022. And then Envision My Ride was discussed and the bus priority study um, was presented which lays out the strategies to improve time, access, and experience for all passengers. It aligns with the 2030 transit plan, the 2040 comprehensive plan, and the strategic mobility plan and connect beyond. Um, the vision of Envision My Ride is, again, more frequent bus service, consistent schedules with high frequency service every 15 minutes or better for core routes, including in the corridors of opportunity and all the other routes would be no more than 30 minutes. Uh, the priority bus treatment includes signal priority system maintaining on time service for buses in partnership with, CO, with CDOT, bus stop amenity improvements and mobility hubs, and increased access to new crosstown connections. So the next steps for that will be developing the six initial corridors and a program for bus stop amenity improvements uh, and to study potential micro transit zones and bus rapid transit corridors and develop a capital program for implementation of these recommendations. And then, as you know, the Gold Line Phase 3 design contract was discussed briefly um, regarding the, the 
remaining six miles of the 10 mile segment. Um, I won't, I don't think I have to go into all of that because we discussed that quite a bit last week. Um, and uh, let's see. So that, that got deferred, that vote, as you know, did not, was not taken last week and it'll be deferred to the June 13th council meeting. Other upcoming updates over the next 90 days include CATS will be coming to the TAP committee for the next several months with a number of updates on work they have underway, including the Link Silverline ULI study update and responses to the ULI study, uh, Connect Beyond update, which is the regional transit study uh, recently completed in partnership with Central Line and Regional Council, update on the new South End station and to receive um, an update on our electric buses. And that's pretty much as brief of a summary as I can give you on that because we have a lot of work that we ha have had in that particular committee. And with that, that ends item number two on our agenda. <laughs> All right, so should we jump right into Mr. Jones, item yes. number three? Yes, so thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, Mayor, the Mayor, I have my hand up. Could I just make a comment, please? Oh, I don't think we decided to vote on the gold line on the 13th. I just think we decided to defer the vote. I don't believe it, that we committed in our meeting that we would vote on it on the 13th. Okay, I got that information. Yeah. See that. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Drake. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. Uh, the, the next two items, uh, I guess in terms of progression of something coming out of a committee, then coming to the strategy session to eventually get on a business agenda for a vote, uh, these are the next two items. One, the strategic mobility uh, plan, as well as the neighborhood traffic calming. I think uh, the strate strategic mobility plan came out of TAP the neighborhood traffic calming out of safe neighborhoods. So we'll have Ed McKinney take care of item number three, and I believe Debbie Smith will take care of item number four. Okay. Mr. McKinney. Thank you. Uh, again, Ed McKinney with uh, Charlotte Department of Transportation. Appreciate the time tonight to give you an overview of the draft of our strategic mobility plan and talk a little bit about what the next steps are. I think Mayor Pro Tem probably gave us the structure and the, a good overview in the, in the update to the, to the TAP meeting. So I'll, many of the things I'll share to you tonight is just giving a little bit more detail about uh, that work and the progress. As a sort of a reminder, we started this work about a year ago. We've been following really closely and coordinating uh, tightly with the work that came from the adoption of the 2040 plan, the work that resulted in terms of the, um, the 2040 policy plan, and then has already been mentioned, some really, uh, really important connection to the Envision My Ride bus priority study. And so those things have uh, timed the work that we've been doing uh, in a certain way. This, this is really important for us at this point to come to you as we talk about how those two things work together. I will say, too, that a simple way to think about this is this is just simply our transportation plan. It's really a reflection, as, as Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, it's really a reflection of all of that work we've done recently, culmination of policies that we've had in place for some time, and really what we're doing is really modernizing and updating all of that work to completely align with the comprehensive plan. So it was, it was really important for us to then align those objectives to make sure that then the decisions we're making are, are really designed to achieve the goals and expectations of the, of the 2040 comprehensive plan. Key things to remember in summary, it's the, essentially what this is is a commitment and a, a sort of a recommitment and elevation of our, our work around Vision Zero. So you'll see that work highlighted in the, the kind of the strategy of this plan. We'll talk a little bit more about this, this new notion of establishing a 50-50 mode share. So that's kind of a new thing, and it, it sort of grew, again, from the comprehensive plan. But we put some more detail around that. Transit is a key part of this, and you'll see this embedded in the strategy. We've worked, as I mentioned, really closely with CATS. Uh, the notion of this bus priority uh, vision is really is really important framework for what we're trying to do. And you'll see a lot of the strategy in here is to, to really reflect uh, the way to implement that with CATS. And then ultimately, there's all sorts of things happening with emerging technology and, and sort of the new mobility that's happening in the, in the in sort of moving forward. And so what we're trying to do in this plan is make sure that we're prepared for that and really set up the policy framework for that. Let's see if I've got the... 
page down. That works better, <laughs> sorry. So we've seen this, the, the TAP committee has seen this many times, just to kind of share for full council, just the context of this. Again, the 2040 plan is the, is the kind of foundation for all this work. It's related, the strategic mobility plan is related to the policy map itself, and then as mentioned, the UDO. And as, as mentioned, there's two key parts of this. There's the policy piece that I'll focus on more tonight and then there's the, the streets manual, which is really a more sort of a more regulatory piece that relates more closely to the UDO. We've talked about that in more detail with the TAP committee, and that, that'll be in front of you through the process of the UDO's review, uh, public hearing, and adoption. As, as was mentioned, the draft of this was released on May 20th. We've got it um, essentially set up on, on our website and portal. We've been getting comments through um, uh, that online tool, as was mentioned, we've had several engagement sessions since the 20th to get, again, more feedback. And so that's continuing and we'll, we'll, we're taking comments and receiving lots of good comments and we'll, through, we'll, we'll take those through the, hearing, the, the public comment we get next um, week on the 13th and then ultimately use all that information to make any final adjustments and updates to the plan for adoption on the 27th. Again, for a reminder, it's again really important to, to be clear about this, is this. This plan is really pulling and building straight from the comprehensive plan. So one of the, the 10 goals from the comprehensive plan was this notion of safe and equitable mobility. So those words are specifically what's embedded in the plan. And what really what we're doing is trying to flesh that in more detail and really give it uh, enough structure so that the, the actions and the guides uh, and the policies that we're putting in place are designed to achieve that vision. And if I lost the ability now to move. Point toward either the computer or that. There we go. So the, the objectives, uh, and this, this will come up later tonight, so there's six objectives that go with this, again, embedded in the, uh, the comprehensive plan. What we've done in this plan is, is go take these beyond the words and get into the specifics of the actions and the policies. You'll see a great example of this later tonight, this notion of equitable um, and, and using that as a framework for the decisions we'll make. You'll see that reflected in the work on the traffic calming policy very specifically. So we've recognized already using this tool to say, look, there's things we're doing with this lens that we should refine and change to really meet the goals of this. So that gives you an example of that these aren't just words and they're not just embedded in a plan. We're really using them to be uh, thoughtful about the, you know, the things we need to be doing moving forward. The two big ideas around this, the, going back to that vision of safe and equitable, uh, safe on one side, equitable on the other with the mode share. I won't spend a lot of time on Vision Zero because we're all, I think we're familiar with that and we've been, you know, CDOT has been doing that work now for several years. We've certainly, this plan is a way to elevate and make sure that that is completely embedded in everything we do from a, from a mobility standpoint. So that's, it's, it's important that, that that work and that aspiration is, is embedded in, in everything we do. The notion that we can do lots of things and partner with many to make sure that our roads are reducing and eliminating both fatalities and serious injuries. The mode share, I'll talk about this in more detail, is a new thing for this. And again, as I'll mention, it's really about equity. At the end, you know, the first and foremost piece of this is really driven from a notion of equity. And so uh, there are essentially, uh, you know, a, a need for us to refocus how we move in the city to achieve the goals that we, we aspire to around equity. And the, this notion says uh, there are this too many in our community, particularly households that don't have access to a car or literally burdened by the cost of, of a vehicle in their household, that we can and should do more to, to accommodate and build an infrastructure that supports more affordable ways to move. And so the, this notion is let's focus and increase the, the investment, the partnerships, and all the work that we can do to increase other modes of moving besides just moving, moving by single occupancy vehicles. Our goal is around this notion of let's, let's do this 50-50. Can we increase our share? Today our share on, on vehicles is 76%. Is 
uh, with another 24 around all the other modes, work from home, carpool, transit, bike, and walk. Our goal is to, to essentially build capacity by finding a way to build those modes. Um, equity is the first part of that, and it also implies and is a great benefit and helps us meet uh, the goals we have around our strategic energy action plan, because certainly as we can reduce those vehicle trips, we're, we're having a direct impact on carbon emissions and all the goals we have around sustainability. The final thing I'll say around that is it's also just in some ways a practical thing. We've, we are at a point in the growth that we have and the speed and nature of the growth that we have uh, means that we are um, running out of the ability to, to, build, you know, to build the vehicular capacity around that growth. We just, the cost, the impact of that, and just the nature and speed of that growth suggests that we've got an infrastructure that we have to think about in different ways. We've got to conserve and continue to, to where we can increase that capacity, but the only way to really uh, protect for that infrastructure and the limitations around that infrastructure is to find as many ways and, and build as many ways as we can to move differently. You see on this slide, just to give you a context of where we are with some other peer cities, both where we are currently and uh, kind of what these other cities are doing in, in similar ways. So the notion of fast growing cities that are seeing the same challenges that we are seeing are doing similar things. They're, they're setting their same similar aspirations calibrated to their conditions uh, that, that is sh you know, shaping the, the policies and their actions. You can see where we are and you know, again, the question is can we get there? Um, I would say you can, you can see incrementally there are cities that we're not that far away from. I mean, uh, the notion that Denver's at 70% today with a goal of 50 in the long term, Minneapolis is a city that's at 60%. Certainly Seattle and Washington are different cities than we are, but, but all of that to say is with the right investment, with the right in focus, that this goal I think long term is achievable and it fo for focuses and uh, sort of uh, narrows our, 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 our objectives and the kind of the, the, the focus around the, the investment we want to make in a way that is worked to, to achieve that goal. How do we, the question really then is how do we get there? And so um, one thing I want to, we want to kind of sort of an, an idea we want to make sure is clear about how we're viewing this plan and our, our mobility future in, the, in going, going forward is it's really about a system. I've, we've stolen this graphic from CATS, actually, and it's a great example of really what we're trying to do. We're not, we're not just building infrastructure, we're really trying to build a system around how we live and how we move. And so uh, in some ways, what we're trying to do is create shorter trips. That's not necessarily an infrastructure thing, that's a planning and policy thing, a land use and development thing. And so the, the 2040 plan, the notion of 10 minute neighborhoods is building to that ability to put us together in a way that makes trips shorter. That, that, the, the outcome of that is it's easier to walk, it's easier to, to bike, it's easier to access transit. So we're, we're increasing the ability to do those other modes. And then it actually has a capacity benefit for us because shorter trips means less uh, absorption of the capacity of on our on our street network. So all of those things actually work together in a really dynamic way. We also need to be doing things around just getting less cars on the system. And again, that's not necessarily an infrastructure thing. That's focusing on transportation demand management and working with our partners in, act, in activity centers and our, our major employers to be doing everything we can, coupled with CATS, to do all the sort of uh, support we can around transit mobility and other, move, uh, other ways to move. And as a little plug here, you'll see, you know, one of the things we've talked about in our transportation review guidelines kind of embedded in our, in our streets manual, which is our new approach to how we review traffic mitigation. TDM is a big part of that, particularly around transit stations and in activity centers. So again, another specific example how it's not necessarily an infrastructure investment, it's a policy uh, goal that we can embed in the kinds of things we're doing from a regulatory standpoint to help get there. And then certainly up, ultimately it's about more multimodal trips and we need the infrastructure to make that happen. And so transit is a key and probably the most important part of that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail, but our bike network, our, our, our safety and pedestrian infrastructure, uh, the notion of complete streets, all the things that we've been doing, but done in a way that's really focused on ensuring we do that um, 
and move the needle in the most effective and, and, and important places. Real quick, um, just to give you a little bit of background on the process, so don't want to go into detail, but I do want to share with you the engagement that we had. So we started again back last year. We had a series of neighborhood sessions, listening sessions around geographies. This is just a snapshot of some of that input. Lots of very specific things really supporting uh, ultimately the, 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 the kind of intention and goals of these plans, ge very geographic specific. We've also, Continue to lose where I'm. Sorry, lost control here. There we go. I'll use that. Sorry about that. Um, we we also had an online map. Lots of detail that were a, folks were able to literally go pinpoint on a, on a map specific ideas, concerns, questions, and so again, not to, I don't the intent isn't to share these details, but just to show that there's lots of input that we got. Not just informing this plan. There's actually having this geographic specific information actually is something we will can use and will use moving forward to help us be specific about the projects um, that we're planning and be specific to the, the kind of um, uh, specific actions we'll take in any of these areas around projects. So all of that is great living information that builds to the plan but also supports our work long term. The strategy around this now is, so, so policy is one thing, guides kind of our decisions that we make around um, the actions we take you know, from investment. But ultimately, it was also important for this plan to describe kind of more strategically how we should begin to think about investing. And so we've broken that into sort of the basic four categories of, of how we move. So transit, pedestrian, bike, and our basic road network. And so what we've done in the plan is go into those in a little bit more detail to sort of frame out, again, how we prioritize so what the focus should be back to the goals of the comprehensive plan. On the, on the, just to give you a snapshot, a few of those. On the pedestrian network, as an example, again, things we've been talking before with you, obviously, around sidewalk gaps, all the investment we can be making and, and are making in pedestrian connections and crossings, everything we do in our street infrastructure to make it safer and more comfortable to move. What you see on these maps behind it with that kind of color system is essentially a geographic representation that if you took the goals, the six goals I've talked about and kind of the metrics around those, both from this plan and the comprehensive plan and said, how are we connecting better to jobs, uh, activity centers, transit, schools, the, the sort of the goals of the 10 minute neighborhood and, and analyze and map that. Essentially you get this heat map that's below that. And so that's just a reflection for you to see that what we will be doing moving forward is using specifically those objectives, tying specific metrics to them, and then helping us guide the prioritization of a range of projects. These are just a snapshot of several of them, uh, again, specific to things like sidewalk apps. The translation there, again, is the point there is th this need to make sure that our objectives are really tied closely to the actions and the recommendations we'd be making to, to council around where we should be investing. On the bike network, Again, the notion here is to prioritize our next focus of investment. And so, you know, a simple way to think about this is we have about 150 miles of bike facilities on our, in our system today. They're sort of connected in some ways, but still sort of, uh, you know, um, opportunistic and, and in some ways disconnected. So what we did in this plan was to look at with a priority structure, just like I described for the pedestrian system, you know, connections to, to population, employment, uh, access to transit, where we have households of, of uh, greater need, the network then we described is a network that tries to achieve those goals and connect as many of many people as we can to those, need, those um, destinations and services. And so that proposes another 170 miles of additional bike facilities that are connected. So what you, essentially what is behind this map is a, is a network of existing and proposed facilities that ultimately create a connection to all the sort of geographies of the city with a structure that, that connects them to uptown, to activity centers, and to the neighborhoods. 
Um, the green highlight you hear just is, is a, also a representation of a real important sort of um, spine or framework to this, the Cross Charlotte Trail is the obvious one to the north and south. But the notion of, a, of an east-west connection through to the eastern neighborhoods and the western neighborhoods, potentially with the Silver Line Rail Trail or, or other connectivity, was really a, another part of the focus of this plan to make sure that we've got kind of a structure that reaches uh, to all parts, north-south and east-west west through the city. On the roadway and streets framework, and so just to describe, again, some things around um, the focus and the priorities of those, you can think of them in sort of simple bus buckets, a uh, set of new streets, sets of complete streets, and then a, a notion that I think was begun to talk uh, with the council about this, this last budget cycle around places where we would focus on uh, mobility improvement corridors and kind of our high growth places. and so. On new streets, we're a growing city. In some cases, we're still a suburban, you know, a developing city. So there's still, as you can see on this map, lots of opportunities for new connections. Those are important for all sorts of reasons for connectivity, not just for vehicles, but for pedestrians, bike, et cetera, and transit. And so it's important that we con continue to invest in those things. Great example, again, is a project that we've certainly been talking about is the Bryant Farms Road in, this, in South Charlotte. Uh, that's an important connection that provides parallel connectivity in a place that needs more connectivity and access. And so a good example of that focus of, of creating new streets. On the complete streets side, we have lots of those. You can see on this map, we have a network of streets, many of which in some of our more suburban places are, are really just rural two-lane roads. And so as we know, as those places are growing, uh, the need to put in the right pedestrian infrastructure, the right um, uh, bike infrastructure and even just basic uh, road infrastructure is, is real critical. Robinson Church Road is, an, is a project example that you're familiar with, is an, a, a perfect uh, case study of that kind of investment. You can see it's a heavy lift. We've got lots to do throughout our city and it'll be really important that we prioritize that in a way to be most effective. And then again, just to put a point on this notion of this mobility improvement corridors and centers. So, it, it sort of, we, we all know the big challenge we have is the congestion and growth, particularly in some of our you know, rapidly growing corridors and activity centers. And so what we've begun to define here is certainly we know where those are, uh, particularly around corridors and activity centers. And really the strategy is around not just the basic capacity infrastructure, but we have to look at those places holistically. We have to understand the growth and development pattern. Uh, overlaid on this is the bus priority network. Uh, and the focus for cats and transit. Certainly there's specific things that we would come from this. A great example, again, on our horizon is the Eastway Shamrock intersection. So there's very specific things that would come. Uh, but the notion is we should be looking at these things from a corridor level, from an activity center, to be sort of holistic about how we want to manage the growth and investment within the, the resources that we have to, uh, to affect change and, and increase access and mobility. I end with this, the transit is really the fundamental piece of this. I don't, I'm not gonna to talk tonight about the 2030 system plan with essentially the rail structure, you know, blue line obviously and silver line goes, it's embedded in our plan and certainly there's lots of things we're doing to support infrastructure to those. But as was already mentioned, one of the things we did throughout this plan working really closely with CATS is to follow and embed the strategy around the Envision My Ride work and the, this notion of a bus priority network. So you see on one side of this, the full vision of that plan. So all the corridors with the ultimately the goal of a 15 minute service, the notion of mobility hubs and the kind of colored areas and there are those, those micro transit areas, that's the long term vision. What you see on the other side on the focus corridors are really the six key corridors that CATS is focused on to not only increase uh, the service and frequency, but to do all the things we can within our right-of-ways uh, to make that, that operation of the bus system efficient and comfortable and effective. And so the real key part of that is uh, almost all of that relates directly to what we do with CDOT. So that's almost all those things are in the right-of-way. So it's, it was really important for us in this plan to, to make sure that was clear and it was a clear and specific priority for CDOT to say, we're gonna to have to work hand in hand with CATS to really rethink the nature of those streets on those six corridors. So 
bus, you know, we've talked about priority signal, um, you know, having bus priority signal investment, which is there. It's just making sure we make that effective and workable. The notion of queue jumps, which would be things that we would uh, have to invest in in some of our intersections, uh, better pedestrian crossings, the notion of mobility hubs, which are really sort of stations in these areas, are all within the right of way and affect how we design and operate streets. So the, the message here is that's to make that work is not just providing the frequency of service from CAT standpoint. We really have to rethink those streets and those corridors. And a key part of that strategy for us is to work hand in hand with CATs to make that happen. So let me wrap up with this and then talk about next steps. Um, on one side of this, I'm showing you something you already know well. So this is just a snapshot of, of your recently approved budget. And I've highlighted here some of the key things around these other modes, the notion of our bicycle program, our sidewalk program, and our Vision Zero program. As you, again, you certainly know, your commitment to that has increased dramatically recently, in this case, over 54 million of new investment uh, based on what you've historically uh, focused on in those capital investment bonds. What, I'm, what I want to illustrate here is all of the kind of abstractness of the policy, the strategy, all these, all these words and kind of the structure of that is important because essentially what that does, having this plan adopted and the kind of key strategies and priorities around that plan allows us to take the investment that you've committed to and, and invest in a way that's most effective. And so we're at a really important time, right? We're making this shift. We're investing ever more in these kinds of facilities and this kind of mobility. This plan allows us to take all that, tie it to our comprehensive plan, give us enough detail and priorities so that we can, again, invest those dollars in a way that has the greatest impact and gets us to uh, what we have envisioned from a mobility standpoint in the long term. Last thing, just about next steps. So, didn't talk at all about this tonight, but we've talked a little bit um, with the TAP committee, and you'll, again, see more about this with the UDO process. But there is this streets manual, which is a technical thing that's really on the regulatory side. It's got the embedded in that manual is the draft of the comprehensive transportation review guidelines. Again, that's the, the update to how we deal with traffic mitigation and development. And then the streets map, which is sort of the DNA of all of our streets. Again, as development occurs, we're using that map to make sure that we're protecting for uh, the right of way and the corridors that we want to uh, create as multimodal streets in the long term. And then just to, really to, the key point of this tonight is, our, is the plan we just talked about and the, the policy piece of this, which is the, the strategic mobility plan. Again, the notion, again, the aspiration around that, the mode share, the policy around those six goals, and then the strategy around those four areas, that's what's embedded in this plan. Where we are tonight, obviously, is an uh, overview for you all in, in this session. Uh, as already mentioned by Mayor Pro Tem, next Monday we'll have the TAP committee meeting. We'll go into a little bit more detail, have more discussion. That same night we'll have a uh, public comment period, so that'll be an opportunity for uh, additional kind of focus comment directly to you and council, and then uh, we're, we're uh, ultimately um, scheduled to be in front of you on the 27th for adoption of the plan uh, following essentially any comments we get and some changes that we would make. Uh, we'll, we'll share with you sort of the final version of that plan with, with, the, with the goal of adopting that on June 27th. I think that's it. I ran through it a little quick. I know you've got lots on your agenda tonight, so glad to um, take questions and, and open it up for discussion. Well, you, you, do have, you do have people that want to have questions or discussions. So we'll start with Mr. Driggs, followed by Ms. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how this ties into the UDO. Are, are there requirements that will be placed on private developers or investors as a result of the strategic mobility plan that are not included in the UDO? So the, yes, what, there's two pieces of, I put the slide back up of this, what we're calling the streets manual, and that is a completely separate document. And it, it does, uh, Mr. Driggs, do what you're just describing. It's a set of guidelines that is tied directly to the UDO, and it's specific to 
really two key new things, which is the, this comprehensive transportation review guidelines, which is the update of our traffic mitigation guidelines that we currently use today. Um, and it's the, the update and kind of completeness of the streets map. And so there's, uh, those two things are new and they're embedded in these guidelines. And what the UDO does is refer to the manual uh, to follow uh, both the, the mitigation review of the, of the um, development projects and then the streets map, again, will specifically say what's, what's the protection of right of way and that guides you know, specific dimensional requirements and setbacks that you would have depending upon which zoning district you're in. But again, to be clear, the policy map, the specific thing we were asking for adoption on the 27th is completely separate from that. It's really all the policy uh, items that I've just described. The detail of the manual is following uh, exactly the UDO process. So there was a second draft of this manual. There was a first draft of this manual that went out in the fall at the same time the first draft of the UDO went out. The second draft of this manual came out with the second draft of the UDO on Friday. And then we'll follow the kind of review, hearing, and adoption process of the Unified Development Ordinance. So uh, I'm just asking because uh, we, we, we're doing economic impact work on the UDO. Does that include the requirements here? Are, are we thinking about this? Because some of those things like that picture, um, th th that's expensive, right? I mean, creating a road like that in a place where we have the roads like the ones we have today. Um, and I can point to railroad, for example, we did an improvement there, as you remember from uh, Pineville Matthews up the colony. And I think at the time that cost about $20 million for a mile or so uh, to take an existing road and, and turn it into something that looks more like this. So um, I do think it's important that we are sensitive to what the burden might be that these things represent or how they could affect uh, uh, development. And uh, we, we can follow up on that, but I, I would really be interested to know whether we have any feedback from industry or uh, another basis for knowing how much of a burden uh, trying to impose rules around this plan. I mean, the plan I think is very aspirational and it, it paints a great picture of where we would like to be in the future. But in, as a practical matter, we need to think about uh, who bears these costs and the impact that it has on development. And the other question I had was, um, you, you pointed to the CIP investments that we're making in our current budget. Have we thought about what kind of CIP investments will be needed in order to realize the goals of the strategic mobility plan and over what time horizon? Sure, let me, let me go back to your first question because I wanna make sure that's clear. The, the manual, the, the, these guidelines, the CTR guidelines and the streets map, all of that work was completely embedded in the economic impact analysis that the planning department has, has done and the work that the committee has seen. So I wanna make sure that's clear. And we've had um, uh, at the same, essentially the same number of engagement and, and coordination that planning has had on the UDO around these development issues. We've been with them hand in hand to talk very specifically about the guidelines, these, these CTR guidelines and the streets map. So uh, I wanna be clear that that engagement has occurred, whether or not we're all in agreement about, you know, from a stakeholder standpoint about where we're going is another thing, but I wanna make sure it's clear that that engagement has occurred and the analysis on the economic side uh, has been part of this. Um, and, and again, back to, the, to this image on that, on that slide and the notion of what we're asking developers to do, it's, we're asking what's happening project by project. We're just making the streets map, just make sure that they're setting their development, they're, they're really protecting the right of way uh, so that the long-term investment we make in the streets are is available to us. Essentially, we're setting up the framework. Yes, they'll have to do their you know their frontage of sidewalk uh, and connect to the street in the right way. But we're not we're certainly not, certainly not asking them to build the full road. It's really just their their uh, proportional impact on the on the site that they're developing. On the question about the uh, capital investment, so. Uh, you know, a couple things there. As I mentioned then that, that um, this slide, the, you know, the notion is uh, what we want to do is make sure that the, this plan gives us the right framework to follow the goals and vision that council has adopted, right, in the, in the 2040 plan. And so 
the most important part of that is to make sure that in these cases, the way we develop projects, the way we identify them, the way we evaluate and prioritize them follows this vision. And so that every dollar, again, every dollar we spend is done in a way that's designed to achieve those goals. Longer term, so that this aspiration sets a 20 year aspiration. Uh, the, the expectation here is that we will continue to sort of you know, monitor and, and define how we're, just like the comp plan, how are we achieving those goals? Are we getting there? Uh, do we need to think about investment in different ways? Uh, do we need to focus in different ways? So is there a dollar amount to this plan, a uh, total dollar amount? No. Uh, the notion is this is an aspiration. We're using the goals and objectives of this plan to calibrate and focus the dollars that we use, the resources that we have, uh, to ultimately get to that vision. Again, contingent on lots of partners. It's not just about what the city invests. It's you know all the development partners that we have, other mobility partners, both locally and regionally. And certainly, as we we, we all know, you know the investment in transit, uh, short and long term, is going to be a big part of, of getting to the to the goals that we have. Uh, thanks, Ed. A lot of the feedback I've seen from the developer community has been kind of site-specific and heights and things like that. So uh, I will follow up with them, and uh, I appreciate the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. Ms. Johnson? Thank you, Mayor. Um, my question, I'm sort of piggybacking off of Mr. Driggs. I want to know the dates. So th this was released on May 20th, and we are voting on it when and the and how does it relate to the udo dates so the second draft of the udo was released i think today or friday and i don't i don't think the dates are the same yeah. and, and well in from yeah. a community engagement perspective i, I want to know how realistic is that for us it's sort of confusing for the public if we're really seeking engagement. I'm just wondering, and this is probably a question for Mr. Uh, Jones, why the, the timing? If we're seeking uh, comments from the public, are we giving them too much information? Should we, and we talked about this with the comp plan, a more simpler presentation and a more uh, a different version, why are we releasing them like this? Should we wait and get co comments and um, on the on one document and then release the second one and then I have another question also I mean is there a reason for the timing uh, yes yes so and Ed you know clean this up for me if I so I guess what's being missed a bit is that there's community engagement all along these processes many of the um, plans that are related to the strategic mobility plan you already have. We're just trying to pull them all into one place. And did I get that right, Ed? Okay. Yep. So it's in what we attempt to do is send these through committee so that there's a conversation with at least five council members at the committee to get to this point that the entire council can have the discussion. So in terms of process, I don't want you to think that we just presented something tonight and we're going to ask you to vote on it. In a couple of weeks. I, I'm just saying from a public perspective, I know that these are great documents, but for a, a busy, you know, voter, if we would just, or even if they were due on this, you, you know, just right after one another, I just think that we could increase engagement, I think, if we didn't have two different, almost competing documents. That's just my perspective. If we, if we presented them from a public engagement perspective, one document at a time. Right now we have the UDO that we're seeking comment and, you know, research and you know, review of, of, and then we also have this document. And are we really expecting um, the public to review, you know, two of these documents to give us feedback? So that's just, just my opinion as a uh, former uh, trainer uh, for adult learners and just I just think from a and I remember even with the comp plan we we know that we had low engagement and low numbers I think if our goal is engagement and to increase engagement I think from a public perspective it's more realistic for us to present these um, separately 
And then secondly, I have a question. If you could go back to the corridors, um, there were six corridors that were a priority. The focus corridors, I don't see any in District 4. And we have a, a very, very large university that we might consider uh, students who might uh, bike. We're also the second largest job creator in the city. And we have the, 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 the blue line. It would seem to be a low hanging fruit or an e easier resolution to add more circular routes. And then, you know, District 4 would be kind of just, you know, have a, that would have a huge impact. It would have an impact on traffic. It, um, and, and the jobs, I, I'm just surprised and concerned that District 4 was, is not a part of the focus corridor with, again, with such a large university and, um, and, and a large employment um, number. I'll speak, I can speak to that briefly, and, and uh, Jason Lawrence is here with CATS, who's been leading the, the bus priority study, can, can amplify any of this. But as you see these two maps, on the one side is the full uh, bus priority plan. It may be hard to read on this map, but the darker blue lines are, is that full network of high frequency, 15 minute service. You see the, the mobility hubs in those colored areas are those, this area, I think you sort of mentioned the notion that there's areas in, in University City that would benefit from this notion of first, last mile, the micro transit areas. That's that's what those kind of blue areas represent. So, it's it is part of completely part of the even the initial strategy that Cats has around improving improving service, implementing the micro transit um, investment and, and partnerships and these mobility hubs. I'll speak for JL a little bit, but the notion of these focus corridors are really the, where's the first place to start? Where would we have the most impact on where ridership is and where, where really the needs are. Uh, but it does, not, it does not imply that we're not in that full plan doing similar investment uh, throughout all of the city. And if I said any of that wrong or if there's other things you want to add to that, Jason? Yeah, th thank you, Ms. Johnson. Jason Lawrence with CATS here. And I think what is you know what Ed has shown is you know the highlights of the Envision My Ride bus priority study, the full document, the full map, and everything is is a part of the bus priority study, which was uh, recently adopted by Metropolitan Transit Commission on May 25th uh, of this year. And you know we do have a number of crosstown routes that are part of the effort. Harris Boulevard, to name one, connecting the University area over to North Lake. Uh, we have another high frequency route along Sugar Creek Road to connect the Dorada area over to the blue line. And you did mention the blue line. That's a critical connection as a high frequency, you know, high investment corridor. And one of the first zones that we would prioritize as a part of the microtransit conversation would be the university area connecting the, UN, the campus over to the research park area with the blue line really running right in the middle of that. So there's a lot of strategies in place here with the blue line that would really help with that first last mile connections. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that consideration. And then, and then I do have one more question. So from a transportation perspective and an equity perspective, right now, STS, Special Transportation Services, does not run where there's not a bus route. If you don't live within, I think, a half a mile or quarter mile of a bus, the STS does not come to your home. So that affects a lot of people. They're not able to get STS um, because there's no bus route. And I just want to know if that's a part of the strategic mobility plan to reconsider that or um, review that from an equitable perspective. So I'll talk a minute about what, you know, our current policy for paratransit service, special transportation services, is we provide on-demand service within three quarters of a mile of what we call a fixed route. And so that's a sizable portion of the city of Charlotte. If there's an area of the city that doesn't have a fixed route, paratransit service is not provided as per our Americans with Disability Act policy. In the northern towns, we do provide what's called village rider services, which does provide that three-quarter mile uh, paratransit um, enable service. Right. So is there that going to be changed? There are people that are unable to have access to STS because there's not a bus route in their area. So I don't, is, is that something that's going to be reconsidered or 
Yeah, p paratransit was not a part of the bus priority uh, study and wasn't, you know, they're in a part of the strategic mobility plan, but uh, we can talk maybe a little bit more offline about our paratransit services. Happy to come talk about that at some other time. Absolutely. Thank and you. the system is really about we don't have the money to grow the system. And until we get some money, we can't provide these services and they're desperately needed. It's that really is, sad. That it's really sad for us mm -hmm. to say that in a meeting where we, we talked about 60 million and 200 million for other, you know, issues. And then when there are folks trying to get to work or pair transportation, then we say we don't have the money. But Ms. So Johnson, that's, that's I mean, Ms. I, Johnson, it may be a careful. very difficult thing to say when you have things that you go to the state and you say this money can be used only for this purpose. So it's not like we could take that 60 million dollars and move it over when it's coming out of a state legislature. We need state legislation to help us do things that are about the equity and the needs that we have for our community as well. So it's really tough. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just very hard, very hard. So. But here, transportation, you say we don't have the money. I mean, that's, I just think we need to really take a look. Well, we could do it with property taxes, which would then do more displacement. But right now, we only have the half cent sales tax for the transit system. It's really, I, I, it's a huge dilemma for us. And, and we can talk offline, but for the public, we just passed a $3.2 billion budget. And then to say today that we don't have the money for individuals who, who need special transportation to, to, to have transportation services. I mean, that's, it's a matter, in my opinion, of just focus and priority. And, and I think, I, I don't disagree with you at all, but when you look at that $3 billion budget, only 700,000 of it goes into general services that we provide for everyone, and transit only has a half cent dedicated tax. So add up all of the specific revenues and what's a lawful use of it and how we've planned, and you're on the committee that really is trying to help us change the way that we approach this. So I think it's a great thing, but I think it's honesty to say that we need to have some money to do things that do things differently. I just really struggle with it, too. So, Mayor Pro Tem? Well, I just also want to point out for the public that when you, you talk about the 60 million, that's capital, that's one-time expenditures, mm -hmm. versus I think the number that I got even two years ago from John Lewis was 35 million a year in operating to build out our bus system and then 100 million in capital. So we, you know, those one-time expenses we can't apply. We, it's apples and oranges because we have to keep it going every year for operating. Okay, so I think I have Mr. Eggleston next. Um, briefly, I, I think that we used to talk a lot about the North End Smart District. I don't feel like we talk about that much anymore and I don't know why that is, but I do think that as it relates to micro transit areas that the what we used to call them I would love for us to still call the North End Smart District would be a wise strategic place to have uh, shaded on our map for micro transit given its proximity to the blue line but the impediments that residents of the North End face getting to the blue line because of primarily the rail yard um, so I won't belabor my point but uh, mm -hmm. I do think that that might be a miss on that microtransit map. Thank you. I second that. Yes, I think we need to a lot more about that. Mr. Winston? Thank you. I, I agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Eggleston's point. Um, uh, I've been going through this um, study and uh, this plan, and um, I'm, I'm pretty well aligned with, with a lot of it. I'm still kind of digging through the details. There's just a couple of points. Uh, I, I do think um, language is very important um, 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 in plans like this. Um, when we're looking at how Charlotte moves um, today versus tomorrow, um, I, I, would, I would question um, whether it is, 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 is genuine or not um, that uh, the goal, our goal should be uh, alleviating congestion. Um, I, I, would, I would posit that actually in some circumstances we want increased um, congestion, particularly in different modes like 
uh, pedestrian con congestion um, um, in parts of town, um, as well as bike congestion. We want more people um, to be walking um, and, and, and riding bikes um, um, in certain areas. Um, we also know um, uh, that 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 type of um, behavior or circumstance uh, uh, equates to um, um, uh, uh, levels of economic development in, in certain areas. Uh, I do think um, uh, there are prop there are instances of problematic congestion around town, um, but, but I would wonder if it might be more accurate um, if uh, and, and a more achievable goal over time um, if this plan uh, 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 this plan seeked um, to provide certainty in travel times, travel or commute times, right? Um, you know, thinking of um, certain parts of town during peak hours, you're always going to have congestion. The problem is when that congestion leads to, to half an hour um, commutes on some days uh, versus hour and a half commutes on other days. Um, uh, leading uh, to, to that, um, you know, as we look at some of the, the, the policies around safety, um, I think traffic calming should be a higher priority um, as, you know, that is, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I think um, uh, the North Star, um, as you look at pedestrian cross crossing, street and pedestrian lighting, intersection de designs, uh, so on and, and so forth. Um, you know, again, if in certain areas where you you have high pedestrian um, or or a, a lot of residential um, 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 uh, places, um, you probably don't want um, traffic moving very fast. Um, uh, you you might want a bit of a more congested street where um, you do have car parking and and, and bike lanes and and and. Um, um, cars moving at a slower pace, um, um, but again, at a more certain pace, um, both during peak and on in off-peak um, uh, hours. Um, and again, um, um, street speed mitigation. Um, I, I would think that we may want to look beyond just high injury networks uh, that we have today. Uh, again, uh, kind of uh, the philosophy of, of keeping um, uh, uh, speeds low uh, in in areas where um, people live, uh, people work, um, and people play in general. Um, also, considering that there are stretches of roads, um, particularly roads, um, um, as opposed to streets, uh, that where we where we want high speeds. You know, um, we don't want congestion necessarily on 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 uh, the interstates. Um, uh, but I think that also relates to, again, how streets and roads um, interact with each other. So I don't know if we, we've thought about it, it like that, Mr. McKinney, um, 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 but, but I'd like to us, again, to pay um, pretty close attention uh, to that language. Yeah, just real briefly, you're, you're absolutely correct, and it's, it's a good catch to make sure that we're saying it the right way in this plan, but I, I, our intent is to say it the way you described it, so we'll make sure we're being clear about that. I went back to this map, back to this notion of these mobility improvement corridors, and that really, the, what you described is really the vision around those. Like we, you're, you're right, we, one of the things we should be doing is really just trying to manage those corridors in ways that create predictability, right, and, and balance the modes that we're trying to promote, uh, but do it in a way that um, doesn't put a priority, right, on, on speed of vehicles, but does it in a way that's balanced. But also to your point, and as we have identified in some of our more suburban places and growing places, Steel Creek is a great example where there still are opportunities and infrastructure that can be put in place and should be put in place to uh, essentially facilitate the basic infrastructure of road and street connectivity. So, you know, our challenge is to kind of balance given the, you know, the diversity of our city from really urban places to, to places that are really just greenfield and still growing. The challenge is to kind of put all of those things in balance where some places we do have to be invested directly in our road and infrastructure and other places we're really managing congestion in a different way. And so 
you know, our, our ultimate goal is to do that in a way that's balanced and, and achieves our aspirations in the long term. Yeah, so I, I just reiterate, you know, I, I would, I would um, certainly uh, like us to consider, um, I think pay, on page 14 on, on how Charlotte moves and the overall goals here, um, I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would like us to consider moving away um, from saying that we are um, trying to eliminate um, congestion um, um, versus create certainty in travel and commute times. Um, I, I think that is, is, is more accurate um, to what we are trying to achieve. Um, but, you know, um, I, don't, I don't want that to be an anecdotal thing. Um, I, perhaps this is, again, I, I, I think that's going to be an important um, point, not just for this council not getting it passed, but as this is going to be a document that lives um, and guides policy um, um, over the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, good, good, again, great, great uh, uh, catch on that. We'll make sure that we're clear about what that, what we're really intending to do. All right, Mr. Phipps. Mr. Phipps. It used to be, yeah, it used to be that uh, we placed a lower priority on farm to market roads, but with the growth that's occurring on some of those roads, like Hood Road, where you have new subdivisions on both sides of the street. Sidewalks are in place, curb and gutter is there. So are we saying then that this growth will force us to take a more proactive stance with the development of farm to market roads, whether or not they're city maintained or state maintained? So, so to your first point, and that the map here on the screen in the middle is, is sort of the diagram of those, um, uh, those roads that still need sort of what we would describe as being complete. And not all of those are pure farm to market roads, as you can see, some of those are in our more urban areas, but many of them, like the example that's highlighted there, Robinson Church Road is a great example of what you're describing as a farm to market road. And so, Yes, the answer to your question is, you know, in this plan, it's important that we identify that need, which is sort of this diagram, and then again, use the goals and, and structure of the policies from our comp plan and this plan to prioritize where we should do that investment and growth. You know, the pace of growth, as you described, there's places that are growing faster than others, and the needs there are probably more immediate. And so, uh, part of our steps to identifying, developing those projects and prioritizing them is looking at those metrics. Where is growth happening? Where, where are the needs to provide that connectivity? And will you know, ultimately be the way that we ensure that we uh, prioritize those projects, knowing that we have a limited set of resources. As you can see, even by this map, we have, a, just like we've talked about with sidewalks and others, there's, we have lots of needs. The real the real key and really what, I, what we hope is this plan helps us focus the priorities. We've, we've got, we have limited resources and the real important part now is to make sure every dollar we invest has to be going towards our longer term goals. And so we need to make sure that we're, we're really doing that in a very intentional way. Yeah, Robinson Church Road intersects Hood Road. <laughs> And there are a lot of sidewalks, but I can tell you, you can walk for a half an hour on those sidewalks and you still wouldn't get to nothing resembling any amenities that we would associate with a 10 minute neighborhood. So that's a lot of sidewalks, but other than trees and things, there's, there's nothing there. There's no amenities there. So, and that's what some residents have been complaining about that, uh, they need amenities, but um, right now you can do a lot of walking and uh, at some point you're still going to have to get in your car to get uh, some of the services that you want. And I think by design, some people probably, you know, that's what they bargained for when they walked out there. But I think the growth is forcing us to be have to... Uh, and we're going to have to, I don't know how, we, I don't know if we can afford to have uh, uh, one or two 
streets at a time and a budget and a capital cycle, but uh, it's going to take a long time. Now, I think these areas that are still developing and still have, have large swaths of land, uh, uh, they could be at a disadvantage to some of these interior areas in the city, along with these corridors of opportunities. I mean, they, 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 they got infrastructure there. So, uh, you know, it's just going to take, I guess that's why, you know, it's a 2040 plan. Hey? So I, I guess it's just going to take some time. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Ajmira? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Great presentation, uh, Mr. McKinney, and um, <clears throat> really good document that's been that's been uh, provided to all of us. Uh, I had an opportunity to review the document in depth, uh, and I see there are various plans in place in terms of the sidewalks, uh, pedestrian crossings, um, and uh, other mobility options. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that once we adopt this, we will still uh, have the flexibility of making changes to the plan. Is that correct? Yeah, the way I would describe it is that really the most important part of this plan is really the policy structure and these objectives and the way they guide the decisions we'll make moving forward. So, you know, going back to... Uh, this notion of the capital dollars that we commit, what we want to do is make sure that we use this plan to align to those goals. It's sort of project agnostic, right? We, we need to make sure that the goals are driving our decisions around investment. So to the question of are we, we're not hardwiring hard, hard specific projects in this plan, what we're laying out is the uh, the framework of the opportunities and, and, and needs that we have and setting some clear objectives about how we're going to prioritize those needs. So hopefully that when we come back to council with recommendations about what are our next projects, we can demonstrate to you how those projects you know, are achieving the goals of this plan and the, and the 2040 plan. Fair, fair enough. So what I hear you say, as long as we are... Uh, I hear you say that the projects could change, however, the goals. It's really what we are adopting. Is that correct? Absolutely correct, yes. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure because to Mr. Fifth's point, you know, there are, I'm going through this, uh, as I was going through this over the weekend, I had highlighted a few things, a few projects that's, um, that's part of this uh, package. And, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to get a better understanding of how these priority networks were determined, specifically around sidewalks, pedestrian crossings, intersections, signal upgrades. How were they prioritized? Um, could you respond to that? Sure. I, I just went back to that slide. So. Again, what you see on these maps are the existing sort of needs and identified projects. So the sidewalk one is probably the easiest one to describe. I mean, you've seen, you've seen that map before, and it was part of the discussions we've had around the budget this year. So those, those red lines just represent all the gaps that we have, right? The color, the sort of color behind that is really a, a geographic reflection of the priorities, not dramatically different than the way we've been prioritizing those sidewalks. So the, you know, the projects that we've put forth and have prioritized for investment had followed a set of you know, expectations around equity and, and connectivity, et cetera. What we've done in this plan, though, is just sort of modernize that. We wanted to make sure that it was completely tied to the goals and objectives of the 2040 plan. And so what you see represented here in these colors is really just a sort of an analytical way to take those goals, apply them geographically, and say, okay, where are the places where uh, we would meet our goals the most by investing in these projects? And so it's not, it's not prioritizing any individual ones. It's just sort of a demonstration of how uh, we will come back and prioritize you know, specific projects, in this case, for programmatic dollars, we're just using that prioritization to tell us where to go first and where to, again, most effectively use the sidewalk program dollars as we move forward. 
So I think this is where the equity policy could play an important part, because as you look at the needs document, you know, on page number 43 to 46, uh, there are various um, various parts of our community where really there is no, there are no sidewalks and uh, just really no infrastructure for pedestrian safety, um, where there are unsafe crossings. And um, obviously as we dig deeper into this, we will have to look at this from the equity lens where there are areas where we must prioritize sidewalks specifically around schools uh, so that uh, the kids are not having to walk to school in an unsafe uh, environment. And, uh, and I think that's where I would like to dig deeper as to how do we prioritize some of this um, infrastructure specifically around um, uh, schools and areas where we need very safe infrastructure. Um, and um, lastly, I see that mobility improvement centers and corridors uh, on towards the towards the end of this uh, booklet that was that was part of our package. How how did uh, staff come to this uh, conclusion of having this? about 10 mobility improvement corridors and centers. Real quick, it's a combination of things. So what you see on that map is a reflection of the bus priority work. So you know, we definitely want to make sure that we were focused on those corridors and working with CATS. Uh, these are also corridors that we've been and have been having lots of discussions and, and know the data in terms of where there's congestion and where there's growth happening. So again, not the notion that we want to solve that congestion, but those are the places we need to go to start thinking about how we manage it. And then essentially what's represented on that map on activity centers is not all of them. It's just sort of a representation of some of the, the larger ones. It's, this will be connected and is connected directly to the 2040 policy map. And so there are lots of potential longer term uh, activity centers that are, are designed in the policy map. So that really this, this diagram is to sort of set the stage that we need to be focused in those areas as they continue to grow, both the large existing ones and then as you know, the 10 minute neighborhood and these new activity centers begin to develop, uh, having specific mobility strategies around them will be important. So it's great that we are looking at uh, the growth and identifying opportunities ahead of time before some of these developments occur, especially around River District. I see that's being highlighted. Uh, but we also got to ensure there are areas like, for example, Far East. I was looking at the needs um, of feedback from our residents where we really have a lack of even public transit. And I know that's been their feedback along the way. And I don't see that as being highlighted. So uh, if you could also look into that to see uh, how we could prioritize some of those gaps while also addressing the growth areas. And um, I mean, this is great to have a plan, but really, um, rubber funding is where the rubber meets the road. Um, so I hope that uh, council will continue to tackle the funding issue. That's when we will really get this plan to come to our uh, realization. Thank you. All right, so thank you everyone. Our next item on the agenda is- I said. Yes, Mr. Bakari, sorry. Uh, yeah, um, I'll try to be really quick. One, I just I think that there are inherent flaws in this that are the same as the 2040 plan it aligns to, which, you know, we're we're basically looking at a streamlined plan to be able to back us into the status quo of where the world exists today in relation to land use and planning or in relation to, to mobility and, and moving people around when this is meant to be a, a long-term strategy. And we really don't contemplate what what the, our city and the world is gonna be like in 2040 and 2050. We're talking about all the same technologies that we've been trying to fund for 15 years right here. 
So I, I just, I won't belabor the point because I've said it enough over the last two years, but like, where's the future planning? If this is the stuff we're going to be moving to where the puck's going to be then, I don't even see like one inkling of a lot of that stuff in there. But I think my broader, more tactical point is, because it's too late now but for us to backtrack and actually solve that, is I've just seen, particularly over the last couple of weeks, a constant reminder that cats is in the critical path of so many things right now and whether it's you know our buses that current state aren't running properly and on time and ghost buses our drivers who are ultimately having uh, uh, safety concerns the inter intersection with the ctc as we've seen here uh, the the gold line um, the future light rail plans and now the deep correlation with the strategic mobility plan, not just in their execution and where they're going to go, but in the, the framing, as we've just heard, I'm getting close to a point where until we solve the leadership issues that foundationally have cats not sitting on solid ground to just start voting against anything that is in the that is strategic and has a touch point there until we get that solved. Uh, again, I'm, I, that is a drastic effort that I don't want to take right now, Mr. Manager, but I would encourage my colleagues for us all to start pushing on getting some solutions there because we have, we have a track record of whatever the opposite of success is going on right there right now with, from a leadership perspective, and these stakes are far too high in every single topic we're, we're, we're going after right now to just to sit back and say, okay, well, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that later because it's a painful conversation. All right, thank you. Our next item on the agenda is neighborhood traffic calming policy. Debbie. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, as the presentation is coming up, let me introduce myself. I serve as your transportation director, uh, Debbie Smith, and I'm here uh, with Tamara Blue, our outstanding CDOT public relations manager. And I know many of you have worked with her closely over the years. Uh, so, so excited to have her with me tonight uh, to walk us through. So we're here and we're excited to bring forward this policy for discussion. Next slide, please. Let me make this connection between the work and the information that Ed McKinney just shared with you on strategic mobility plan. So achieving a safe and equitable transportation network are two foundational goals. And we have an opportunity with this direct link to our current policy. So we have this opportunity to put the strategy into direct action. So neighborhood traffic calming is absolutely a part of our Vision Zero commitment to make our Charlotte Street safer. And as a reminder, Vision Zero is this strategy to eliminate all traffic-related deaths and serious injuries while increasing safety, health, and mobility for all users. And many of you, I've worked with you on that Vision Zero statement, on that Vision Zero conversation back in 2018. So with that, Vision Zero focuses on how people naturally behave and that people can make mistakes, but that those mistakes should not be fatal. We use data to develop the high injury network, which are those streets that have that higher occurrence of fatal and serious injury crashes. And the data really shows that serious injury crashes and fatalities are happening on the higher speed and higher volume thoroughfares. So we have traffic calming tools though for these local streets because we're committed to that safety on the local streets so that they don't end up on that high injury network. So the neighborhood traffic calming policy is at its core neighborhood driven and it is by far one of our most popular transportation programs. And I wanna just take a moment to thank our great partners at Police and Fire. We could not do this policy work without them. They work with us so closely as we're establishing these changes. So tonight's presentation, we really focus on how neighborhood traffic calming is um, foundational to this 
equitable conversation. And so we know that the current policy requires home ownership to create a sec successful petition. And so we believe the changes we are making here tonight and recommending will really remove that barrier in a successful, in a successful policy. So, like I said, let me turn it over to Tamara Blue. She's going to actually walk through the strategic uh, developments as we had this conversation with our Safe Community Committee. Tamara, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Um, as she said, I'm Tamara Blue with CDOT, PR manager. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. We're here to step you through the existing neighborhood traffic calming policy, discuss the petition process, and review recommended changes after presenting at the Safe Communities Committee meetings on May 1st and April 13th this year. Many neighborhoods and several council members have approached us with concerns about the petition process. I'll describe our current process and share with you what we learned through some peer cities research. Next slide. The neighborhood traffic calming program is very successful and hugely popular with our citizens. The first policy was adopted in 1997, and over the last 25 years, councils before you made a couple of revisions to reduce thresholds to support more traffic calming in neighborhoods. The most recent update was in 2018, which removed the petition process for reducing the speed limit to 25 miles per hour, lowered the volume threshold for speed humps from 1,000 vehicles per day to 600, and lowered the volume threshold for multi-way stops from 600 vehicles per day on the main street to a combination of both the main and intersecting streets, so it lowered that volume by half. We did this in 2018. We worked closely with the fire department to strike that right balance and, and comply with the 2015 International Fire Code that the state of North Carolina adopted in January 2019 as the North Carolina State Fire Code. Another important update changed the number of parcel owner signatures required on a petition from all owners of record to only one. This was an important step in removing a cumbersome piece of the process where there were two or more owners of record for one address. Today, we're recommending removal of the petition process. Next slide, please. The neighborhood traffic calming policy covers three main areas. Speed limit reduction, speed humps, and multi-way stops. There is a petition currently required for speed humps and multi-way stops. Both traffic volumes are 600 vehicles per day, 600 for speed humps, and a combination of 600 for the intersecting streets for multi-way stops. The 85th percentile speed is, has to be equal to or less than five miles per hour over the speed limit for both of those conditions, and the impact area abutting those parcels within 1,200 feet would need to um, be part of the petition signatures, and I believe that's a, a 60 percent um, number that we would have to have on that petition. There's also a condition where speed humps and multi-way stops can be installed in tandem. Traffic volume minimum of 1,500 vehicles per day on that street and the impact area abutting parcels of 1,200 feet. If a new request is received less than five years after the initial traffic calming installation, we revert to a postcard notification to the impact area in lieu of a petition, and that is what we currently do today. Next slide, please. This map illustrates existing traffic calming citywide, and it shows how popular the neighborhood traffic calming program is among Charlotte citizens. The blue dots represent the more than 1,900 speed humps currently installed. 
The red dots show the 675 multi-way stop locations. We went a step further by adding the arc and wedge designations to this map, and it's very apparent the successful petitions are happening in the wedge. The arc is light by comparison, and this highlights the challenge or barrier of the petition process. A successful petition requires 60% support of the impact area. The current policy is written for homeowners, property owners. We know that renters make up nearly half of our neighborhoods citywide, and that number is much greater in some neighborhoods. We also learned through shared stories from our citizens they just did not have the time to collect signatures when they and their neighbors work full time, over time, and in some instances, multiple jobs and shifts. We believe that time and access were real barriers for our citizens to overcome a complete and complete a successful petition. Next slide, please. Finally, by removing the petition requirement, we increase equity among neighborhoods, particularly, particularly those that have a high number of renters. The implementation of an opposition-only process would mean that CDOT would issue appeal postcards to all parties within an impact area. The postcard will contain instructions to either email an appeal to our general email box at CDOT or mail the postcard to CDOT within 45 days of issuance. We believe that eliminating the petition requirement is a barrier removal that would allow neighborhoods citywide to receive equal opportunity for traffic calming installations when the streets meet the thresholds under the neighborhood traffic calming policy. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. There we are, thank you. So we researched our peer cities to see what they were doing in the neighborhood traffic calming realm and found that five of eight do not use a citizen-led petition or ballot process. We also learned that overall they're communicating what is coming to the neighborhood streets, so the inclusion remains, but the burden is removed. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Here we go. Thank you. Safety is foundational to all the work we do. Our Vision Zero program allows us to focus on neighborhood traffic calming, street lighting, spot safety improvements, and technology improvements like driver feedback signs. Projects are prioritized using data from the High Injury Network and our Vision Zero Action Plan. This program funding allows us to quickly respond to safety improvements that otherwise have funding from another capital program. In 2020, the bond breakdown for 2 million was 35% to thoroughfare lighting, 30% to spot safety infrastructure, 20% pilots technology improvements, community engagement, and 15% to traffic calming. The 2022 proposed $4 million will put 30% toward thoroughfare lighting, 30% toward traffic calming, and 25% toward pilots, technology improvements, and community engagement, and 15% toward spot safety. That's a huge, huge difference. Next slide, please. So at this time, we'd like to address any questions you may have. All right, are there Mr. Winston and Ms. Watlington follow. I, I, I just I would just like to, you know, we talk about sometimes we don't um, uh, celebrate our wins. Um, this is a great, um, this is a great piece of policy to, to, to come before us. Um, I remember probably in 2018, my first term, term on council, this was something uh, that we changed um, uh, 
to make it easier uh, for the petition process to happen to get stop signs and, um, and speed mitigation in neighborhoods. Um, it, it frustrated me um, uh, because I thought we could go further. Um, and, but, you know, I, I learned the lessons of the iterative nature uh, of governing um, uh, that can be frustrating because sometimes that those iterations can be um, extremely far apart if, if they ever come at all. Um, you know, one of the most uh, deflating um, uh, kind of emails I send um, as a representative is when folks um, do reach out, when folks do um, take the initiative and, and do the hard work um, uh, to, to, to try to get these changes within the neighborhood. But uh, uh, the regulations are, are so onerous, as, um, as was represented in the presentation today, that they just, uh, uh, it, it's too hard uh, to meet the bar. I think this is a great, <laughs> um, a, a, a great change. Um, I look forward uh, to further refining it and, and, and getting this this passed. Um, and I, I think this can be transformative um, uh, to neighborhoods um, and transformative uh, to public safety um, and, and, and provide real impact um, uh, um, on, on, on neighborhoods and community uh, throughout 300 plus. Um, um, square miles uh, of Charlotte. So, um, uh, cheers to staff. Uh, cheers, cheers to council um, for uh, not just putting um, uh, the good work that we've done in the past up on a shelf um, and forgetting about it, um, but taking, listening to the community, listening to council, um, and taking those iterative steps um, over time. Um, this this might be the key to um, uh, getting a significant um, uh, issue in our community. Um, right. So, so thank you for this. I look forward to um, uh, getting this into code next week. All right, Ms. Watlington. Sure. So, firstly, I just want to say thank you, thank you. Um, last year, I brought this need up from the community. We had several neighborhoods throughout Charlotte, Parkview, Westover Hills, Revolution Park, and many others that were having an issue being able to get up the signatures for the petition, uh, but could very clearly articulate what the need was. And so thank you for taking that and making something actionable. This is awesome and it's tangible and we really appreciate the work that you're doing. So thank you for that. Um, the follow-up question that I'll have to that is, I'm wondering if you could speak to some of the recent concerns, I say recent, the, the most recent crop of an ongoing concern in some of our neighborhoods, particularly in our south ends and some of the more uh, dense neighborhoods or neighborhoods that have through streets. Can we talk a little bit about where we go from here? So three years ago, I know that we reduced the threshold for uh, speed and volume. Can we talk about how we can use our existing data to see where we can go from here and how that might impact some of our Vision Zero goals. Debbie, would you like to address that? Absolutely. Ms. Watlington, thank you so much for that. And we are aware of the, the questions and the comments. And what I'd like to say on that is, is really where we're going uh, with the information is we're going to go back through all of our, our uh, requests. And we're going to really take that fine-tuned approach to how we're evaluating the, um, the information coming to us from the neighborhoods and the thresholds. The most important thing that we want to do is go in and see where we have had neighborhoods that did not have the successful petition but met those thresholds. And so that, for us, first and foremost, is priority. Um, and then with that, we're going to then take a look at the data and see where else can we make improvements like this. Um, I believe Transportation Director uh, Liz Babson spoke to you earlier, and we absolutely um, have the opportunity to go back into that data and see how we can take it the next step. But like I mentioned, our priority is really connecting with those neighborhoods um, that didn't make the successful petition process. Thank you. I appreciate your work. Thank you. Yeah, I, I won't be long. I just want to thank you as well. Um, this makes the district reps jobs a little bit easier, for sure, because we get a lot of these type of uh, requests. So thank you very much. I won't repeat what uh, Councilmember Winston and Walton has said. Um, good job. Look forward to supporting it. Okay. Thank you, guys. You guys, it's, I think everyone understands this is where government really can make a difference in, in a neighborhood, and, and your reaction to making it an easier process for the community is really 
appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the next item on our oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Our next item is the innovation barn. So, so thank you, Mayor, members of council. Um, Bill Rieger and Amy Oscar are here tonight, and I don't know who's going first. I guess it's you, Bill. First. Okay, all right. This is uh, came out of the uh, last uh, budget discussion where we said we would come back to you with an update uh, on the barn at the June strategy session. Good evening, Mayor and members of council. Uh, for the record, Phil Rieger, General Services Director. And as the manager said, during your budget adjustments meeting, the council decided to put uh, the unrenovated portion of the innovation barn into the advanced planning program. So tonight, I'm gonna to very briefly uh, remind council what the advanced planning program is and why we do it. And then um, give a quick overview of how the innovation barn renovation sort of fits in and provide a timeline for that project. And then I'll show a few pictures of what uh, the first phase of the barn started looking like and what it looks like today. And then I'll invite um, Ms. Osaker up to um, talk a little bit more about the successes that um, she's been able to bring to the barn since we received our certificate of occupancy. All right, so um, this picture on the right side of the uh, slide ought to look familiar to most. Uh, back in um, the development of the fiscal year 2020 budget, I sat in front of uh, council as your budget director uh, and talked about the development of an advanced planning program. And the, the purpose for that program really was to help us transition uh, away from how we estimated and developed uh, budgets for projects uh, during sort of the season of big ideas towards a, a more disciplined approach to project planning. Um, and uh, that's what we're talking about doing uh, with the Innovation Barn renovation. $20 million was uh, set aside uh, in 2020. It was a revolving loan fund uh, concept. And um, those are the, do or some, we'll use some of those dollars uh, to do this project. Um, what we're able to do really through this program is to evaluate high priority projects for future potential funding. These are projects that are high priority to council because council selects through the budget process which projects go into advanced planning. Um, and then council has another decision point when we have quality cost estimates, uh, whether or not those projects are priority for future um, allocation of funding for construction. So the program goals really are to define the scope of a project. What is the project? If you don't really have a hard scope, you really aren't gonna have solid cost estimates. Um, the second thing that we really do is we test feasibility through the pro process. And then finally, we provide uh, high level uh, and reliable cost estimates for consideration for future budgets. And so, there will be multiple, and there are multiple council approval points uh, along the way. We call these go, no go points. Uh, so if we, during the process of advanced planning, get a preliminary budget estimate that looks a little out of line than, than we originally thought, there is a mechanism built in to say, hang on a minute, we weren't interested in spending that uh, amount of money, or that's not the return on the investment that we thought we were gonna get, and so we could stop the project at that point and not spend any more money on it. And then finally, this process is intended to be, or, or create a pipeline of projects, projects ready to go. And so they're, they're ready to go uh, as it relates to consideration for your five-year CIP. Um, and 
this year was a great example of that. The first uh, series of projects that came out of advanced planning uh, were considered as a part of the FY 2023 uh, budget process and were, uh, were programmed throughout the five-year CIP. So what this really does is create a pipeline for your CIP, but it also creates, uh, it gets projects to a place in design such that if other funding opportunities present themselves, we got projects ready to go. So let me talk a little bit about the timeline for putting the innovation barn renovation through advanced planning. And first let me talk about the purpose uh, of the programming study that we'll do. Um, and the purpose of the programming study is to evaluate the remaining portion of the building that's approximately 20,000 square feet to determine what it'll take to bring the building up to code so that the space can be occupied. And so that's a, that's a very basic level of programming. And so what we're really talking about doing is evaluating electrical, evaluating plumbing, roofing systems, evaluating floors, lighting, bathrooms, HVAC systems to support the additional 20,000 square feet. The, um, the work that was done in the original project was done to support 18,000 square feet. Um, and if, um, you know, when we talk about, for example, HVAC systems, um, in order to make sure that those systems function efficiently as they're intended, we don't over-design them. That generally doesn't develop uh, efficiently operating buildings. So if we think about how the, a project moves through advanced planning, it starts with a procurement process. We need to select an architect to do the work. And so we'll spend um, most of the rest of, uh, of calendar year 2022 going through a procurement process, which includes a qualifications-based selection of the architect. Um, we'll negotiate contracts. Council will approve that contract. Um, and then um, we'll execute the contract in beginning, and begin the programming phase. Uh, the first half of 2023 will really be around programming and schematic design. Um, and you can read uh, all those uh, activities that happen there, but this presents um, the first go, no-go point in the project. So one of the things that we traditionally do is uh, we have a third-party cost estimator uh, look at the cost estimates of the architect to make sure that we have uh, agreement about what we think the project will cost at this phase of design, and it provides us uh, that first look at a potential budget and it gives us the opportunity to make that uh, decision about is this a project we want to continue or is this a project that we want to stop because we don't think we're going to get the return that we expected. Assuming that we continue, then we will move into uh, the third and fourth quarters of 2023 and we'll go through what's called design development. And this is when we really get uh, into the heavy details of design, we, we start to we start to see um, what looks like plans. And, and this, this is where, uh, this phase of the process is where we start, where we will develop a cost estimate that we feel comfortable uh, for budgeting purposes. And again, uh, we will have an independent cost estimator, make sure that uh, these cost estimates are valid. And this will be another no, uh, a go, no go point. Uh, and this would be the, the budget number that we, you might see in the FY 2025 CIP request. And then moving forward, assuming that the um, uh, construction dollars would get budgeted in FY 2025, uh, we would move to develop construction plans. Uh, at, at that point, we would bid the project and construct it. Uh, so that's what the um, typical schedule looks like for a uh, advanced planning project and how it would fit with the innovation barn. 
So uh, before I turn it over to Ms. Osaker, just wanted to give you a sense of, uh, and many of you have been out, you've seen the barn. Um, it's, it's just a really exciting place. Uh, on the left side, you can see uh, pictures of what looks like a hundred year old facility um, that used to uh, maintain vehicles. There's even urban legend that we stored uh, horses in this building at one time. That's how it gets the uh, name horse barn. Um, but we were able to upfit building systems. Um, we were able to put in a commercial teaching kitchen. Amy will talk about how she's um, utilizing that space, project demonstration space, office and event space, and a, and a bathroom overhaul. So I'm um, really excited about what we've been able to accomplish thus far. And with that said, let me go ahead and turn it over to, to Amy to talk a little bit about um, what she's been able to accomplish since we've opened the building. I will hit another button. You hit another button. See where it goes. Hello. Thank you. Page down. <clears throat> Denata, are we waiting for another? Wendy, I need you to switch the presentations. And while we're switching, hi, I'm Amy Osaker. I think I know most of you, uh, Executive Director of Envision Charlotte. So thank you for having me here today to talk about all the fun stuff we're doing out there. And if you haven't been out, I will give you a personal tour anytime you would like. Just send me an email and we will set it up. Okay. I can't sing, I can dance, but I'm not gonna do it here. So we'll just, oh, there we have it, okay. So just a reminder, Envision Charlotte is a 501c3. We are 11 years old. Uh, we have an annual budget of about 600,000. 20 or 75% of that comes from uh, sponsorships and about 25% comes from grants. And then we have two and a half staff members. And once you get through the end of this presentation, you'll wonder why, how we get all this done because I did after I did this presentation. Um, page down. Okay, so where we came from. So Envision Charlotte has been focused on sustainability projects for the last 11 years. We used to look at projects in terms of silos, energy, air, water, and waste. We, about five years ago, took a group over to Amsterdam and to Bar or, uh, Rotterdam and Barcelona to look at how they were managing their waste. Because in the United States, we have a huge problem with our waste going to landfills. In Europe, they don't have as much land as we do, so they have a lot more innovations around how they manage their waste. So we met with uh, Metabolic. They did a study of our waste here in Charlotte, and they came up with five areas for us to focus on. One would be designing an innovation center to engage not only corporations, but individuals, um, and bringing together different kinds of mindsets to really advance the circular economy. They also had us focus on four areas, and these are areas that we have a huge amount going to the landfill that we could divert, create jobs, and innovations. So that is plastics, organics, textiles, and concrete and waste, or concrete and demolition. So the goals for a circular economy is a zero waste city, innovative city of the future, resilient and healthy, and a city with opportunities for all. So that overarches everything that we do at the Innovation Barn. So we're gonna step back a little bit, talk about some of the donations that we've gotten to the Innovation Barn. So the top portion are the things that went into the structure of the building. So this is all for the city. This will remain with the building. We had $130,000 from Lowe's for improvements. So when you go out there, you will see all of the outside is pretty much done by Lowe's. We have a mushroom garden that we DIY'd it ourselves. Um, we got $50,000, um, about $50,000 in lighting from Signify. It is the entire building. This is power over ethernet. It is a state of the art lighting system and it's highly efficient in terms of energy efficiency. We were, we got donated drywall, or drywall donated. It is close to my bedtime, so this is very challenging for me right now. Um, 
We also, as you saw the picture of the kitchen, Electrolux donated that entire kitchen. There are four teaching stations. We also had the hoods donated to the project. We had bathroom sinks donated, additional mis miscellaneous items like the hoods and the sinks, as I mentioned. We also have additional donations. We had, Wells Fargo gave us all of our office furniture. Alfred Williams gave us all of our other furniture. We have tables and chairs for meetings. We also have an additional equipment that have been donated, a $20,000 filament machine, a $40,000 Wema shredder, $15,000 baler, and a $3,000 brick mold. These are all pieces of equipment that are helping us take things from landfill, create jobs, create innovations we're writing business plans for right now using this equipment. Right now, we only have 18, half the building renovated. The other half is unusable. It is storage only. These are just some of the programs that we've launched, so I'm going to go through these quickly. We started a takeout food container program. We have uh, collection sites all over the city at retirement facilities at Providence Day School. We have collected over four tons of this material, and why this is significant is right now you cannot curbside recycle that. It will go to the landfill, but we are using that to create bricks um, that can be made into storage or tiny homes. Um, and like I said, we've collected four, over four tons. We collect more and more every week. <coughs> We also have a program with SEBA, the Charlotte Independence Brewers Association, where we collect Pactex, the top of beer cans, those plastic things, those cannot be curbside recycled. We take those, we have 30 participating breweries. We've collected over 200 pounds of those. We have glass collections. Um, the city, the county actually has a pretty big problem with glass right now. It costs more to ship it to be recycled than it, it is worth. So it's $30 per pound to ship and it's $20 in uh, money back. So we're working with the county right now on what we can do. So we've had a glass crusher. We've cl crushed glass. We're using it in aggregate for concrete right now and we're testing that. We are collecting aluminum and PET. We have lots of partnerships. We get everything from the Coca-Cola 600 and the Charlotte Motor Speedway. We have closed the loop on 200,000 bottles and cans, meaning those bottles and cans have gone back into bottles and cans. We collect bubble wrap and air pillows. We get that back over to um, sealed air. We had a week-long Clean the Queen, where we had over 300 volunteers come up and do litter pickup throughout the city. We brought it back to the barn. We sorted it. We were able to recycle 25% of it. We are going to be doing those quarterly, so stay tuned. And if you'd like to uh, volunteer, come on by. And then we're also working with the county on styrofoam collection, which is huge because styrofoam is terrible. We shouldn't be using it. But since we do, let's try and find somewhere for it to go other than landfill. Some of the engagement we've had, we have literally had over 1,000 tours. We've had over 7,000 visitors, and we've had over 2,000 volunteer hours just since September. Um, we also started Shrooms and Shreds. I highly recommend it. It's a very cool program with 100 gardens where you can come in, you can harvest your own foods, you can learn about urban farming, you cook it in the kitchen, and then what you don't eat, you can go feed to the flies. We have rental. Um, opportunities, so we do everything from luncheons to parties to McKinsey brought their entire office out, did um, two hours of volunteering, and then they had a happy hour. We also have tons of company participations on all kinds of level. So Ally comes out twice a month to volunteer, Maersk comes out every month. Um, we have other kinds of engagements in terms of going into offices and teaching them about sustainability. These are just just a quick list of some of the partners that we have. The tenants. We have eight current tenants there, both for-profit and non-profit. Two of the non-profits are 100 Gardens and The Bulb. Um, both of those serve um, a very big part of our strategy around mitigating um, food waste. So 100 Gardens does urban farming and aquaponics. They are in 17 at-risk schools and two correctional facilities. The Bulb is coming in this month. I'm super excited about them. They rescue foods from Trader Joe's or farms, and then they have seven, 11 mobile units that they go to food deserts, and they give the food out to those uh, individuals. We have four profits. We have two minority-owned women businesses, and then four additional businesses. These are all within the circular economy advancing our goals. 
We have created seven new jobs, uh, including one at Providence Day. They hired someone to wash all the materials and bring them to us every week. So we have created seven jobs in the last year. Wait, yay, yeah, yes. Just additional information, we've won several awards. Uh, the barn was uh, awarded the Community Impact Award by Cornet. We were also a finalist for the Barcelona Smart City Project for our takeout plastic containers. We've had over 50 stories on the Innovation Barn. American Innovators, which is a YouTube series, will be releasing um, a program they did on us July 13th. We're super excited about that. We support local artists. We have four murals. We have a new one coming up. And then lastly, our future plans, we're talking with the county right now and several partners about adding an education center. This would be on the entire circular economy. We will put it in the renovated side for now. We would love to expand it to the whole barn, but it would be over all of these different components. It would be teaching recycling. Um, it would also be teaching just the fundamentals of sustainability and how we can reduce our CO2 by being more circular. So that's it in a quick nutshell. Any questions? Um, I have first Ms. Watlington, followed by Ms. Esmira. Thank you. My questions are actually, uh, I'm sorry, did I say that? Did you? Oh, I saw, I saw her hand and you started okay. talking. Okay, I got you. Yeah, um, my questions are actually in regards to the advanced planning process. The what? Advanced planning process. Okay, um, do you want to do, have, are there questions for the barn? Ms. Ashmira, is your question for the barn? For both. Okay. Um, Mr. Graham, are you for the barn? Yeah, just a, just a comment. Graham. Yeah, just a comment. I uh, just want to thank you for your patience tonight. You've been here for quite a long time along with us, so I appreciate that. And also I want to thank Mayor Pro Tem for extending me the opportunity to go visit the barn and uh, really learned a lot. Very impressed by what I saw while I was there and just want to thank you for uh, taking the time to give me the tour. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Jo Ms. Mayor Pro Tem for the barn? Actually for Phil. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to Phil so that okay. we can do, get the slides of the deck up as oh, this. Ms. You have for okay, Ms. I do also have one for Amy. Okay, <laughs> Mayor Sorry. Pro Tem. Um, yeah. Um, do you know, Amy, what the the recycling is confusing. We've never really had a great presentation on, on the recycling process between the city and the, the consumer, the city, the county, landfill. Mm -hmm. Do you know what we, the volume of recycling, I don't know if it's annually or whatever, and how much of it ends up in landfill, both residential, commercial? Yeah, so the city picks up residential waste from about 330,000 households. It's about, if I get all my numbers right, 300,000 tons goes to the landfill. 50,000 tons goes to the MRF, the Materials Recovery Facility. And of that 50,000, 9,000 then ends up in the landfill. So about 11%, this does not include yard waste, but about 11% of our residential waste is diverted from the landfill to recycling. Okay. Do you know? Uh, so that's recite. That's residential. Mm -hmm. um, do you know anything about the commercial side? Yeah, our overall waste in Charlotte is about a million tons a year. A million tons a year goes to landfill. No, a million oh. tons is um, all of our waste, and still it, it drops down to about eleven percent is recycled or diverted oh. from the landfill. Okay, so eleven percent is diverted from landfill and I, I asked the manager this we spend about 16 million a year is that right um maybe phil i asked i had asked what we spend in tipping fees because we pay the county and it was a little over 16 million a year i think is what yeah and i don't have um, that number um my brain is right. yeah um so so of that amount what I understand you don't have the scale at this point to mm -hmm. really make an impact, and we have to wait until we could um, renegotiate our interlocal agreement with the county, but what could we be doing? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's some low-hanging fruit. Some of the plastics that we can that we can process at the barn that the county doesn't process. Some of the number twos and number fives, which I showed you could be turned into bricks. They could be turned into cups for your social districts. Um, so you could, we could be creating a lot of products with those materials. Glass is another big one. There's too much glass, obviously, going into the bins that are costing the city more money to take them somewhere else. If we could process that glass here, so we are working on those types of smaller projects to see how we could scale up. So we're looking at taking the glass after it's crushed that as an aggregate into concrete. And so, for example, the, the side that's not finished, it has to have the floor leveled. We could level it with actually concrete with aggregate from the glass that we would take from the county. So there's all kinds of opportunities. If we look strategically at the interlocal agreement that ends in 2028, there are things that we could pick out of there that we could turn into jobs. We could make investments into companies to take these materials, and that would lessen the cost from taxpayers and also what's going to the landfill. 31% of our, f our food waste goes to landfill, 31%. Mm. If you put food in a bag, you tie it up, and you put it in the landfill, that off gas is methane, which is one of the worst um, gases for climate change. We've got to stop sending so much <coughs> organics. So we need more in inventions around keeping organics out of the landfill, but also getting food into people's mouths who need it instead of into waste. Okay, thank you. I think it's important information because I think as we approach 2028, um, as you all approach 2028, um, as a council, I think that there has to be a change in mindset of what we spend on recycling versus what we could be um, not spending on recycling and actually earning off of that. Um, the opportunity cost, really, whether we use it for our own concrete, in sidewalks or whatever, or sell it. Um, I think that's a mindset that when we went to Europe, it's completely the opposite. They're looking at what value they can get out of that, whereas we're paying it, it actually gets paid twice to end up in the landfill. Yeah, there's Thank a lot you. of opportunity. So Ms. Ajmira, would you like to ask Amy your question? And then we'll come back on when Phil gets up for the um, other question. Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, certainly great work is being done, and I believe in the circular economy concept, and hence I had supported the work uh, when there was an original request a couple of years ago, and the second request followed by that uh, a few years ago. Uh, and I know we were promised that this was a public-private partnership. Uh, Amy, would you be able to tell us how much the total uh, funds came from the private sector. Um, well, I can go back up to the slide. Is it going? Um, the one thing I would say, it's, it's kind of challenging to get the private sector to pay into a city building. So I'm pretty proud that we were able to get about $300,000 worth donated. Um, that is fundraising that I'm taking out of operations and into the projects that we're doing into structure of a city building. So we had about 300,000 there. And then in addition, the equipment and everything else that has gone into the barn has all been from our partners or our fundraising. Ms. Ajmeri, you're on mute. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So is it fair to say that $300,000 were matched towards our $4 million plus uh, private public funding? It wasn't. It was donations of drywall or the kitchen or the gravel. It was, it was not checks written to the city. It was in donation form of materials. I, I understand that. So what I'm saying is the total about $300,000 worth of um, in-kind contribution. Is that? Yes, from the private sector, oh. yeah. Yeah, and um, uh, Mr. Rigger, if you could say how much have we spent total on this circular economy concept to date? 
the project uh, finished just under $5 million at $4.9 million and some change. Thank you. Uh, I know when it was originally proposed, uh, it was supposed to be a public-private partnership. Um, and then, uh, are you receiving any funding from the county? I know you do a lot of work around recycling and really putting materials back into the economy, which is great. Uh, do you at all get any funding from the Mecklenburg County towards some of the programming work? Yes, well, we have a proposal um, into the county right now. We are working through that this week um, for the education piece of the project. And how much funding are you expecting from the county? Well, until they vote, I'm not expecting anything. Uh, we have requested, um, I think it was 527,000 for the education piece. However, what we're going to do now is break that into funding a preliminary master plan and then putting a timeline out around each of the little different vignettes that we'll be building. In addition, they are actually considering funding a position to run that education center because of how many tours they get asked for the MRF that they could supplement over at the Innovation Barn. Got it. So this would be very program specific towards education efforts. Is that correct? Education around recycling, yes, where that's okay. their focus. Nothing towards capital or operations? Operations in terms of staffing, yes. Not in okay. terms of putting anything into the building because it's not their building. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, to Mr. Rigger, could you go back to the slide where you have multiple phase? You got the phase uh, planning and then you got the design phase and the timeline. Could you go back to that slide Ms. for me? Ms. Ashmir, can, can we go ahead and let, before we shift over, let the other questions regarding the barn be addressed by the other council members? Then we'll come back to Mr. Rieger that has, has all of the, those, um, that we can change to the deck again. Sounds good. Okay. okay. All right. So, Ms. Johnson? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Amy, for the presentation. I also uh, believe in the circular economy concept, um, but if you notice, my theme tonight has been equity and accountability. So I have some questions. Um, can you go back to the, the tenants, the slide with the tenants of the mm -hmm. building? Okay, thank you. So we know, according to Mr. Rieger, there's been $4.9 million from the city into the innovation barn, i.e. Um, Envision Charlotte or um, um, how much do you guys currently pay for rent for this space? A dollar. Okay. And how much? One dollar per month? Mm -hmm. Or a year? One dollar per year? Yeah. One dollar per year for how many square feet? 18,000 usable square feet and 18,000 of storage. And the lease was signed in 2018, right? It was a five-year, Was how long was the lease? It was a five-year lease. It was updated to be five years from the day that this, um, the certificate. certificate of occupancy was given to us. So five years starting a year ago. So we're year one. Say that again. So it was five years from the day that we got the keys, basically. Uh -huh. And so we got those one year ago this month. So we're one year into five years. And that was processed in 2018? 2018, the lease was signed, or the agreement was approved by council? Correct. Okay, but you all didn't start the lease until 2021? It was amended so that we weren't punished for how long the the construction was taking. So it was when we actually had the building. I'm sorry, one of my council members, did you, you, did you have a question? Okay, thank you. Um, so, okay, so $1 per year. And your tenants, mm -hmm. how much do they pay for rent? So each one's a little different. It depends on if they're a for-profit or non-profit, but it's on profit sharing. So until they are making money, do they put back into the barn? They do, however, help us cover costs like security, uh, Wi-Fi, cleaning, and pest control. 
So can you give me a range? Um, Repor has not paid anything. Ex I think $126. Um, let's see. Carol Crown Town Composting pays, I think, $1,200 a month. I mean, I could... I I can send you, if you would like, each one of the leases, I can send those over to you. That's all right. I asked the city manager for that um, last week, so I'll probably be getting it, I hope. So thank you. Um, so and I see that minority and women-owned businesses, any of those black-owned businesses? Um, the Bulb. The Bulb and Hunter Gardens are nonprofits, so they're not Owned. Okay, found it then or yeah, run. the bulb okay. is. I, I mean, I I think the executive director is black. It's not something I, I can get that information for. Okay, you. I was just, I saw minority. I just wanted I know that. Um, okay, um, and your five hundred one c three. So you are uh, required to meet IRS IRS guidelines for nonprofits, right? Correct. Okay, so. Um, I've been talking about equity all day, and my suggestion to council would be before we renovate the building that another organization be given an opportunity to lease that space. We heard a dollar per year for an organization. We know that city administrative staff sits on the board. This feels inequitable. There are minority organizations that don't have this op these opportunities. Um, I also, I wanted to know also if you can, IRS guidelines are very specific about nonprofit and uh, political engagement. Can you tell me how you can, you, how it was justified that um, your organization hosted fundraisers for political candidates? This last uh, election and victory parties also, I believe. We rent the space out, um, non-discriminatory. So whoever wants to rent the space out at our current rates, we do. So you do rent the space? Yes. OK, so OK. So, okay. All right. Um, but I, I would say that an organization that we should look um, if we're going to pour more money into this space that an, an organization, minority owned, or th that, that, that it be fair, that this organization maybe have the first half and that we look at extending this opportunity be very intentional into um, another nonprofit organization, perhaps even one of those organizations that are currently there. But I think that that would be a fair opportunity, an equitable opportunity. Um, if they if they share the uh, space, this organization has a five-year lease. This organization has a five-year lease to get a head start, and I think that we should offer that organization or or this opportunity for this second half of the space to another organization that um, that also works in the circular economy or recycling. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Bakari. Mr. Driggs? I have a question for Mr. Rieger, Mayor. Okay, well, we'll come back to that. Mr. Eggleston. It's being made out to sound like there's some favor being done. The city has a goal, and we are asking someone to help us do it. So this is not just somebody offering a good lease deal for a friend. This is us having found an organization that can execute on a vision we have and help us achieve a goal that we have. So if there is another group in the city that is doing work around the circular economy like Envision Charlotte is, I think we would welcome having them be a part of the barn. To my knowledge, that group doesn't exist. If it does, I'd love to be corrected, but this is not some sweetheart deal. This is us asking someone to do something for us. Mr. Bakari? Yeah, that's not incorrect at all, what he just said. It's, it, if said even more simply, there are two options on this planet for us to consider. One is that we retrofit our own building that we own that we have to do anyway, and then we put city workers in there and uh, ultimately pay all the overhead to do everything they're doing, of which we'll have to figure out how to have the expertise to do it, or we find someone that will actually pay us a dollar more than we would have gotten that way, 
a year and do all the things that they've laid out there. I think this is, uh, this is actually pretty disturbing to me that we're having this conversation and wheeling this out here. Can we do better? Absolutely. Can there be better oversight? Sure. But if anyone's watching from home and curious as to what exactly is going on right now, there have been some, some, some problems that people have had either not getting credit or having political opposition things that have occurred there. And right now you're hearing that now bleed over into challenging really what is the circular economy and what we should all be in a bipartisan way behind and it's very strange to me. So uh, sorry if you're confused at home. No, I, I'm going to say something. You know, there are some people who can't see the forest for the trees. There's something that's called a Charlotte Way. And anyone who can't see that we can hold our vendors accountable, then that's your problem. But there are a lot of people who want more accountability in this city, and it's very obvious. So this is not personal, and I was not afraid that it was going to be considered personal. Otherwise, I wouldn't have asked those questions. This is about accountability, and it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions on the barn? All right, then. Yes. I'm sorry, Ms. Mr. Phipps. Mr. Phipps? Yeah. Um, I, I'm still amazed that, you know, we get a recycle bin with our residents, and I'm still surprised to learn that we're obviously not recycling right in as much as you can put uh, glass in your in your uh, recycle bin, and and I understand that maybe it's not that's ending up in the landfill, but yet we're paying tipping fees to have that diverted to the landfill when we think we're doing something that's going to be helping uh, our environment, uh, even the circular economy or whatever. How how is it? I mean, how how is the public informed? I mean, when you say that, like you put something in the landfill and half of, I mean, in the in the uh, uh, recycle bin, and half of it or more than half ends up in the uh, landfill, I still it baffles me how we could be letting that happen. So I really don't understand why we can't make better use of this to, to, to divert this right. And uh, it just boggles me. Essentially what you're saying is I got two, two uh, trash bins. I really don't have a recycling bin. Mr. Phipps, I'm gonna ask the manager if he can talk about this a little bit because it is a complex subject that's waste management is a big deal and we as a city and a country I think we're not keeping up and we need to do some things differently so Mr. Jones explain how it works. Sure so thank you uh, Mayor and member, members of council so Mr. Phipps I'll uh, try my best and Amy if I um, don't have my facts quite straight, please correct me. Things really changed when, when I, I don't know who was here back in uh, a retreat I think we had January of 2018, it may have, yeah, 2018. Yeah, when Eva when, came? When Eva came in uh, to talk about this whole concept of a circular economy, whether you call it, you know, um, upcycling, <coughs> and it was a pretty good discussion. I think she came in with shoes made out of uh, peels and there was a lot of excitement around this and uh, I, I do believe that um, Amy's done a good job of trying to explain you know what was we were trying to accomplish I, I think that um, one of the things she didn't say is that Charlotte is actually looked at across the country as a leader in this space so we did have something that was an eyesore that um, we didn't quite know what to do with, that we had a partner that came in with a plan that was, I think, the first of its kind in the United States that basically said, what you can do with some of these materials is actually make money off of it and create jobs. 
Um, then we had the, and this is where I may need some help, Amy, this whole concept of recycling changed dramatically in the sense that they wanted um, the product to be cleaner. And what was happening is what we normally could actually get recycled was finding its way into a landfill. And so we started to think about how can we have, I guess, something that's a bit more pure that actually could be uh, recycled, upcycled, what have you. The other thing that's interesting, and I'm going to choose my words wisely because I love the partnership we have with the county, <laughs> but it's important to note that, you know, um, we pay this tip fee, and actually, and I won't speak about the county, but I'll just speak about tip fees in general. Um, the more you put in the landfill, potentially the lower your tip fee is. Um, the less you put in the landfill, typically your tip fee goes up. So this thing actually works so much against the city in terms of having uh, things go into landfill, which we don't want, as well as paying a, a tip fee. And once something goes into that green bin, it's no longer ours. It actually, even though we have waste management, it, it's, 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 so it's this concept, and then we had this thing called COVID, and even beginning to execute the plan that came from Metabolic was delayed. So I, so I guess what I'm saying to your, your point, Mr. Phipps, there's, um, it's complicated what gets um, recycled to begin with, but now this whole thing of who was willing to take recycling across the world has become smaller and smaller. And so therefore, unfortunately, what we're finding is more and more things are going into the landfill. I think ultimately what we're trying to do today and for 2028 is find a way that we can um, create jobs, keep things from going to the landfill that weren't intended to go to the landfill. You know, so there are some kind of ways, ways that we can actually create a revenue stream from some of these items that can be recycled, upcycled. That's where we are today. Unfortunately, we, we started off with all these great beliefs and ideas and concepts, and a lot of things happened, including the cost overruns at, at the barn. Uh, is it a, a, a wonderful facility? Absolutely. Are there other cities across the country that are coming here to ask us how we're doing it? Um, absolutely. So I, I think, and I, and I go to, I, I think it's Ms. Bakari's point, um, you know, we do have this asset, the advanced planning fund, which we haven't discussed yet, it's really spending about $200,000 to see um, what it would take to renovate another 18,000 square feet of that facility. And you know, whether it's for Envision Charlotte or for whomever, I, I think that's money well spent to get it right to build out the rest of this facility. Okay, Mr. Phipps, it's, you got it? I got it, it's, it's, it's complicated. Like he says, I, don't, I think the, the average residential customer is probably oblivious to the fact that they think they're doing good, but in actuality, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a, almost a zero sum game. They got two, they got two trash bins and uh, they don't, we don't know it, you know? Thank you. Um, so I think that, Amy, thank you for your time and expertise and, and your innovation and all that you're doing. So we're now gonna switch over to the other deck. Is that okay, Ms. Jackson? And then we'll start with Ms. Watlington on her question for Mr. Rieger. Um, so I just have a couple questions, more process or questions. I'm curious about the nature of the revolving fund. How is how exactly does it work? Are we using like expense dollars and then when a project is funded, it's rolled into the capital cost? How does that work? So Manager Jones will help me if I get this wrong because Ryan Bergman's not here. And um, but the the uh, 
the fund is funded by cash out of the municipal debt service fund. Mm -hmm. And that's the fund that pays the principal and interest on debt. Mm -hmm. and, and so when projects move out of advanced planning and are put into the budget, we budget the entire amount of the project, mm -hmm. including what it costs to go through the planning, the advanced okay. planning. And then the, the, the debt proceeds or debt sold reimburses the fund. Got it. Okay. Um, in the case of a project being aborted and there is no uh, capital project realized, how does the money get back into the fund? So um, we, we, we haven't had one of those yet, but that is, that is a challenge. And so the fund either has to eat the cost mm -hmm. uh, or we have to find another source to reimburse it. We haven't encountered that uh, to this point, but, um, but that would be have to, how it would have to functionally happen. Okay. Um, my next question is just in general how about how many, and I know it's relatively new, but how many projects then are going through the fund at the same, or let me ask you this way, what do we think the capacity is in terms of number of projects in flight in the fund at any given time? So that's a tough question to answer because yeah. each project is different and, yeah. and the cost of the uh, advanced planning is different. Um, but I, um, I do have this in front of me, and I know you all have seen this. This is from the budget document, and um, in, the, in, the, in the document, page 313 through I think it's 319, there's a really great description about what the advanced planning fund is, the projects that are, have been put into the fund and have, and have come out and are now programmed in a five-year CIP, as well as projects that are still going through the process. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't want to read it to you. You all can, can find it. But um, I didn't count, for tonight, I didn't count how many projects uh, are in right now. However, I do have, um, we have, in the uh, five-year CIP, we've put one, two, three, four, five, six projects that have come out of advanced planning. Um, we've, we've created solid budget estimates, and they've went into your five-year CIP. Um, there are still projects that are in advanced planning today, um, but again, uh, uh, without just taking the time and sure. counting, I, sure. I don't have that exact number. Yeah, I'm really just trying to get a sense of if $20 million is enough for advanced planning. Um, versus the actual capital that we're able to have, or if it's maybe too much, given that realizing that projects are different sizes, but just in general, being able to tell, well, hey, we only have $200 million, so no need to have 68 projects in the pipeline. Right. I was just curious how that was managed. Well, so let me, um, Phil, let me I, Phil, I do have ahead. some data points that might help. Okay. So we, uh, we looked at the finance system today, and, um, and it said we had $4 million in the advanced planning fund left. Of course, we're talking about spending approximately 200,000 of that 4 million. Uh, however, this fiscal year, we estimate that uh, about six and a half million will be reimbursed. Mm -hmm. And so you see how it's starting to put money back in to take care of the projects that are working their way through the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And we would see that year over year over year as projects ad advance out of advanced planning and get funded through uh, the CIP will continue to put money back in the fund. So uh, when we adopted the fund, we weren't absolutely positive that 20 million was exactly the number that it needed to be, but it was our best guess at the time and it still seemed to be a good number thus far. Got it. Um, my next question is in terms of performance metrics, if you will, I, I'm under the impression that the advanced planning fund was instituted so we could get better at our um, our preliminary, our feasibility grade estimates. Are we seeing an improvement? And if so, how, have we quantified it? So um, every year we give city council during the budget process a series of blue and yellow sheets. And uh, the best way for me to quantify it for you today, um, when I was budget director and that was FY about around 2018, so it was the FY 2019 and the FY 2020 budget. We had uh, Jennifer eight or ten projects that had budget risk, um, and this year we had one. 
Mm -hmm. And it was a project that was of the original eight or 10. We haven't put any more projects in the some budget risk category. And I believe that's because of some changes that we've instituted from an engineering perspective, but also because of the, of the work that we've done uh, in the advanced planning program. Okay, I would also ask, and we probably won't know until those projects that have already come out is complete, how much contingency did we overestimate that we're sitting assigned to a project because we don't want to be over budget? Does that make sense? Sure. In other words, are we losing opportunity because we're being overly conservative? I don't, I don't have any information or data, uh, but I could follow up with you and, and give you a sense of, of contingency. Uh, but it's not uncommon that uh, we would have anywhere between 15 and 20 percent contingency yeah, when we good. get a project to a place where we are ready to put it in a budget. Yep, that makes sense. And then my last question is just from a um, speed to market standpoint. Have we seen any... Um, gains in terms of how long it takes to get to our first go no go or to even a uh, I don't even know if we're that far into the process I would imagine we are if we've got some out of the pipeline how far, how long it takes to go from inception to CD so each project's a little different depending on the complexity mm -hmm. um, but generally to go through planning and design it's about two years Jennifer um, I would say that a road project is different than a building mm -hmm. um, be, because of the design processes are just a little bit different. Um, but uh, it takes us about two years. I couldn't say whether we're faster or not. We've just started. We're just starting to turn the crank in this new discipline. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell you affirmatively that I know that we're six months faster than we were before. Gotcha. Uh, before we weren't, we were, before we were, high level estimating a project and then putting it into planning to see what it would really cost. Mm -hmm. and, and in some cases, uh, that didn't work out as well as we would have liked. Gotcha. And so then Phil, let, let me make sure I help a little bit. You would get to, in two years, what, 30% design? Yes. 30, okay. But, you know, I don't know if it's 18 months or a year, you could be at 15 and you learn a lot at 15% design, oh, too. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't want you to think that it takes us two years to even figure out whether or not a project makes sense. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Even within a year, we've learned a whole lot about a project that, that uh, we didn't know about it in the past. So to that point, um, I saw your stage gate process. Mm -hmm. That first go, no go, is that at 30% or... That, that first no-go was uh, more at, at the end of programming. And so uh, the programming is like we've, set, we've established the scope mm -hmm. of the project and we're telling the designer, this is what we want you to go away now and start putting on paper the design. So there's a, at the programming stage, we're, we're working with the people that are going to use the building. Mm -hmm. uh, in this, um, for example, at a fire station, we would be working with the fire department about exactly what that fire station would need to look like and how it would need to lay out. That, that's sort of what we do in programming. Right. Um, square footages, but floor when does templates. it come back to council for go, no go? Say again? When does it come back to council for the first gate? Um, the first gate that it comes back, uh, I don't think we've had one come back to council for the first gate yet. Okay. Because we haven't had anything that's come out back that is wildly out of the ordinary or, or something that would be unexpected. If we would have something that would be unexpected that council put into the advanced planning fund, we would bring that back and say, we need to test whether or not this needs to move forward or not. So, um, just so I'm clear then, who is, there is always a go, no go, there's always a stage gate. Who's making that decision if not council? Because I hear you say that unless it's wildly unexpected, it doesn't come back to council. Who's making the decision on what moves forward at each stage gate? Right, so, so Manager so, Jones. So as, uh, Ms. Watlington, as Phil said earlier, there used to be the sheet blue, yellow. I think they were red on the sheet, too. I just guess there's no more red. And so as you get those reports, are they twice a year? Just We just once do it a year, once a year. Do, around budget time? Yep. You would see it, and then all of a sudden you would see a bunch of yellows, and that's when we would have the questions, the conversations, 
and somebody could say, well, why in the world would you move forward with that? So that becomes that early warning system, the, the blue and yellow sheet. Okay. And it comes my, to you. Okay. And then my last question is, how do projects get into advanced planning? Is it, is there a formal action that gets them there? Or is it just, okay, it sounded like there was a discussion or we think some, as staff, we think this is important. How do they get in the funnel? Sure. So um, again, only a couple of years into advanced planning, um, we had to make, I had to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And we could have started off by putting 50 projects in advanced planning. But we have these bond cycles, the four bond cycles, and if we put 50 projects in there and there's not enough money, by the time we got to having funding, you'd be out of the four bond cycles. You'd have to refresh them to begin with. So that's why we limited it to that 20. If, if Liz were in the room, Liz would have said, I would have loved to put every road and every intersection project in it. But again, we don't have the capacity in the CIP to build every road and every intersection project over four bond cycle period. So what we tried to do is look at those projects that um, were across the city that we thought were feasible that could help us in terms of um, traffic. And so those were the, the types of projects that we started off and thus you have those two roads and those two intersections. We can get to you because it's, it's what Ryan alluded to at the last day of the budget uh, workshop is that we do have a list of all of those other um, projects that are in it but it's along those same lines. It's how can we have things throughout the, the city and different projects that are going to actually help us when we come to road and intersection projects move people around more quickly. But essentially it comes from staff. Correct. Yeah, thank you. Correct. All right, Ms. Ajmira. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Rieger, could you go back to that slide that I, yes, right here. <clears throat> so, uh, this is just a um, follow-up to Ms. Watlington's question here. So this first phase where we got the procurement, mm -hmm. uh, what, so when is the go no go uh, that will, would it be after procurement or would it be at the end of the programming and design phase? That's correct. It, it's after the design? programming and schematic design. Okay. so. After the programming and design phase, we will know how much it's going to cost, and then council will get to decide go or no go. Yeah. So in this in this case, I would absolutely recommend that we bring back uh, to you the findings of the programming and schematic design, and um, talk about what um, what the costs look like for this project. Okay. So we are looking at the first quarter of 2023. Uh, probably, uh, probably closer to the end of second quarter of 2023. So we will start um, we will start programming and schematic design in first quarter. It'll take us about six months to go through that process. Got it. Okay. So uh, ultimately, by this time next year, council will have more accurate estimate for for us to complete this innovation barn, the remaining, uh, to build our remaining part of the innovation barn by end of second quarter. So end of June, um, we should get an estimate. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Driz. Are you still with us? Yes, that, that's all I have. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Ashmira. Ms. Mr. Driggs. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> so I think I've heard the answer to this, but uh, basically there are two conversations going on here. One, one is about our investment uh, in the current tenant, and the other is about the need to activate an asset. So. Uh, $200,000 in order to simply deal with a situation where we have a city-owned asset that is underutilized is something I can get behind. Uh, but I don't want us to be spending that money in order to customize the building for the current tenant 
or at least if we're going to do that, then we need to understand that, that we are also making a decision about the continued occupancy by the current tenant at that location. And as it has been mentioned this evening, there are some issues about the, the kind of history of that relationship. Uh, I recall, as Ms. Ajmira pointed out, that we made a commitment of one point uh, uh, in the beginning for a couple of million dollars. And because we didn't have the current process uh, for uh, project evaluation, that turned out to be insufficient. So it then went to $4.9 million. And even then, it was meant to be a public-private partnership in the sense that fundraising um, would, would make it unnecessary for the city to do anything more than make a building available for free, which is a big deal. So uh, if we can kind of do work in order to decide what to do with that asset that doesn't limit us to customizing it for the use of the current tenant, then I would say, yeah, you know, let's activate the asset. But I don't, uh, if, if we're going to do it in such a way that it is being customized, then I think we need to talk some more uh, about uh, the relationship we have, because um, this is not what we intended. And as commendable as those private investments are that we saw, they are a tiny fraction of the amount of money that the city is being asked to put up in terms of, uh, you know, the investment in the capital uh, and the cost, the opportunity cost of making the building available for free. We will have invested probably in order to improve this building uh, a total of eight to ten million dollars, and we will have an eight to ten million dollar asset that is not paying any cash back to us. So we can interpret that as our investment in. Uh, the environment, but uh, we need to make a conscious decision that that it represents good value for money and that the current relationship we have with the tenant, which is very different from the one that we thought we were going to have when we started, uh, still achieves our purpose. And I'm not prejudging whether it does or not, but uh, I, I want us to spend the $200,000 in such a way that the question as to whether or not we continue our relationship with the current tenant remains open. It's just about activating an underutilized asset at this point and not a customization process. So Mr. Manager, is, is that fair? Or would you assume that when we spend $200,000, we're starting to study how we make that building appropriate for expansion of the current tenant? Well, I, I think, Mr. Driggs, you, you said what I said earlier, or something that's similar, is that this is a $200,000 um, investment, if you will, to see what it would cost to renovate the other half of this building, whether it's Envision Charlotte or whomever. And I, I think it's a good $200,000 to invest to see how we can take an asset that we own and build it out. If I could add, Mr. Mr. Jones, um, Mr. Driggs, uh, what I'm suggesting tonight is really to evaluate what it would cost to simply bring this building to code. Uh, no new walls, uh, no, 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 just to bring it to code so that it could be occupied. So it will, uh, what we will look at is what basically a shell. Now, there are no bathrooms on this side of the building, and I'm almost 100% positive that in order to come up to code, we're gonna to have to put bathrooms in. So those will be some walls we have to put in. Um, but that's what we're looking at is simply what will it cost to bring this building up to a um, code requirement that would allow us to get a certificate of occupancy. But will we also consider options such as uh, putting something else on that land or selling the land or affordable housing. Uh, I mean, this is a city asset. It's in a current use that is not going according to the original plan we had for it. Um, so uh, again, I, I, I hope the $200,000 is going to be a strategic assessment of that asset and of all the possible uses for it. And, and not necessarily that we take that unusual building and uh, finish it without knowing, uh, you know, who the tenant will be or uh, whether or not it's suitable, you know, for another tenant. Because it is an unusual structure, and Amy was kind enough to take me around, and I saw it. Uh, 
I think it suits that purpose very well, but uh, I just don't want us, if we spend $200,000 now, to prejudge the discussion that we need to have about uh, our relationship with the tenant or our future use of the building. I, Mr. Driggs, I, I, I think I understood you about, and I hope Phil answered it correctly, it is to bring the building up to code because if, if it's going to be a tenant, and it just depends on what our goals are, but that property and building is in the middle of an industrial site and in some respects covered around by city um, maintenance type of facilities and a factory and all of that. So I just, I, I think that he's saying up to code means the shell of the building and that's what the 200,000 would be for. And that, that assumes that that building is the best use of that land and that, uh, uh, um, uh, again, I think yeah. I've made myself clear. Uh, we will have spent maybe uh, eight to $10 million on the building and we will not be getting any income from that investment cash. So we need to, at some point, have a conversation about at that level, whether uh, the city's investment is supported by the activity at that location because we started this conversation it was a two million dollar investment yeah I, I, I'm sorry I wasn't very clear I was trying to say that if any um, use of that building knowing how scarce the land is and the growth in our city that I think it would be pr likely a municipal use no matter what because it's such a valuable space to provide services from municipal services from okay so um, next I have miss Johnson Yes, thank you. Um, so we just, and we're all pretty much saying the same thing, and, and, and it may not be appropriate for housing mayor, but we know that there are small businesses uh, that cannot afford to rent spaces in the city. There are small businesses that are losing their, their office or, need, or having to move because of the cost of rent in the city. So that's simply what I'm saying from an equitable perspective. We need to open up this opportunity for at least that second half of the building for another organization and assess the output and the outcomes and the, um, the, of the current tenant. Um, and I've said that during the budget, we need to have uh, external audits of our, our current financial partners to make sure that they're meeting the goals so that we are proper stewards of the, the city's dollars, um, or excuse me, the public's dollars. I also want to make sure that, that we are, are clear, because I know the original ask during the budget for, for this barn, I believe, was $1.2 million, and that, that didn't pass the straw vote. So then the last ask was for $200,000 um, for, for the assessment. So are we, we're certain, because I'm kind of, it feels kind of gray, are we certain that we're, this is going to come back before the council to say that uh, we've assessed it and you know it's going to take X amount of dollars and we'll, um, to, to uh, fix the building so the council will make the decision whether this is a go or a no go? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Aye. Do thank you. Mayor Pro Thank you. Um, I think that. You know, I'm listening to what Mr. Driggs is saying, and it it um, it occurs to me that <laughs> maybe it's the short-term nature of our council, where we're elected every two years. But this is a project we started four or five years ago. At the same time that we decided we wanted to be a smart city, and we invested all this time and energy in the North End Smart District, and we had plans with Phillips and Siemens and all these organizations, and all of that's gone away. I mean, I guess we're gonna use some light bulbs that'll help out on the streets when people drive by, but there was major conversation about being a smart city, and we were going to conferences, and we were getting national recognition, and now that's all gone. So if you wanna sell this, it's prime real estate, Absolutely, but you recognize that you, we did spend millions of dollars out there already, and that's neither, you know, that's not really what the importance of, of my point is. The importance is we started this because we said we wanted to address the fact that 
we have a problem with recycling and with garbage in this city. My understanding is that the Mecklenburg County landfill is almost full. So we're gonna to have to go find another county who wants our trash. That's gonna increase the cost. Talk about equity. Everybody has to pay those fees and it's gonna impact some people more than others. So the whole goal of this was to look forward into the future, which I realize government doesn't do very well, but make investments into the future to be able to be the top city in this country when it comes to recycling and garbage and sustainability and upcycling and creating jobs in these industries for people. There are small businesses out there. They're not to scale yet. They're trying, they're hiring people, but they are small businesses out there. But the bigger point of this is, this isn't a building so that we can just rent it out. We're either committed to being a sustainable city or we're not. And if we're not, then just say it, but don't tell people that you're committed to it. And don't put it in your campaign literature and don't run around saying that I believe in sustainability if you don't believe in it. So pick a conversation. Let's use this building for something else, fine. Somebody's gonna buy it half built or whatever, but it's just, I just can't get over how short-sighted we are as a council sometimes. Thank you. Second. I'd like to comment on that. I, I have Mr. Phipps. Mr. Phipps. All right. I just I like have my hand up. I got, I got my hand up. I, got, I like to assert it, and I still got my hand up. But uh, we can't I, listen I, to rezonings uh, after 10:30. So. <laughs> this is a I, I side really note. Think, I really did think that. We went into this whole project with an emphasis on the environment, mm -hmm. our CAP goals, but it looks like now we're willing to scrap it, uh, you know, at the drop of a hat uh, uh, after all this work that we've done. I mean, we spend, we, we're, we're spending a million dollars on one bus trying to meet CAP goals. Amen. Our environmental goals. So, uh, I, I really, you know, am confused on on what our priorities are. Uh, in as much as uh, you know, we know we have, you know, we know this whole environment and, and recycling thing is in a state of real flux and serious flux. And and I thought this was a way that we were trying to do it, something that was real, something that was sustainable. Now it looks like it just could be, you know. It could be no go at a drop of a dime, you know? I mean, after all the work that we've done. So I don't know if we've lost our, the, the, the true picture of what we've been trying to do from the start. And uh, to me, I, I just think it's, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, disheartening, really. All right, Mr. Driggs, we'll close us out, and then we'll go next to our social district's agenda item. Mr. Driggs. I think the goals uh, are correct. We, it does not excuse us from accountability as to whether the likely success of this project, the scalability of this project, the impact that it can make is in proportion to the amount of money we're spending, and that's the question. The question is, uh, as Ms. Heisel pointed out, we had a whole bunch of ideas uh, in the past that haven't come to anything. The question is whether these very small scale projects uh, have the prospect of making a meaningful difference and establishing us as a serious player, or are they experiments? A lot of research in this area really needs to be done on a much larger scale by much better funded organizations. It's science. so. Uh, I, I just I, I, I object to the suggestion that we need to spend this money. You know, we have to do something. This is something, and therefore we have to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Driggs. All right, now we'll go to the next item on our agenda. Which Can is I just say something? Who? Who? Me, Phipps. Mr. Phipps, can we go to yeah, the? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 Ed, I can appreciate what you just said, but that's the argument that people have been putting forth to any environmental issue, like even reducing fossil fuels and things. I mean, you know, if it's, is it a benefit? But what, what is the cost benefit over time? So, I mean, I mean, you know, people have been putting forth that argument from day one. 
Thank you very much. Okay, so we're now going to go to our next agenda item, which is social districts. Um, Debbie, you're up for that? Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. So, good evening again. Debbie Smith here. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> We're way past right the evening. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> I, I serve as your deputy director in CDOT, and I am here to give you a high-level briefing, and let me emphasize high-level briefing. It is not lost on me that my next seven slides uh, stand between you and your closed session. So, um, with that, <laughs> uh, yes. So, we put together uh, an internal work team. Uh, it encompasses several uh, critical departments, economic development, planning design and development, CDOT, police, solid waste, the attorney's office, the city manager's office, and forgive me if I fail to mention uh, one of our great team members. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so this is a new opportunity statewide. Um, in September 2021, Governor Roy Cooper uh, signed the House Bill 890, which includes a provision that allows local governments to create social districts. So cities must opt in through ordinance, and there are a number of very specific criteria that must be met in order to establish that social district. Very simply put, a social district is an outdoor area in which a person can consume alcoholic beverages sold by an ABC licensed permittee. And I'll just point out that um, it was House Bill 890. Sorry, we didn't get that correction on there. So social districts are um, great economic tools for economic development to spur um, that business. We know it uh, grows tourism as those districts become destinations in and of themselves. And we know it expands revenue opportunities for restaurants and bars serving those to-go beverages. So a handful of local businesses and associations around the city have expressed an interest in establishing social districts to increase their patronage and economic vitality. But I'll, I'll say this very importantly, that those locations are not all in one area. Next slide, please. So here are some of the few places around North Carolina. We know this map is not comprehensive, but does give us a snapshot of some of the places that are implementing social districts. Kannapolis is one of the first to establish their West Avenue social district in their downtown. We know that they have four ABC permitted businesses in their area, and their op hours of operation vary by day a week. Greensboro established the borough in their downtown district, and we know that they operate uh, pretty consistently seven days a week, noon to, to 9 p.m. And this is by far one of the larger areas that we've seen with 25 ABC permitted businesses and 11 non-ABC permitted businesses. But once again, all in their downtown. Newton uh, has eight ABC permitted establishments in their downtown. Norwood has a one, and Monroe has eight ABC permitted businesses, and those also vary by day of week and hours of operation. I'll make a point with Newton uh, that they only operate three days a week, so they're basically focused on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So where there, these, um, these locations that we've been looking at as our uh, examples on how to establish, there's really one common theme, which is they're in a single contiguous social district. And so I don't believe any of the examples that we've looked at uh, really have more multiple destinations across the city. Um, and most of them are in their downtowns. So next slide, please. And before, uh, we've got this nice video that we've borrowed from Greensboro, the borough district. So we appreciate their support in, in sharing a lot of their information. Uh, but uh, before we play the video, I wanna assure you, yes, we intended it to have no sound as you, <laughs> so nobody panic. <laughs> um, so what this will show you is just an experience as a patron going through the Greensboro downtown district. Um, and along the way, you'll see some of the requirements embedded within their signage at different places. Um, so roll the video, thank you.
<laughs> All right, thank you. Next slide. <clears throat> oh, yeah, that's exactly what you're going to do. Did I hold me? So with that, the state legislation is very prescriptive on uh, requirements between the city and what must be established within that social district. So the city must adopt an ordinance designating a social district. The city must publish a maintenance and management plan on the website. The city must also register the social district with the Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission. But then the social district, uh, they have a lot of requirements as well. That area must be clearly defined, and so that is that outdoor common space. Um, there must be signs posted in which the district uh, it shows the hours, the days of operations, the ALE phone number, and a requirement that you do have to uh, you know, throw away your beverage before you can exit. Permittees uh, can only sell on their licensed premises, so it's not that they're setting up outside on the sidewalk. Uh, permittees also must use a very specially designed container so that it is clearly identified uh, with a city logo or this social district logo. No glass is allowed. Uh, drink responsibly, the maximum 16 fluid ounces, and so very important that um, you know, all of this information really be vetted. Next slide. Okay, so on the screen, I have a very aggressive timeline for Charlotte's next steps. So we're continuing to work through very specific details. My partner agencies that I just mentioned, we're coming through, we wanna really understand, we wanna de-conflict, we wanna take the right approach. Um, but this aggressive timeline does bring forward an ordinance for your uh, review and discussion uh, at the end of June, June 27th. And if uh, so desired, we would then bring that forward to a July 11th business meeting. And in mid-July, we'd be looking to stand up uh, our portal uh, to be able to take city applications uh, for those districts. And so, as we know, as I mentioned, we do have a handful of businesses that are interested in this. However, as our work group uh, talked a lot about it, found that it would be um, you know, uh, more important that we really focus on this city application and find out those businesses that are most interested and pursue and work with those within those distinct areas. So with that, I'm happy to open it up for questions. I have Mr. Eggleston followed by Ms. Watlington. Thank you. So just to clarify, so everybody knows to your point, other communities have done one district, rolled it out, they're done. That's all they're going to do. We've heard from a number of different pockets of our city where there are business districts that are interested in doing something like this. And even when we get our piece of this done, which hopefully it will be July 11th, the, each individual district would have a lot of work left that they would need to do. And then, Mr. Manager, I, whomever, each district would come back to the council once they've put their application together and, and done all that work that you outlined that they would need to do, and we would be approving each district individually subsequent to having adopted the language and policy change that we need to, correct? That is correct, Mr. Eggleston, um, that really the idea coming forward uh, would be that framework policy, that framework ordinance, and what we would still have to come back to you is with each established one, that boundary, that map has to be adopted into ordinance, so we would be having to come back. Perfect. Sorry. What I would say to the council is that hopefully this piece should not be complicated, controversial, or drawn out because we're simply adopting the framework, as you said, to allow for people to put in applications that will have far more specific details. And so, but we do have to make a language change in our ordinances to even open the door to that. But then at each, each one of those that wants to come forward, if we don't feel like the plan that they've put forward is satisfactory from a safety standpoint, 
responsibility standpoint, um, we can send them back to the drawing board to continue to refine that. So I do think we need to be um, very thoughtful about the applications that we approve by district, district to district, but I think adopting this language and allowing this portal to get stood up and running will start the process for them to, to pursue those districts and potentially allow them to be operable by fall while it's still warm enough out for people to actually benefit from these. I think the anecdotal stories we've heard from some of the ones, the other ones in the state, are that this does not turn into some sort of a you know, wild nightlife scene. It's simply, I mean, I know the video is a little silly, but it really is just people kind of strolling and shopping and it's not, um, it's not some huge rush of folks, but it is a little bit of a shot in the arm to businesses who need it. And I think particularly, um, you know, we talked about Uptown a lot today as it related to um, the arena and, and the areas around that. I mean, there are areas around some of our Uptown uh, facilities that really have not seen that boost outside of a game day in two years. And so I think anything we can do to help those businesses, we should. And I think this is simply the first step in a process where we will have a lot more opportunities to make sure that we're being thoughtful about the safety element of this before any of these actually um, are operating. All right, um, next we have um, Ms. Watlington. Thanks. Um, I can appreciate that this is step one and, it, and the plan is to get more specific. I would, however, prefer that we get a little bit more specific in the ordinance itself. Um, I would not want to leave it to a district by district discussion. Um, just seeing what the residents of South End are dealing with at this point, the residents of Wilmore are dealing with, with uh, being in proximity to a lot of the nightlife, uh, considering that we've got con resource constraints when it comes to CMPD, considering the challenges that we have working with ALE in um, addressing nuisance businesses, uh, challenges we have with code enforcement. It just, it, it would be irresponsible of me to sit here and not say that our residents are definitely going to want to have uh, input into this at the ordinance level. I'd love to see something a little more prescriptive citywide as it relates to uh, proximity to residential, especially as we talk about increasing density, particularly around our transit-oriented uh, development. We've got to think about how this impacts neighborhoods on the, on, a, on the whole before we create an opportunity to go in and piecemeal it. Because oftentimes, as we know, um, as you know, because you just did some great work as it relates to making sure that there's equity in neighborhood participation, we know that the neighborhoods who can come together and, um, and voice their concerns are often heard more often. I think about how closely this relates to um, the density of alcohol outlet distributors, as particularly off-premise alcohol outlets, we know long-standing history in the literature can show that violent crime is associated with increased density of alcohol outlets that sell for off-premise consumption. So these are the kinds of things that I hope are going to be a part of the conversation and I would need to see and hear uh, before I could get comfortable supporting this going forward. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Phipps was next, followed by Mr. Graham. Yeah, would, uh, would the applicants that are, would, uh, would want to apply for these districts, would they, would they have to um, canvas their adjacent uh, uh, retailers and clients to see if they wanted to be in it or could somebody just initiate it and, 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 and you know, we say grace over it or whatever? Mr. Phipps, great question. Um, we would um, look to provide more details, but what I can tell you is really important is that we do that. Uh, community outreach would have to be part of it, and there is the opportunity for specific businesses uh, to opt out um, if they do not want to participate and if they are in that contiguous area where the boundaries would be drawn. Thank you. Mr. Graham. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm, I'm not sure how you can opt out if you're in, right, the <laughs> district. So that, that, that puzzles me. Stick your doors and walk with a drink. 
Okay, yeah, that works too. Uh, <laughs> right. What's that answer? I said that works too, right? Going back to the, the slide that we saw, the, the video. Uh, my, my question though, and I think Council Member Wallington kind of hit it on the nail for me. She took a lot of my thoughts uh, and reference to make sure that, you know, the, the end is in the beginning, right? So we got to get this thing right from the very beginning and notwithstanding the other cities that were profiled, Charlotte is uniquely different. Um, I, I, looking at South Boulevard, for an example, um, you know, people walking around uh, open containers in South Boulevard, it's problematic to me, <laughs> right? Uh, NODA is problematic, right? And those are where I think people will, you know, kind of think those social d districts could exist, right? NODA, South Boulevard, near the arena, um, University City, I mean, so, and, and can us, do we have more than one in the city? Do we have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Um, I, I just think, as Council Member Wallington said, that we need to really, uh, on the front side before this plane takes off, um, that we really get it right. Um, I'm not opposed to it. I, I just think we just need to make sure that we dot I's, cross T's, and and like I said earlier, notwithstanding the other cities, uh, we're uniquely different. Uh, when we do things, the scale is three, four, five, ten times Greensboro, right? Uh, and the impact. And so I just think we need to proceed with caution. Thank you. Mr. Graham, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to just clarify that um, any, uh, any establishment uh, that sells alcohol if you purchased a to-go beverage, you could not enter the next establishment with that to-go cup. So just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. <laughs> just like the video we saw, I mean, people are just gonna walk in the store, right? They're not gonna know that that company opt out. All right, do we have any other comments? So we'll now, um, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Eggleston. So I don't, I'll let us finish here, but I, Two points, I don't disagree with either of those things. I think the biggest part of this for us to analyze, and when I said district by district that we need to be thoughtful, is the parameters, the geography of where these districts would be. And so I think to Mr. Graham's point, if you drew one in South End, you wouldn't draw it so that it would have people crossing South Boulevard. I think you'd have it over on Camden. I would actually say Camden would be a great opportunity for us to close down the street for parts of the week or forever. Um, and have something that is safer for people to Ms. Watlington's point, you wouldn't presumably want to draw it in a way that had it butting up against Wilmore. Um, so I think that's where we've really got to get into the details is exactly where are we putting the lines on the map or where is, the, where is it being proposed by the, the people in a certain area? And then we refine based on some of those things that you've pointed out that we very much need to be sensitive to. So thank you. Mr. Winston. Uh, thank you. Um, just want to com combine some of the uh, uh, conversations that we've been having today um, and just a word of caution, kind of a down the line thinking. You know, we talked a lot about sponsorship districts um, and with these uh, social districts, um, I, I think future councils um, uh, should think about potential pitfalls um, uh, of, of, of perhaps brands um, of take. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, crowding out competition um, in certain areas um, by buying rights, um, you know, to future social districts. Um, I don't know if that's something that we thought about, probably haven't. Um, don't know if it's necessarily something that will be a problem, um, but just, you know, thinking about the potential arithmetic of, of things that we're considering today, um, this, this might be something uh, that future councils uh, would want to consider uh, depending on the moves we make um, o over the next few weeks, uh, months, and years. Thank you. We should start with the government center. Um, so let's start with the uh, motion by Mr. Baker for our closed session tonight. I think Mr. Baker sent an email to the, all of us at 420 this afternoon about the motion. So um, Mr. Baker, if you'll read the motion. Um, you guys, thank you so much, for, especially for staying so late. All right. I need a motion to go into closed session pursuant to GS 143-318-11A3 to consult with the city attorney 
in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the city council in the ma matter of Comiskey versus City of Charlotte et al. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right, do I have to do a roll call vote? Yes. Who said yes? Yes. Don't say yes, Patrick. <laughs> just say no. Just, can't you just say no? Okay. No, no, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Yes. People know that we're not coming back after yes, I am going to, I was going to actually make the motion, make sure the motion passes first. All right. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Ms. Ajmira. Ms. Ajmira. Yeah. All right. You got to get on camera, Ms. Ajmira. So I think you make sure you get this for closed session. Mr. Bakari. Yes. Mr. Driggs? Yes. Mr. Eggleston? Yes. Mr. Graham? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Phipps? Yes. Mr. Newton? Yes. Ms. Watlington? Yes. Mr. Winston? Yes. All right, so no further action will be taken after the closed session, so the viewers can log off. And all of the council members that are attending virtually, if you'll follow the directions given to you by um, Wendy. Wendy has said Mindy. Wendy, um, for the set closed session. All right.